Chapter Eleven, Part One of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A captain of industry seeks my acquaintance. As Stephen's case shows, there was always much fingering of a subject at McClure's before one of the staff was told to go ahead. The original hint might come from Mr. McClure's overflowing head and pocket, Mr. Phillips' notebooks, as much a part of him as his glasses, the Daily Mail, the chance word of a caller. We all turned in our pickings. They must concern the life of the day, that which was interesting people. An idea, once launched, grew, until fixed on somebody, and once started it continued to grow, according to the response of readers. No response, no more chapters. A healthy response, as many chapters as the material justified. It was by this process that my next long piece of work came into being, the history of the Standard Oil Company. The deluge of monopolistic trusts, which had followed the close of the Spanish-American War and the return of prosperity, was disturbing and confusing people. It was contrary to their philosophy, their belief that, given free opportunity, free competition, there would always be brains and energy enough to prevent even the ablest leader monopolizing an industry. What was interfering with the free play of the forces in which they trusted? They had been depending on the federal antitrust law, passed ten years before. Was it quite useless? It looked that way. There was much talk in the office about it, and there came to the top, finally, the idea of using the story of a typical trust to illustrate how and why the clan grew. How about the greatest of them all, the Standard Oil Company? I suppose I must have talked rather freely about my own recollections and impressions of its development. It had been a strong thread, weaving itself into the pattern of my life from childhood on i had come into the world just before the discovery of oil the land on which i was born not being over thirty miles away from that first well the discovery had shaped my father's life rescuing him as it did thousands of others from the long depression which had devastated the eighteen fifties i had grown up with oil derricks oil tanks pipelines refineries oil exchanges I remembered what had happened in the oil region in 1872, when the railroads and an outside group of refiners attempted to seize what many men had created. It was my first experience in revolution. On the instant, the word became holy to me. It was your privilege and duty to fight injustice. I was much elated when, not so long afterwards, I fell on Rousseau's social contract, and read his defense of the right to revolt i had been only dimly conscious of what had happened in the decade following the decade in which the standard oil company had completed its monopoly it was the effect on the people about me that stirred me the hate and suspicion and fear that engulfed the community i had been so deeply stirred by this human tragedy as i have told that i had made a feeble and ineffectual attempt to catch it fix it in a novel the drama continued to unfold while i was abroad came into our very household when a partner of my father's ruined by the complex situation shot himself leaving father with notes to pay them it was necessary in the panic of ninety three to do what in his modest economy was unsound and humiliating mortgage our home while the personal tragedies came in my mother's letters my brother wrote me vivid accounts of what was going on in the outside oil world of the slow action of the interstate commerce commission from which all independents had hoped so much of businesses ruined while they waited for the decision of the ohio suit which drove the trust to reorganization a legal victory which in no way weakened its hold or crippled its growth depressing as this was i was elated by my brother's report of the growing strength of a strongly integrated cooperative effort of producers refiners transporters marketers the pure oil company the only escape possible for those who would do independent business he argued ably was to build their own combination depending less on agitation 
politics legislation more on sound business fight if necessary but above all do business while i was still in paris this clutter of recollections impressions indignations perplexities was crystallized into something like a pattern by henry d lloyd's brilliant wealth against commonwealth i had been hearing about the book from home but the first copy was brought me by my english friend h wickham steed who fresh from two years contact with german socialism took the work with great seriousness was not this a conclusive proof that capitalism was necessarily inconsistent with fair and just economic life was not socialism the only way out as lloyd thought i was more simple-minded about it as i saw it it was not capitalism but an open disregard of decent ethical business practices by capitalists which lay at the bottom of the story mr lloyd told so dramatically the reading and discussions whetted my appetite and when i came back to america in eighteen ninety four and heard anew in the family circle of what had been going on my old desire to get the drama down seized me where were those notes i had made back in my chautauquan days gathering dust in the tower room i looked them up saw that i had done well in choosing pithole for my opening scene nothing so dramatic as pithole in oil history how many men it had made and ruined but the bottom had dropped out in eighteen sixty six what was left of it now eighteen ninety four my brother and i drove over to see thirty years before pithole had been a city of perhaps twenty thousand men and women with all the equipment for a permanent life now here were only stripped fields where no outline of a town remained we spent a long day trying to place the famous wells to fix my father's tank shops so profitable while pithole lasted to trace the foundations of the bonta house which had furnished the makings of our home in titusville the day left us with a melancholy sense of the impermanence of human undertakings and more to the point it showed me that if i were to reconstruct the town with its activities and its people picture its rise and its fall i must go back to records maps reminiscences that i must undertake a long and serious piece of investigation before i began but given the material how about my ability to make it live to create the drama which i felt one must be an artist before he can create that i knew i was no artist mr mcclure's call to come on and write a life of napoleon put an end to my hesitations and napoleon done there had been lincoln and the spanish-american war no time to consider oil or even to rejoice over the final success of the integrated industry to which my brother had tied his fortune but here i was again faced with the old interest the desire to do something about it get down what i had seen seized me was it possible to treat the story historically to make a documented narrative the more i talked the more convinced i was that it could be done but to tell the story so that other people would read it was another matter mr phillips finally put it up to me to make an outline of what i thought possible we couldn't go ahead without mr mcclure's approval and he was ill in europe with all his family go over said john phillips show the outline to sam get his decision and so in the fall of eighteen ninety i went to lausanne in switzerland to talk it over with mr mcclure a week would do it i thought but i hadn't reckoned with the mcclure method don't worry about it said he i want to think it over mrs mcclure and you and i will go to greece for the winter you've never been there we can discuss standard oil in greece as well as here if it seems a good plan you can send for your documents and work in the pantheon and he chuckled at the picture almost before i realized it we were headed for greece via the italian lakes milan and venice in milan mr mcclure suddenly decided that he and mrs mcclure needed a cure before greece and headed for the ancient watering-place of salso maggiore 
here in the interval of mud baths and steam soaks and watching such magnificent humans as cecil rhodes and his retinue recuperating from their latest south african adventure we finally came to a decision i was to go back to new york and see what i could make of the outline i had been expounding greece was to be abandoned leaving mr and mrs mcclure to finish their cure i headed for new york to write what as far as title was concerned certainly looked like a doubtful enterprise for a magazine like mcclure's the history of the standard oil company mcclure's has courage how often that remark was made after our undertaking was under way but courage implies a suspicion of danger nobody thought of such a thing in our office we were undertaking what we regarded as a legitimate piece of historical work we were neither apologists nor critics only journalists intent on discovering what had gone into the making of this most perfect of all monopolies what had we to be afraid of i soon discovered however that if we were not afraid i must work in a field where numbers of men and women were afraid believed in the all-seeing eye and the all-powerful reach of the ruler of the oil industry they believed that anybody going ahead openly with a project in any way objectionable to the standard oil company would meet with direct or indirect attack examination of their methods had always been objectionable to them go ahead and they will get you in the end i was told by more than one who had come to that conclusion either from long observation or from long suffering even my father said don't do it ida they will ruin the magazine it was a persistent fog of suspicion and doubt and fear from the start this fog hampered what was my first business making sure of the documents in the case i knew they existed almost continuously since its organization in eighteen seventy the standard oil company had been under investigation by the congress of the united states and by the legislatures of various states in which it had operated on the suspicion that it was receiving rebates from the railroads and was practicing methods in restraint of free trade in eighteen seventy two and again in eighteen seventy six it was before congressional committees in eighteen seventy nine it was before examiners of the commonwealth of pennsylvania and before committees appointed by the legislatures of new york and ohio for investigating railroads its operations figured constantly in the debate which led up to the creation of the interstate commerce commission in eighteen eighty seven and again and again since that time the commission had been called upon to examine directly or indirectly into its relations with the railroads in eighteen eighty eight in the investigation of trusts conducted by congress and by the state of new york the standard oil company was the chief subject for examination in the state of ohio between eighteen eighty two and eighteen ninety two a constant warfare was waged against the standard in the courts and the legislature resulting in several volumes of testimony the legislatures of many other states concerned themselves with it this hostile legislation compelled the trust to separate into its component parts in eighteen ninety two but investigation did not cease indeed in the great industrial inquiry conducted by the commission appointed by president mckinley the standard oil company was constantly under discussion and hundreds of pages of testimony on it appear in the nineteen volumes of reports which the commission submitted this mass of testimony most if not all of it taken under oath contain the different charters and agreements under which the standard oil trust had operated many contracts and agreements with railroads with refineries with pipelines and it contained the experiences in business from eighteen seventy two up to nineteen hundred of multitudes of individuals these experiences had exactly the quality of the personal reminiscences of actors in great events with the additional value that they were given on the witness stand and it was fair therefore to suppose that they were more cautious and exact in statement than are many writers of memoirs these investigations covering as they did all of the important steps in the development of the trust included full accounts of the point of view of its officers in regard to that development 
as well as their explanations of many of the operations over which controversy had arisen aside from the great mass of sworn testimony accessible to the student there was a large pamphlet literature dealing with the different phases of the subject as well as files of the numerous daily newspapers and monthly reviews supported by the oil region in the columns of which were to be found not only statistics but full reports of all controversies between oil men but the documentary sources were by no means all in print the standard oil trust and its constituent companies had figured in many civil suits the testimony of which was in manuscript in the files of the courts where the suits were tried i had supposed it would be easy to locate the records of the important investigations and cases but i soon found i had been too trustful for instance there was a federal investigation of the south improvement company the first attempt to make a hard and fast alliance between oil-bearing railroads and oil refiners an alliance which inevitably would kill everybody not admitted since by the contract the railroads not only allowed the privileged refiners a rebate on all their shipments but paid them a drawback on those of independence the railroads also agreed to give them full information about the quantity and the destination of their rival shipments the standard oil company as a monopoly had grown out of this pretty scheme where could i get a copy of that investigation more than one cynic said you'll never find one they have all been destroyed when i had located copies in each of two private collections i was refused permission to put my hands on them to be sure i did by persistent searching find that so guarded investigation in a pamphlet which was one of the three which are all i know to be in existence i am not supposing that there are not others for i quickly learned when i was told that the entire edition of a printed document had been destroyed to go on looking once a document is in print somewhere sometime a copy turns up however small the edition for instance there was the important hepburn investigation of the relations of railroads and private industries made by the state of new york in eighteen seventy nine i could not find a copy in the oil region where i was working the standard had destroyed them all i was told at that time there was in the public library of new york city one of the ablest of american bibliographers adelaide haas she had helped me more than once to find a scarce document how about this hepburn investigation i wrote miss haas here in the library for your use whenever you will come around but she added only one hundred copies were ever published it is a scarce piece i have known of a complete set selling for one hundred dollars it was understood at the time she explained that one or two important railroad presidents whose testimony was given before the committee bought up and destroyed as many sets as they could obtain in the end all the printed documents were located but where was the unprinted testimony taken in lawsuits had incriminating testimony been spirited away from the court files henry lloyd made such an accusation in his first edition of wealth against commonwealth it disappeared from a second edition i wrote to ask him why the testimony was put back after my first book appeared he answered i was particularly anxious to have the original of one of these documents but when i came to look for it it was not in the files where was it how was i to locate it and if i did succeed would there be any chance to judge from past experience that it would be turned over to me i saw that i must have an assistant someone preferably in cleveland ohio so many years the headquarters of the standards operations it meant more expense and i was already costing the office an amount which shocked my thrifty practice but mr mcclure and mr phillips being generous and patient and also by this time fairly confident that in the end we should get something worth while told me to go ahead i had learned in my lincoln work that an assistant even if faithful and hard-working may be an encumbrance when it comes to investigation it needs more than accuracy it needs enthusiasm for finding out things solving puzzles anybody's puzzles 
i wanted a young man with college training a year or two of experience as a reporter intelligent energetic curious convinced everything he was asked to do was important even if he did not at the moment know why he must get his fun in the chase you in the bag also he must be trusted to keep his mouth shut i can recommend the technique i practiced in this case for finding my rare bird from each of three different editors in cleveland i asked the name of a young man whom he thought competent to run down a not very important looking bit of information to each of the names given me i wrote instructions from new york i would be around soon to pick up the report i told them adding that i should prefer that he say nothing about the assignment when i went to cleveland to view my prospects i found both number one and number two fine intelligent fellows their reports were excellent but they had not the least interest in what they had done i thanked them paid them and said good day the third young man came short and plump his eyes glowing with excitement he sat on the edge of his chair as i watched him i had a sudden feeling of alarm lest he should burst out of his clothes i never had the same feeling about any other individual except theodore roosevelt i once watched the first roosevelt through a white house musicale when i felt his clothes might not contain him he was so steamed up so ready to go attack anything anywhere the young man gave me his report but what counted was the way he had gone after his material his curiosity his conviction that it was important since i wanted it i thought i had my man a few more trials convinced me that john m siddle was a find he at that time was an associate of frank bray in the editing of the chautauquan the headquarters of which had been shifted to cleveland from meadville when siddle once understood what i was up to he jumped at the chance went to work with a will and stayed working with a will until the task was ended he was a continuous joy as well as a support in my undertaking nothing better in the way of letter-writing came to the mcclure's office in time everybody was reading siddle's letters to me whether it was a mere matter of statistics or a matter of the daily life in cleveland of john d rockefeller the head of the standard oil company if anything in or around ohio interested the magazine the office immediately suggested ask sid and sid always found the answer mr mcclure and mr phillips began to say we want sid as soon as you are through with him sid saw the opportunity and as soon as i could spare him in ohio he joined the mcclure's staff i had been at work a year gathering and sifting materials before the series was announced very soon after that mr mcclure dashed into the office one day to tell me he had just been talking with mark twain who said his friend henry rogers at that time the most conspicuous man in the standard oil group had asked him to find out what kind of history of the concern mcclure's proposed to publish you will have to ask miss tarbell mr mcclure told him would miss tarbell see mr rogers mark twain asked mr mcclure was sure i would not ask anything better which was quite true and so an interview was arranged for one day early in january of nineteen o two at mr rogers home then at twenty six east fifty seventh street i was a bit scared at the idea i had met many kinds of people but this was my first high-ranking captain of industry was i putting my head into a lion's mouth i did not think so it had become more and more evident to me that any attempt to bite our heads off would be the stupidest thing the standard oil company could do its reputation being what it was it was not that stupid i told myself however it was one thing to tackle the standard oil company in documents as i had been doing quite another thing to meet it face to face and then would mr rogers come across could i talk with him so far my attempts to talk with members of the organization had been failures i had been met with that formulated chatter used by those who have accepted a creed a situation a system to baffle the investigator trying to find out what it all means 
my nervousness and my scepticism fell away when mr rogers stepped forward in his library to greet me he was frank and hearty plainly he wanted me to be at ease in that way he knew that he could soon tell whether it was worth his while to spend further time on me or not henry rogers was a man of about sixty at this time a striking figure by all odds the handsomest and most distinguished figure in wall street he was tall muscular lithe as an indian there was a trace of the early oil adventure in his bearing in spite of his air of authority his excellent grooming his manner of the quick-witted naturally adaptable man who has seen much of people his big head with its high forehead was set off by a heavy shock of beautiful gray hair his nose was aquiline sensitive the mouth which i fancy must have been flexible capable both of firm decision and of gay laughter was concealed by a white drooping moustache his eyes were large and dark narrowed a little by caution capable of blazing as i was to find out shaded by heavy gray eyebrows giving distinction and force to his face i remember thinking as i tried to get my bearings now i understand why mark twain likes him so much they are alike even in appearance they have the bond of early similar experiences mark twain in nevada henry rogers in the early oil regions when and where did your interest in oil begin mr rogers asked as he seated me a full light on my face i noticed on the flats and hills of rouseville i told him of course he cried of course tarbell's tank shops i knew your father i could put my finger on the spot where those shops stood we were off we forgot our serious business and talked of our early days on the creek mr rogers told me how the news of the oil excitement had drawn him from his boyhood home in new england how he had found his way into rouseville gone into refining he had married and put his first thousand dollars into a home on the hillside adjoining ours it was a little white house he said with a high peaked roof oh i remember it i cried the prettiest house in the world i thought it it was my first approach to the gothic arch my first recognition of beauty in a building we reconstructed the geography of our neighborhood lingering over the charm of the narrow ravine which separated our hillsides a path on each side up that path mr rogers told me i used to carry our washing every monday morning and go for it every saturday night probably i've seen you hunting flowers on your side of the ravine how beautiful it was i was never happier could two strangers each a little wary of the other have had a more auspicious beginning for a serious talk for what followed was serious with moments of strain what are you basing your story on he asked finally on documents i am beginning with the south improvement company he broke in to say well that of course was an outrageous business that is where the rockefellers made their big mistake i knew of course that mr rogers had fought that early raid tooth and nail and i also knew that later he had joined the conspirators as the oil region called them in carrying out point by point the initial program but i did not throw it up to him why did you not come to us at the start mr rogers asked it was unnecessary you have written your history besides it would have been quite useless i told him we've changed our policy he said we are giving out information as a matter of fact mr rogers may be regarded i think as the first public relations counsel of the standard oil company the forerunner of ivy lee and i was so far as i know the first subject on which the new policy was tried in the close to two hours i spent that afternoon with henry rogers we went over the history of the oil business we talked of rebates and pipelines independent struggles and failures the absorption of everything that touched their ambition he put their side to me the mightiness of their achievement the perfection of their service also he talked of their trials the persecution as he called it by their rivals the attack of lloyd i never understood how harper could have published that book why i knew harry harper socially 
there has always been something he said a little ruefully look at things now russia and texas there seems to be no end of the oil they have there how can we control it it looks as if something had the standard oil company by the neck something bigger than we are the more we talked the more at home i felt with him and the more i liked him it was almost like talking with mr mcclure and mr phillips finally we made a compact i was to take up with him each case in their history as i came to it he was to give me documents figures explanations and justifications anything and everything which could enlarge my understanding and judgment i realized how big a contribution he would make if he continued to be as frank as he was in this preliminary talk i made it quite clear to him however that while i should welcome anything in the way of information and explanation that he could give it must be my judgment not his which prevailed of course mr rogers i told him i realize that my judgments may not stand in the long run but i shall have to stand or fall by them well he said as i rose to go i suppose we'll have to stand it would you be willing to come to my office for these talks it might be a little more convenient certainly i replied he looked a bit surprised will you talk with mr rockefeller certainly i said well he said a little doubtfully i'll try to arrange it for two years our bargain was faithfully kept i usually going to his office at twenty six broadway that in itself at the start for one as unfamiliar as i was with the scenes and customs of big business was an adventure my entrance and exit to mr rogers office were carried on with a secrecy which never failed to amuse me the alert handsome business-like little chaps who received me at the entrance to the rogers suite piloted me unerringly by a route where nobody saw me and i saw nobody into some small room opening on to a court and it seemed never the same route i was not slow in discovering that across the court in the window directly opposite there was always stationed a gentleman whose head seemed to be turned my way whenever i looked across it may have meant nothing at all i only record the fact the only person besides mr rogers i ever met in those offices was his private secretary miss harrison a woman spoken of with awe at that date as having a ten thousand dollar salary one who knew her employer's business from a to z and whom he could trust absolutely she radiated efficiency business competency along with her competency went that gleam of hardness which efficient business women rarely escape miss harrison appeared only on rare occasions when an extra document was needed she was as impersonal as the chairs in the room we discussed in these interviews with entire frankness the laws which they had flouted i could not shock mr rogers with records not even when i confronted him one day with the testimony he had given on a certain point which he admitted was not according to the facts he curtly dismissed the subject they had no business prying into my private affairs as for rebates somebody would have taken them if we had not but with your strength mr rogers i argued you could have forced fair play on the railroads and on your competitors ah he said but there was always somebody without scruples in competition however small that somebody might be he might grow there it was the obsession of the standard oil company that danger lurked in small as well as great things that nothing however trivial must live outside of its control these talks made me understand as i could not from the documents themselves the personal point of view of independence like mr rogers who had been gathered into the organization in the first decade of monopoly making for instance there was mr rogers reason for desiring the trust agreement made in eighteen eighty two by eighteen eighty said mr rogers i had stock in nearly all of the seventy or so companies which we had absorbed but the real status of these companies was not known to the public in case of my death there would have been practically no buyer except mr flagler mr rockefeller and a few others on the inside my heirs would not have reaped the benefit of my holdings the trust agreement changed this 
the public at once realized the value of the trust certificate that is my estate was guarded in case of my death he often emphasized the part economies had played not only in building up the concern but in their individual fortunes economies in putting their money back into the business we lived in rented houses and saved money to buy stock in the company he told me once only one who remembers as i do the important place that owning your own home took in the personal economy of the self-respecting individual of that day can feel the force of this explanation i was curious about how he had been able to adjust his well-known passion for speculation with mr rockefeller's well-known antagonism to all forms of gambling didn't he object i asked oh he said a little ruefully i was never a favorite i suppose i was a born gambler in the early days of the charles pratt company the company of which i was a member i always carried on the speculations for the concern mr pratt said henry i haven't got the nerve to speculate i kicked all the clothes off last night worrying about the market give me the money i told him and i will furnish the nerve we simply raked in the money making a gesture with both hands and of course it came out of the producer that is what my father always said i told him one of the severest lectures he ever gave came from one of those booms in the market which sent everybody in the oil region crazy i suppose you were responsible for it i remember a day when the schools were practically closed because all the teachers in titusville were on the street or in the oil exchange everybody speculating i was in high school the fever caught me and i asked father for one hundred dollars to try my luck in the market he was as angry with me as i ever saw him no daughter of mine he said etc etc wise man mr rogers commented but it was not because he was so cautious i said it was because he thought it morally wrong he would no more have speculated in the stock market than he would have played poker for money i always play poker when the market is closed commented mr rogers i can't help it saturday afternoons i almost always make up a poker party and every now and then john gates and i rig up something he'll come around and say henry isn't it about time we started something we usually do all of these talks were informal natural we even argued with entire friendliness the debatable question what is the worst thing the standard oil company ever did only now and then did one of us flare and then the other generally changed the subject he's a liar and a hypocrite and you know it i exploded one day when we were talking of a man who had led in what to me was a particularly odious operation i think it is going to rain said mr rogers looking out of the window with ostentatious detachment end of chapter eleven part one chapter eleven part two of all in the day's work by ida tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain a captain of industry seeks my acquaintance mr rogers not only produced documents and arguments he produced people with whom i wanted to talk the most important was henry flagler who had been in on the south improvement company that early deal with the railroads which had started the standard oil company off on the road to monopoly there had always been a controversy as to who had suggested that fine scheme mr flagler was in it what did he know mr rogers arranged that i talk with him henry flagler was not an acceptable figure even to wall street in those days there were scandals of his private life which true or not his fellow financiers did not like bad for business i found him a very different type from henry rogers he for instance did not conceal his distrust of john rockefeller he would do me out of a dollar to-day he cried off his guard and with an excited smash of his fist on the table and then catching himself and with a remarkable change of tone that is if he could do it honestly miss tarbell if he could do it honestly 
mr flagler knew what i had come for but instead of answering my direct questions he began to tell me with some show of emotion of his own early life how he had left home because his father was a poor clergyman four hundred dollars a year a large family of children he had not succeeded until he went into the commission business with mr rockefeller in cleveland and from that time we were prospered he said piously in the long story he told me the phrase we were prospered came in again and again that was not what i was after their prosperity was obvious enough finally i returned with some irritation to the object of my visit i see you do not know or are unwilling to say mr flagler who originated the south improvement company but this is certain mr rockefeller had the credit of it in the oil region you know yourself how bitter the feeling was there but ah miss tarbell he said how often the reputation of a man in his lifetime differs from his real character take the greatest character in our history how different was our lord and saviour regarded when he was alive from what we now know him to have been after that further questioning was of course hopeless and until mr rogers returned i sat listening to the story of how the lord had prospered him i was never happier to leave a room but i was no happier than mr flagler was to have me go mr rogers produced mr flagler and others of lesser importance but although i referred to his semi-promise in our first interview to produce mr rockefeller i found that after a few months there was no hope of this if i hinted at it he parried nearly a year went by after my first interview with mr rogers before the articles began to appear i rather expected him to cut me off when he realized that i was trying to prove that the standard oil company was only an enlarged south improvement company but to my surprise my arguments did not seem to disturb him they had won out had they not he sometimes complained that i had been unnecessarily blunt or a bit vindictive but he continued to receive me in friendly fashion and to give me perhaps not all the help he might but always something to make me think twice frequently to modify a view but if he was not himself disturbed by what i was doing why did he continue the interviews gradually i became convinced it was because of his interest in my presentation of a particular episode in their history it was a case in which mr rogers and john archbold along with all of the members of the board of a subsidiary company the vacuum oil company of rochester new york had been indicted for conspiring to destroy an independent refinery in buffalo new york in my opening interview with mr rogers he with some show of feeling had told me he wanted me to get a correct and impartial version of this buffalo case as he always called it there had been a break in his voice when with hesitation he said that case is a sore point with mr archbold and me i want you to go into it thoroughly i have the reports of the testimony before the grand jury it took me months to secure them of course in a sense i have no right with them i told my children that if their father's memory is ever attacked this will serve to vindicate him he must stand or fall in their estimation by that testimony at our second interview he produced the testimony before the grand jury repeating again that of course he had no business with it but he had to have it he would not allow me to take it away and at his request i read the sixty or more pages in his presence it seemed quite clear to me as i told mr rogers on finishing the reading that his connection with the affair had been so indirect that there was no reason for his indictment although it seemed equally clear to me that there was ample reason for the indictment of certain members of the vacuum board the judge was of that opinion for he dismissed the indictment against mr rogers and two of his fellow directors while sustaining that against the responsible operating heads of the concern i soon discovered that what mr rogers wanted me to make out was that the three men who had founded the independent enterprise all of them former employees of the vacuum oil company had done so for the sole purpose of forcing the standard to buy them out at a high price that is that it was a case of planned blackmail 
but the testimony certainly showed little evidence of that while it did show clearly enough that the managers of the vacuum oil company from the hour they had learned of the undertaking had made deliberate and open attempts to prevent the buffalo refinery doing business the more thoroughly i went into the matter and i worked hard over it the more convinced i was that while there had been bad faith and various questionable practices on the part of members of the independent firm they had started out to build up a business of their own also it was clear they had had hardly a shadow of success under the grilling opposition of the standard concern this included various suits for infringement of patents all of which the standard had lost in the course of the years of litigation four juries two grand juries and two petty juries gave verdicts against the standard oil company finally the independent concern was so shot to pieces by the continuous bombardment that it had to be put into the hands of a receiver the standard offered to settle for eighty five thousand dollars and the judge ordered the acceptance this made it the owner of the bone of contention i had a feeling that my final conclusion in the matter would probably end my relations with mr rogers i did not want to spring that conclusion on him that is i wanted him to know ahead of publication where i had come out although i had never allowed him to read an article before its appearance that being part of the original compact i broke my rule in this case promptly i received a letter asking me to call at twenty six broadway he received me in his usual cordial way and told me he had gone over my article carefully compared it with certain papers in his possession and had written me a letter in which he had stated his criticisms handing me the letter he said i think it will be a good plan for you to read that out loud so that we can talk it over here i began to read but broke off with the first sentence mr rogers had written that he appreciated my request that he should make the story correspond with his knowledge and opinion of the case mr rogers i said if you will look at my letter you will see that i did not suggest that you make the article correspond with your opinion of the case i am convinced that i cannot do that i asked you to examine the article and see if i had made any errors in statement or had omitted any essential testimony on either side he smiled never mind go ahead he said the letter was admirable almost every point well taken there was nothing which it was not proper for me to consider at least and with certain of his points i said at once that i was willing to comply the discussion of the letter finished i inwardly breathed a sigh of satisfaction we were going to part on friendly terms with neither of us having yielded our convictions but i had not counted on the resources of henry rogers in a matter in which he was deeply concerned particularly one which touched his personal pride and aroused his fighting spirit for as i was about to go he sprang on me an entirely new interpretation of the case not only was the suit of the independent refinery in which he had been indicted a continuation of the original blackmailing scheme but the lawyers in the case had themselves been in the conspiracy he laid before me a number of documents which he claimed proved it the chief of these was the itemized report of the receiver this report he said showed that the lawyers had taken the case knowing that if the buffalo concern did not win there would be no fees and showed them that when the matter had finally been settled they had made what the receiver considered exorbitant claims for their services there were five of them and they finally were allowed some thirty thousand dollars you can see mr rogers said as he pointed out these facts why they were so eager to convict us they were making a raid on the standard and the bench was with them his charge that the bench was with them he based on the fact that two of the lawyers originally in the case had later been elevated to the bench they had not of course heard the case but they had put their information and conclusions at the disposal of their successors i was startled by this sudden and sinister accusation and sat for some time with my head bent over the papers forgetting his presence trying to get at the meaning of the documents was there any other explanation than that which mr rogers had given me with such conviction 
looking up suddenly for the first time in my experience with mr rogers i caught him looking at me with narrowed and cunning eyes i took alarm on the instant we are not the only ones you see miss tarbell if this means what it seems to mean you are not but i shall have to study these documents mr rogers i shall have to consult a lawyer about the practice common in such cases that will be all right he said he was more exultant than i had ever found him i knew that paper would come in well some day to get it i consented to our people buying the buffalo refinery we did not want it but i wanted to get the receiver's reports and know just what had been done with the money we had paid them on the whole i had never seen him better pleased with himself than he was at that moment his satisfaction was so great that for the first time in our acquaintance he gave me a little lecture for a caustic remark i had made that is not a christian remark he said i contended that it was a perfect expression of my notion of a christian you ought to go to church more frequently he said why don't you come and hear my pastor dr savage we parted on good terms after a discussion of our religious views and church-going practices and he gave me a cordial invitation to come back which i agreed to do as soon as i had studied the new angle in the buffalo case aided by a disinterested and fair-minded lawyer i gave a thorough study to the documents but do my best i could not convince myself that mr rogers contention was sound it is not an unusual thing for lawyers to take cases they believe in knowing that their compensation depends on their winning many clients with just cases would be deprived of counsel if they had to ensure a fixed compensation for not infrequently as in the buffalo case all that a client has is involved in a suit the practice is so common among reputable lawyers that it certainly cannot be regarded as a proof of a conspiracy unless there is a reason to suppose that they have taken a case of whose merits they themselves are suspicious there was no evidence that the counsel of the independent concern was not convinced from the first that they had a strong case their claims were large but lawyers are not proverbial for their modesty of their charges and besides exorbitant charges can hardly be construed as a proof of conspiracy when i finally had written out my conclusion i sent a copy of it to mr rogers saying i should be glad to talk it over with him if he wished he did wish wrote me that he had new material to present but before the date set for the meeting an article in our series was published which broke off our friendly relations in studying the testimony of independence over a period of some thirty years i had found repeated complaints that their oil shipments were interfered with their cars sidetracked en route while pressure was brought on buyers to cancel orders there were frequent charges that freight clerks were reporting independent shipments i did not take the matter seriously at first the general suspicion of standard dealings by independence had to be taken into consideration i told myself then too i was willing to admit that a certain amount of attention to what your competitor is doing is considered legitimate business practice i knew that in the office of mcclure's magazine we were very keen to know what other publishers were doing and two there is the overzealous and unscrupulous employee who in the name of competition recognizes no rules for his game but the charges continued to multiply i met them in testimony and i met them in interviews there was no escaping espionage men told me they know where we send every barrel of oil half the time our oil never reaches its destination i could scarcely believe it and then unexpectedly there came to my desk a mass of incontrovertible proofs that what i had been hearing was true and more as a matter of fact this system of following up independent oil shipments was letter perfect so perfect that it was made a matter of office bookkeeping it looks sometimes mr rogers had said to me as if something had the standard oil company by the neck something bigger than we are in this case the something bigger was a boy's conscience a lad of sixteen or seventeen in the office of a standard plant had as one of his regular monthly duties the burning of large quantities of records 
he had carried out his orders for many months without attention to the content then suddenly his eyes fell one night on the name of a man who had been his friend since childhood had even been his sunday school teacher an independent oil refiner in the city a standard competitor the boy began to take notice he discovered that the name appeared repeatedly on different forms and in the letters which he was destroying it made him uneasy and he began to piece the records together it was not long before he saw to his distress that the concern for which he was working was getting from the railroad offices of the town full information about every shipment that his friend was making moreover that the office was writing to its representative in the territory to which the independent oil was going stop that shipment get that trade and the correspondence showed how both were done what was a youth to do under such circumstances he didn't do anything at first but finally when he could not sleep nights for thinking about it he gathered up a full set of documents and secretly took them to his friend now this particular oil refiner had been reading the mcclure's articles he had become convinced that i was trying to deal fairly with the matter he had also convinced himself in some way that i was to be trusted so one night he brought me the full set of incriminating documents there was no doubt about their genuineness the most interesting to me was the way they fitted in with the testimony scattered through the investigations and lawsuits here were bookkeeping records explaining every accusation that had been made but how could i use them together we worked out a plan by which the various forms and blanks could be reproduced with fictitious names of persons and places substituted for the originals it was after this material had come to my hands that i took the subject up with mr rogers the original south improvement company formula mr rogers provided for reports of independent shipments from the railroads i have come on repeated charges that the practice continues what about it do you follow independent shipments do you stop them do you have the help of railroad shipping clerks in the operation of course we do everything we legally and fairly can to find out what our competitors are doing just as you do in mcclure's magazine mr rogers answered but as for any such system of tracking and stopping as you suggest that is nonsense how could we do it even if we would well i said give me everything you have on this point he said he had nothing more than what he had already told me as i have said the article came out just before i was to see mr rogers on what i hoped would be the last of the buffalo case the only time in all my relations with him when i saw his face white with rage was when i met the appointment he had made our interview was short where did you get that stuff he said angrily pointing to the magazine on the table all i could say was in substance mr rogers you can't for a moment think that i would tell you where i got it you will recall my efforts to get from you anything more than a general denial that these practices of espionage so long complained of were untrue could be explained by legitimate competition you know this bookkeeping record is true there were a few curt exchanges about other points in the material but nothing as i now recall on the buffalo case the article ended my visits to twenty six broadway nearly four years passed before i saw henry rogers and in that period exciting and tragic events had come his way there was the copper war he and his friends had attempted to build up a monopoly in copper to match that of the standard oil company in petroleum the amalgamated copper company a youngster f augustus hines had come into montana and by bold and ruthless operation put together a copper company of his own the two organizations were soon at each other's throats it was a business war without a vestige of decency one in which every devious device of the law and of politics was resorted to by both sides but mr rogers had other troubles he and his friends had been engaged in organizing the gas interests of the east they had engineered stock raids which had been as disastrous to wall street as to gambling main street 
such operations in the past had never cost him more than a passing angry comment by the public press now however came something damaging to his reputation and his pride it was a series of lurid articles by a bold and very much on the inside broker and speculator thomas lawson of boston for nearly two years lawson published monthly in everybody's magazine under the admirable title frenzied finance circumstantial accounts of the speculation of the rogers group and what they had cost their dupes that story cut mr rogers pride to the quick he is said to have threatened the american news company with destruction if it circulated the magazine taken altogether the excitement and anger were too much for even his iron frame and indomitable spirit and in the summer of nineteen o seven he suffered a stroke which put him out of the fight for many weeks when he came back it was at once to collide with the government suit against the standard oil company and soon after that with the rich man's panic of nineteen o seven a panic for which his old enemy in copper f augustus hines was largely responsible early in november when the panic was still raiding the banks and the millionaires of the country i stood one day at a corner on fifth avenue waiting for the traffic to clear suddenly i saw an arm waving to me from a slowly passing open automobile and there was h h rogers smiling at me in the friendliest way when i reported the encounter at the office mr phillips at once said why not try to see him if he'll talk about what is going on what a story he could tell but would he see me i was a little dubious about trying still the greeting and the smile seemed to mean that at least he harbored no ill will suppose i said he is sufficiently subdued to go over with me his exciting life what a document of big business in the eighties and nineties he could produce if he would put down his recollections with the frankness with which he had sometimes talked to me it seemed worth trying for and i asked for an appointment i had not made a mistake mr rogers was harboring no ill will i was promptly invited to come to his house he greeted me heartily i found him physically changed stouter less sinewy but quite as frank as ever he told me of his stroke he spoke bitterly of what he called the roosevelt panic as well as of roosevelt's interference with the business of the standard oil company he gave me my cue when he began to talk about the early days of the oil region there is a whole chapter he said that has not been written that from fifty nine to seventy two we were getting on swimmingly when our interview was cut short by a card handed him joseph seep the head of the standard oil purchasing agency it amused him greatly that mr seep should have come in while i was there now you'll have to go he said and he put me out by a circuitous route as at twenty six broadway callers were not to see one another as we came into a dark hall he turned on the light you see we have to economize now he said laughingly our good-bye was cordial we'll talk about this again he said call up miss harrison in a week or ten days and we'll make an appointment the appointment was never made the coming months were too difficult for mr rogers his vast business affairs continued complicated the legend of his invincibility in the market was weakened moreover such was the bitterness of the standard oil company over the government suit that i doubt if he or his associates would have considered it wise for him to talk to me they probably thought he had talked already too much to too little purpose they and he probably never understood how much he had done to make me realize the legitimate greatness of the standard oil company how much he had done to make me understand better the vastness and complexity of its problems and the amazing grasp with which it dealt with them their complaint against me mr rogers complaint was that i had never been able to submerge my contempt for their illegitimate practices in my admiration for their genius in organization the boldness of their imagination and execution but my contempt had increased rather than diminished as i worked i never had an animus against their size and wealth never objected to their corporate form i was willing that they should combine and grow as big and rich as they could 
but only by legitimate means but they had never played fair and that ruined their greatness for me i am convinced that their brilliant example has contributed not only to a weakening of the country's moral standards but to its economic unsoundness the experience of the last decade particularly seems to me to amply justify my conviction i was never to see mr rogers again for in may of nineteen o nine he suddenly died two years before the supreme court dissolved the standard oil company End of chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 12 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Muckraker or Historian. It was inevitable that my visits to 26 Broadway should be noised among critics and enemies of the Standard Oil Company curious about what McClure's was going to do it was not infrequent for someone on the independent side to say with a wise nod of the head oh they'll get around you you'll become their apologist before you get through it was quite useless for me to insist that i was trying to be nobody's apologist that i was trying to balance what i found at least two people of importance whose experiences i was anxious to hear from their own lips refused to see me i learned later that henry d lloyd had written them after he learned i was seeing mr rogers that they had better not talk better not show me their papers that inevitably i should be taken in now i had already talked with mr lloyd already had help from him but the rogers association evidently upset him for a time my first article seemed to reassure him for he wrote me at once on its appearance i read your first instalment of the story of the standard oil company with eager curiosity then intense interest and then great satisfaction he seems to have divined at once where i was heading the suspicion of my relations with twenty six broadway cut me off for some two years from one of the most interesting independent warriors in the thirty year struggle this was one lewis emery jr whom i had known from childhood he had grown up in the oil business side by side with h h rogers he had been a producer and a refiner as well as one of the powerful factors in building up the pure oil company the integrated concern in which my brother was carrying on from the start mr emery had fought the standard's pretensions individually and collectively politically and financially he had a gift for language a marvellous vituperative vocabulary and he had no restraint in using it he was a feature of almost every investigation every lawsuit a member of every combination of producers and refiners where he was there were sure to be lively exchanges between him and the representatives of the other side his particular abomination was john archbold vice president of the standard oil company a person as free with charges and epithets as lewis emery himself you are a liar he shouted one day in an investigation when mr emery had made an exaggerated charge joseph h choate was mr archbold's lawyer there there mr archbold he said we'll put mr emery on the stand and convict him of perjury without noticing mr choate's remark mr emery called across the table young man if this table wasn't so wide i would tweak your nose for that such exchanges were not infrequent henry rogers who really liked lewis emery was always trying to calm him down can't you stop this lou he said one day come with us and it will be better for you there is no hope for you alone but with us there is a sure thing mr emery who told me of this offer said henry i can't do it even if i wanted to they would mob me in the oil region if i went back on them they would not have mobbed him but they would have done what would have been worse for a man of his temperament his passion for free action whether wise or unwise they would have ostracized him the most tragic effect i had seen in my girlhood of going over to the standard as it was called was partial ostracism of the renegade when a man's old associates crossed to the other side of the street rather than meet him when nobody stopped him on the street corner to gossip over what was going on few men were calloused enough not to suffer it was worse than mobbing 
the oil region as a matter of fact never mobbed any man so far as i know though it did occasionally destroy property and once at least hung mr rockefeller himself in effigy by this time lewis emery had fought his way to a substantial position in the oil world but to the end he prided himself on being a victim when he finally talked to me after he learned from mr lloyd that the embargo against me had been raised he said with what seemed to me considerable satisfaction i have been tortured i am a wounded man because of them and i hate them in spite of this he was getting a good deal out of life he was a rich man and he was making the most of his money he never let money stifle his personality his success in being himself was in striking contrast to that of most of the successful oil men of that day whom i knew most of them independent and standard submitted to an application of veneer a change of habits which destroyed much of their natural flavor they took little part in politics and social agitation they remained regular in all things they made their investments only in sure enterprises you always knew where to find them but not so lewis emery jr he continued to wear his clothes naturally to go his own erratic way he threw himself into political movements wise and unwise and he never lost his pioneering spirit after he was seventy years old as a final fling he took on a gold mine in peru a gold mine which was reached by climbing mountains and descending narrow paths cut out of rock crossing swaying rope bridges approaches fit only for the most daring mountain climbers yet there he was when nearly eighty charging up and down those mountains and trotting his mule across those bridges when younger men led their mules and crept the degree to which he was reconciled to me after two years of ostracism was proved by his annual invitation to come along to peru with his party and i would have gone and told the story of his mine as he wanted me to do if it had not been for the pictures he sent me those pictures of unprotected swaying bridges suspended from mountainside to mountainside hundreds of feet above the rushing rocky streams i had not the head for that and so gave up what would have been i am sure one of the most amusing adventures that ever came my way not a few of the personal experiences in gathering my materials left me with unhappy impressions more unhappy in retrospect perhaps than they were at the moment they were part of the day's work sometimes very exciting parts there was the two hours i spent in studying mr john d rockefeller as the work had gone on it became more and more clear to me that the standard oil company was his creation an institution is the lengthened shadow of one man says emerson i found it so everybody in the office interested in the work began to say after the book is done you must do a character sketch of mr rockefeller i was not keen for it it would have to be done like the books from documents that is i had no inclination to use the extraordinary gossip which came to me from many sources if i were to do it i wanted only that of which i felt sure i had proof only those things which seemed to me to help explain the public life of this powerful patient secretive calculating man of so peculiar and special a genius you must at least look at mr rockefeller my associates insisted but how mr rogers himself had suggested that i see him i had consented i had returned to the suggestion several times but at last was made to understand that it could not be done i had dropped his name from my list it was john siddle who then took the matter in hand you must see him was siddle's judgment to arrange it became almost an obsession and then what seemed to him like a providential opening came it was announced that on a certain sunday of october nineteen o three mr rockefeller before leaving cleveland where he had spent his summer for his home in new york would say good-bye in a little talk to the sunday school of his church a rally it was called as soon as siddle learned of this he begged me to come on we can go to sunday school we can stay to church 
i will see that we have seats where we have a full view of the man you will get him in action of course i went feeling a little mean about it too he had not wanted to be seen apparently it was taking him unaware siddle's plan worked to perfection worked so well from the start that again and again he seemed ready to burst from excitement in the two hours we spent in the church we had gone early to the sunday school room where the rally was to open a dismal room with a barbaric dark green paper with big gold designs cheap stained glass windows awkward gas fixtures comfortable of course but so stupidly ugly we were sitting meekly at one side when i was suddenly aware of a striking figure standing in the doorway there was an awful age in his face the oldest man i had ever seen i thought but what power at that moment siddle poked me violently in the ribs and hissed there he is the impression of power deepened when mr rockefeller took off his coat and hat put on a skull-cap and took a seat commanding the entire room his back to the wall it was the head which riveted attention it was big great breadth from back to front high broad forehead big bumps behind the ears not a shiny head but with a wet look the skin was as fresh as that of any healthy man about us the thin sharp nose was like a thorn there were no lips the mouth looked as if the teeth were all shut hard deep furrows ran down each side of the mouth from the nose there were puffs under the little colourless eyes with creases running from them wonder over the head was almost at once diverted to wonder over the man's uneasiness his eyes were never quiet but darted from face to face even peering around the jog at the audience close to the wall when he rose to speak the impression of power that the first look at him had given increased and the impression of age passed i expected a quavering voice but the voice was not even old if a little fatigued a little thin it was clear and utterly sincere he meant what he was saying he was on his own ground talking about dividends dividends of righteousness if you would take something out he said clenching the hand of his outstretched right arm you must put something in emphasizing put something in with a long outstretched forefinger the talk over we slipped out to get a good seat in the gallery a seat where we could look full on what we knew to be the rockefeller pew mr rockefeller came into the auditorium of the church as soon as sunday school was out he sat a little bent in his pew pitifully uneasy his head constantly turning to the farthest right or left his eyes searching the faces almost invariably turned towards him it was plain that he and not the minister was the pivot on which that audience swung probably he knew practically everybody in the congregation but now and then he lingered on a face peering at it intently as if he were seeking what was in the mind behind it he looked frequently at the gallery was it at siddle and me the service is over he became the friendly patron saint of the flock coming down the aisle where people were passing out he shook hands with everyone who stopped saying a good sermon the doctor gave us a good sermon it was a very good sermon wasn't it my two hours study of mr rockefeller aroused a feeling i had not expected which time has intensified i was sorry for him i know no companion so terrible as fear mr rockefeller for all the conscious power written in face and voice and figure was afraid i told myself afraid of his own kind my friend lewis emery jr priding himself on being a victim was free and happy not gold enough in the world to tempt him to exchange his love of defiance for a power which carried with it a head as uneasy as that on mr rockefeller's shoulders my unhappiness was increased as the months went by with the multiplying of tales of grievances coming from every direction i made a practice of looking into them all as far as i could and while frequently i found solid reasons for the complaints 
frequently i found the basic motives behind them suspicion hunger for notoriety blackmail revenge the most unhappy and most unnatural of these grievances came to me from literally the last person in the world to whom i should have looked for information frank rockefeller brother of john d rockefeller frank rockefeller sent word to me by a circuitous route that he had documents in a case which he thought ought to be made public and that if i would secretly come to him in his office in cleveland he would give them to me i knew that there had been a quarrel over property between the two men it made much noise at the time eighteen ninety three had gone to the courts had caused bitterness inside the family itself but because it was a family affair i had not felt that i wanted to touch it but here it was laid on my desk so i went to cleveland where john siddle had a grand opportunity to play the role of sleuth which he so enjoyed his problem being to get me into mr rockefeller's office without anybody suspecting my identity he succeeded i found mr rockefeller excited and vindictive he accused his brother of robbing his word him and his partner james corrigan of all their considerable holdings of stock in the standard oil company the bare facts were that frank rockefeller and james corrigan had been interested in the early standard oil operations in cleveland and had each acquired then a substantial block of stock later they had developed a shipping business on the lakes iron and steel furnaces in cleveland in the eighties they had borrowed money from john d rockefeller putting up their standard oil stock as collateral then came the panic of ninety three and they could not meet their obligations in the middle of their distress john rockefeller had foreclosed taking over their stocks leaving them so they charged no time in which to turn around although they felt certain that they would be able a little later out of the substantial business they claimed they had built up to pay their debt to him their future success proved they could have done so i could see john rockefeller's point as i talked with his brother frank frank rockefeller was an open-handed generous trader more interested in the game than in the money to be made he loved good horses raised them i believe on a farm out in kansas he liked gaiety free spending from his brother john's point of view he was not a safe man to handle money he did not reverence it he used it in frivolous ways of which his brother did not approve so it was as a kind of obligation to the sacredness of money that john rockefeller had foreclosed on his own brother and his early friend james corrigan he was strictly within his legal rights and within what i suppose he called his moral right but the transaction left a bitterness in frank rockefeller's heart and mind which was one of the ugliest things i have ever seen i have taken up my children from the rockefeller family lot or shall take up i do not know now which it was they shall not lie in the same enclosure with john d rockefeller the documents in this case which i later analyzed for the character sketch on which we had decided present a fair example of what were popularly called standard oil methods as well as what they could do to the minds and hearts of victims the more intimately i went into my subject the more hateful it became to me no achievement on earth could justify those methods i felt i had a great desire to end my task hear no more of it no doubt part of my revulsion was due to a fagged brain the work had turned out to be much longer and more laborious than i had had reason to expect the plan i had taken to mr mcclure in the fall of eighteen ninety which we had talked over in salso maggiore italy i still have notes of our talk on a yellow piece of the stationery of the hotel des termes called for three papers possibly twenty five thousand words but before we actually began publication mr phillips and mr mcclure decided we might venture on six we went through the six and the series was stretched to twelve before we were through we had nineteen articles and when the nineteen were off my hands i asked nothing in the world but to get them into a book and escape into the safe retreat of a library where i could study people long dead 
and if they did things of which i did not approve it would be all between me and the books there would be none of these harrowing human beings confronting me tearing me between contempt and pity admiration and anger baffling me with their futile and misdirected power or their equally futile and misdirected weakness i was willing to study human beings in the library but no longer for a time at least in flesh and blood so i thought the book was published in the fall of nineteen o four two fat volumes with generous appendices of what i considered essential documents i was curious about the reception it would have from the standard oil company i had been told repeatedly they were preparing an answer to flatten me out but if this was under way it was not with mr rockefeller's consent i imagined to a mutual friend who had told him the article should be answered mr rockefeller was said to have replied not a word not a word about that misguided woman to another who asked him about my charges he was reported as answering all without foundation the idea of the standard forcing any one to sell his refinery is absurd the refineries wanted to sell to us and nobody that has sold or worked with us has but made money is glad he did so i thought once of having an answer made to the mcclure articles but you know it has always been the policy of the standard to keep silent under attack and let their acts speak for themselves in the case of the lloyd book they had kept silent but only because mr rockefeller had been unable to carry out his plans for answering what he had proposed was a jury of the most distinguished clergymen of the day to consider mr lloyd's argument and charges certain clergymen invited refused unless there should be a respectable number of economists added to the jury that apparently mr rockefeller did not see his way to do and the plan was abandoned so far as i know mr lloyd's book was never answered by the standard oil company but i wanted an answer from mr rockefeller what i got was neither direct nor from my point of view serious it consisted of wide and what must have been a rather expensive anonymous distribution of various critical comments the first of these was a review of the book which appeared in the nation soon after its publication the writer one of the nation's staff reviewers i later learned sneered at the idea that there was anything unusual in the competitive practices which i called illegal and immoral they are a necessary part of competition he said the practices are odious it is true competition is necessarily odious was it necessarily odious i did not think so the practices i believed i had proved i continued to consider much more dangerous to economic stability than airing them even if i aired them in the excited and irrational fashion the review charged as i saw it the struggle was between commercial machiavellism and the christian code the most important part of the indirect answers was an able book by gilbert holland montague it separated business and ethics in a way that must have been a comfort to twenty six broadway as soon as it was published mr montague's book became not exactly a best seller but certainly a best circulator libraries ministers teachers prominent citizens all over the land receiving copies with the compliments of the publisher numbers of them came back to me with irritated letters we have been buying books for years from this house wrote one distinguished librarian and never before was one sent with their compliments i understand that libraries all over the country are receiving them can it be that this is intended as an advertisement or is it not more probable that the standard oil company itself is paying for this widespread distribution the general verdict seemed to be that the latter was the explanation some time later there came from the entertaining elbert hubbard of the roycroft shop of east aurora new york an essay on the standard extolling the grand results from the centralization of the industry in their hands i have it from various interested sources that five million copies were ordered printed in pamphlet form by the standard oil company and were distributed by mr hubbard they went to school teachers and journalists preachers and leaders from the atlantic to the pacific 
hardly were they received in many cases before they were sent to me with angry or approving comments for a couple of years my birthday and christmas offerings were sure to include copies of one or the other of these documents with the compliments of some waggish member of the mcclure group i had hoped that the book might be received as a legitimate historical study but to my chagrin i found myself included in a new school that of the muckrakers theodore roosevelt then president of the united states had become uneasy at the effect on the public of the periodical press's increasing criticisms and investigations of business and political abuses he was afraid that they were adding to the not inconsiderable revolutionary fever abroad driving people into socialism something must be done and in a typically violent speech he accused the school of being concerned only with the vile and debasing its members were like the man in john bunyan's pilgrim's progress who with eyes on the ground raked incessantly the straws the small sticks and dust of the floor they were muckrakers the conservative public joyfully seized the name roosevelt had of course misread his bunion the man to whom the interpreter called the attention of the pilgrim was raking riches which the interpreter contemptuously called straws and sticks and dust the president would have been nearer bunion's meaning if he had named the rich sinners of the times who in his effort to keep his political balance he called malefactors of great wealth if he had called them muckrakers of great wealth and applied the word malefactors to the noisy and persistent writers who so disturbed him i once argued with mr roosevelt that we on mcclure's were concerned only with facts not on stirring up revolt i don't object to the facts he cried but you and baker baker at that time was carrying on an able series of articles on the manipulations of the railroads but you and baker are not practical i felt at the time mr roosevelt had a good deal of the unusual conviction of the powerful man in public life that correction should be left to him a little resentment that a profession outside his own should be stealing his thunder this classification of muckraker which i did not like helped fix my resolution to have done for good and all with the subject which had brought it on me but events were stronger than i all the radical reforming element and i numbered many friends among them were begging me to join their movements i soon found that most of them wanted a tax they had a little interest in balanced findings now i was convinced that in the long run the public they were trying to stir would weary of vituperation that if you were to secure permanent results the mind must be convinced one of the most heated movements at the moment was the effort to persuade the public to refuse all gifts which came from fortunes into the making of which it was known illegal and unfair practices had gone do not touch tainted money men thundered from pulpit and platform among them so able a man as dr washington gladden the rockefeller fortune was singled out because about this time mr rockefeller made some unusually large contributions to colleges and churches and general philanthropy it is done cried the critics in order to silence criticism frequently someone said to me you have opened the rockefeller purse but i knew and said in print rather to the disgust of my friends in the movement that there was an unfairness to mr rockefeller in this outcry it did not take public criticism to open his purse from boyhood he had been a steady giver in proportion to his income ten per cent went to the lord and through all the harrowing early years in which he was trying to establish himself as a money-maker he never neglected to give the lord the established proportion as his fortune grew his gifts grew larger he not only gave but saw the money given was wisely spent and he trained his children particularly the son who was to administer his estate to as wise practice in public giving as we have ever had that is it did not take a public outcry such as came in the early years of this century against the methods of the standard oil company to force mr rockefeller to share his wealth 
he was already sharing it indeed in the fifteen years before nineteen o four he had given to one or another cause some thirty-five million dollars if his gifts were larger at this time than they had ever been before his money-making was greater if they were more spectacular than ever before it may have been because he thought it was time to call the public's attention to what they were getting out of the standard oil fortune at all events it seemed to me only fair that the point should be emphasized that it had not taken a public revolt against his methods to force him to share his profits i could not escape the controversies hard as i tried nor could i escape events events which were forcing me against my will to continue my observations and reports my book was hardly published before it was apparent that the oil field which it had covered and which for so long had been supposed to be the only american oil field of importance was soon to be surpassed by those in the southwest the first state to force recognition of the change on the country at large was kansas where suddenly in the spring of nineteen o five there broke out an agitation as unexpected to most observers as it was interesting to those who knew their oil history kansas we old-timers told ourselves was duplicating what the oil creek had done in eighteen seventy two it was putting on a revolt how had it come about for a number of years wildcatters with or without money had been prospecting for oil in the state only a modest production was rewarded them at first but in nineteen o four oil suddenly poured forth in great quantities on the instant kansas went oil mad practically every farmer in the state dreamed of flowing wells as soon as it was proved that kansas was to be a large field the standard took charge it leased drilled and most important it threaded the state with its pipeline system no sooner was oil proved to be on a farmer's land than the pipeline people were there caring for it at market rates but they began not only to develop and handle scientifically and efficiently but quite as scientifically and efficiently they began to get rid of all the small fry that in the early days of small wells had been refining and marketing they would take all the oil that kansas could produce they said but on their own terms they wanted no interference as soon as this became clear to kansas the state rose in revolt the populists who for six years now must needs grumble in a corner came out to inveigh with all of their old fervor against the trust women's clubs took it up political parties took it up a program was developed the gist of which was that kansas would take care of its own oil bills were introduced into the legislature calculated to control railroad rates pipeline rates competitive marketing to the joy of the populists and to the horror of the conservatives a bill for a state refinery was presented by the governor himself kansas had a hemp factory in the state penitentiary not doing so badly why should not the penitentiary run an oil refinery too the legislature agreed to do it the excitement grew and so attracted the attention of the country that the office concluded that i must go out and see what i could make of it i did not much want to go not only because of my desire to free myself of the subject but because my heart was too heavy with personal loss to feel enthusiasm for any task in the spring of nineteen o five my father had died after a long slow illness to me he had always been everything that is summed up in the word dear modest humorous hard-working friendly faithful in what he conceived to be the right he loved his family and friends and church and asked only to serve them his business associates held him as a man of honor and a gentleman father's death for a time darkened my world later i began to realize that the dearness of him was to remain as a permanent thing in my life but in nineteen o five this sense of continued companionship was something which came slowly out of a dark sea of loss so it was with a heavy heart that i went to see what was happening in kansas 
first i wanted to see with my own eyes if the fields i had been hearing about were as rich as advertised so i spent some ten days driving about southeastern kansas and northeastern oklahoma then just coming in with the promise of great wells it was about as exciting a journey as i have ever made it was on one of these trips i saw my first dust storm driving in a buckboard behind two spirited horses across a practically unbroken prairie my companion suddenly looked behind him jehoshaphat he shouted wrap your head up i turned to see the sky from horizon to zenith filled with dark rolling clouds it was not from fire what was it a dust storm my companion cried quickly and expertly he prepared to take it he loosened the check reins of the horses and the spirited animals evidently knowing what they were in for dropped their heads as low as they could hold them and leaned up against each other we wrapped ourselves as closely as we could and like the horses clung to each other the storm did not last long but it was pretty awful while it did the air was thick you could not breathe but it passed and i was ordered to shake myself out i found that i was almost engulfed with a fine black dust that it was packed close to the hubs of the wheels of our buckboard it was ten days before i got rid of that dust for it was ten days before i had a real bath the dust had turned the primitive water supplies into a muddy liquid quite impossible to drink and hopeless for cleansing the wonder of it was that the real discomforts counted not at all at the time i had joined an eager determined exultant procession of wild catters and promoters of youths looking for their chance or seeking adventure for the first time tasting it to the full nothing so great as this kansas and indian territory field had ever been known every well was to be a gusher every settlement a city on every side they were selling town lots and stock in oil companies one of the most irresponsible stock-selling schemes i had ever known i happened on in one of these trips two anxious-faced boys were going about among experienced oil men begging them for oil leases preferably oil leases on which there was a proved well the lads had come as sightseers and had been caught in the wild excitement of the region everybody had a scheme to make himself and his friends rich why not they and largely as a joke they had sent out a flamboyant letter offering stock in a mythical oil field the letter had gone to scores of innocents in the east and in answer school teachers clergymen and women with little or no money had poured in subscriptions if there had been a few subscriptions they would have been able to return them but here they were when i saw them with literally a suitcase full of checks and money orders and not a foot of land leased and in the excitement there was practically no land to be had they must either get a lease or go to the penitentiary they concluded hence their alarm their pitiful begging of older men to help them out of the predicament into which their irresponsibility had plunged them it was not long before i found i was being taken for something more serious than a mere journalist conservative standard oil sympathizers regarded me as a spy and not infrequently denounced me as an enemy to society independent oil men and radical editors who were in the majority called me a prophet it brought fantastic situations where i was utterly unfit to play the part a woman of twenty-five fresh full of zest only interested in what was happening to her would have reveled in the experience but here i was fifty fagged wanting to be let alone while i collected trustworthy information for my articles dragged to the front as an apostle the funniest things were the welcomes the funniest of all was at the then new town of tulsa oklahoma i had arrived late at night in what seemed to me a no-man's land and after considerable trouble had found a place in a rough little hostelry where i was so suspicious of the look of things that i moved the bureau against the lockless door i am now sure that i was as safe there as i should have been in my bed at home i had registered of course and the next morning before i had finished my breakfast i was waited on by the editor of the local newspaper 
who took me to his office a barn-like structure next door for an interview almost immediately a handsome youth in knickerbockers and high-laced boots came hurriedly in i think i ought to tell you miss tarbell he said with a grin that you are in for a serenade a serenade i said what do you mean well he said the tulsa boomers have been making a tour of cities to the north their special train has just come in they want something to celebrate and learning that you were in town they are sending up the band to welcome you they want a speech i had never made an impromptu speech in my life i was horrified at the idea you must get me out of this i begged of my gallant but very amused informer no he said there is no way to escape here they are and there they were a band of thirty or forty pieces several of the players stalwart indians i had to face it and for once in my life i had a happy idea go buy me two boxes of the best cigars that are to be had in town and i shoved a bill into his hand go quickly and then the band began not so bad but so funny there i was standing on the sidewalk with all the masculine inhabitants of tulsa so it seemed to me packed about some of them serious and some of them highly delighted at my obvious consternation i had not guessed wrong about the cigars they preferred them to a speech i saw as i passed around the circle distributing them to the players what was left i gave to the bodyguard which had assembled to back me up a compliment i have always treasured was given by one of the indians as he watched me disposing of my goods he all right still more flattering it was as i went around in tulsa that day to meet gentlemen who had fat cigars tied with little red ribbons in their buttonholes and to have them point gaily to them as i passed but the serenade was not the end of the celebration that afternoon i was taken out in a barouche the only one in the countryside i was told the band behind and paraded up and down the distracted streets of tulsa a day or two later when i went on my journey it was with a seat full of candy magazines books flowers everything that the community afforded for a going-away present i never had been before nor have been since so much the prima donna but all this was preliminary to the real task of finding out what was happening in kansas outside of the production of oil the legislation already passed was intended to make the standard oil company the servant of the state but i had long ago learned it was one thing to pass laws and another thing to enforce and administer them how were they getting on i went first to see the governor e w hoke a humorless and honest man it was he who had sponsored the state refinery i found him impressed by what he had done but a little doubtful about how things were going to come out he was opening his mail when i went in and he showed me letters nominating him for the presidency he had been receiving many of them he said it was obvious they came from radical socialists rejoicing over the encouragement that he was giving to the public ownership of industry he liked the applause but did not like the source he was no socialist he protested to me he was a firm believer in the competitive system the state refinery was a measuring stick he had wanted to settle definitely just what the profits of the refinery business in kansas were nobody knew except experts and they wouldn't tell a first-class oil refinery would settle for all time the cost of refining kansas oil and force the sale at a reasonable price he was not trying to drive private industry out of the state he merely wanted to force private industry to be reasonable the private industry being of course the standard oil company governor hoke and the state as a whole were soon feeling the effect of the letdown which always follows an exciting legislative campaign particularly for the winner not since the early nineties had kansas enjoyed so rousing a time and now it was over and they had to come down to business but could they get down to business could they administer the new laws meetings were being held half in jubilation over the successful legislation half in anxiety about the next step 
i was asked to come in and speak at one of them i was no speaker but i could not let them down moreover because of my familiarity with past exciting experiments on the part of indignant oil independence i realized better than they did so i thought the hard pull they had before them your problem now i told them is to do business as far as laws can ensure it you have free opportunity but good laws and free opportunity alone do not build up a business unless you can be as efficient and as patient as far-seeing as your great competitor laws or no laws you will not succeed you must make yourselves as good refiners as good transporters as good marketers as ingenious as informed as imaginative in your legitimate undertakings as they are in both their legitimate and illegitimate my speech was not popular what they wanted from me was a rousing attack on the standard oil company they wanted a merry lease to tell them to go on raising hell and here i was telling them that they had got all they could by raising hell and now they must settle down to doing business you have gone over to the standard oil company said one disgusted populist i saw i had ruined my reputation as the joan of arc of the oil industry as someone had named me but there were hard-headed independent legislators and businessmen in the state who consoled me you are right we must learn to do business as well as they do one immediate national effect of the kansas disturbance was to arouse the legislatures of other oil-producing states in the southwest to enact laws not unlike those of kansas though i do not remember that a state refinery was sponsored anywhere else there was a wide demand that congress place the pipeline system under the interstate commerce commission subject it to the same restrictions as interstate rails but most important was the fine popular backing the row gave the trust-busting campaign of theodore roosevelt now president of the united states he had begun his attack on big business by putting an end to the first great holding company the country had seen the northern securities company he had followed this by a bill establishing a department for which people had been asking for a decade or more that of commerce and labor including a bureau of corporations with power to examine books and question personnel congress at first shied at the measure but mr roosevelt thundered if you do not pass it this session i will call an extra session and they knew he would ironically enough it was the standard itself that broke the reluctance of congress the proposal had shocked it out of its usual discretion there never was an organization in the country which held secrecy more essential to doing business breaking down the walls behind which it operated was not to be tolerated it seems to have been the peppery john archbold who took charge of the fight against the bill using all the political influence of the company which was considerable at that moment roosevelt soon learned something of what was going on it is not certain how much and when he saw his measure in danger he gave out the statement that john d rockefeller had wired his friends in the senate we are opposed to any antitrust legislation it must be stopped the last thing in the world that john d rockefeller would have done was to send such a telegram to anybody probably mr roosevelt knew that but somebody in the standard was passing on such a word and mr rockefeller was the responsible head of the organization his name did the work congress passed the bill in a hurry the bureau of corporations was speedily set up an excellent man at its head james garfield the first task assigned it by the president was an investigation of the petroleum industry this investigation reported in 1906 that the Standard Oil Company was receiving preferential rates from various railroads, and had been for some time. One of the most spectacular business suits the company had seen up to that time followed. The Standard was found guilty by Judge Kennesaw Landis, the present arbitrator of the manners and morals of national baseball, and a punishment long known as the Big Fine, $29 million, inflicted the country gasped at the size of the fine but not so the bureau of corporations 
my correspondent there contended that over eight thousand true indictments had been found and that the maximum penalty would have amounted to over a hundred and sixty million dollars but even the twenty nine million dollars so modest in the view of the bureau of corporations was not allowed to stand for in nineteen o eight judge peter grosskup of the circuit court of appeals in illinois upset it roosevelt was angry there is too much power in the bench he told his friends but by this time the government had under way another and a much more serious line of attack from which roosevelt was hoping substantial results back in eighteen ninety the congress had enacted what was known as the sherman antitrust law a law making illegal every contract and combination restraining trade and fostering monopoly the government was now seeking to apply this law to the standard oil company was it not the first industry to attempt monopoly had it not been the model for all the brood such a suit was no new idea independent oil men had long talked of it and in eighteen ninety seven they had been ready to go ahead when at the last moment the lawyer to whom they had entrusted their case had suddenly taken ill and died it must have seemed to the energetic lewis emery jr who had been engineering the attack that the lord himself had gone over to the standard ten years went by and then in september nineteen o seven the united states of america began its suit against the standard oil company of new york et al there were months and months of hearings if i had been a modern newspaper woman i could have made a good killing out of that long investigation for more than one editor asked me to analyze the testimony as it came along or give my impressions of the gentleman who appeared on the witness stand but i had no stomach for it i never attended a public examination though of course i read the published testimony with care i knew well enough that the time would come when if i did my duty as a historian i must analyze the suit but that must be after it was ended and a sufficiently practical test had been made of the decision it would be a long time i told myself before i should be obliged to take up the story where i had left it End of chapter 12chapter thirteen part one of all in the day's work by ida tarbell the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain off with the old on with the new twelve years had gone by since i tied myself temporarily as i thought to the mcclure venture to my surprise the longer i was with the enterprise the more strongly i felt it was giving me the freedom i wanted as well as a degree of that security which makes freedom so much easier a load to carry here was a group of people i could work with without sacrifice or irritation here was a healthy growing undertaking which excited me while it seemed to offer endless opportunity to contribute to the better thinking of the country the future looked fair and permanent and then without warning the apparently solid creation was shattered and i found myself sitting on its ruins looking back now i know that the split in the mcclure staff in nineteen o six was inevitable neither mr mcclure nor mr phillips the two essential factors in the creation could have done other than he did the points at issue were fundamental each man acted according to an inner something which made him what he was something he could not violate back of the difficulty lay the fact that at this time mr mcclure was a sick man the hardships of his youth and early manhood the intense pressure he had put on himself in founding his enterprises had exhausted him for several years he had been obliged to take long vacations usually in europe with his family his staff carrying on his work in his absence the enterprises were bringing him larger and larger returns and more and more honor but that was not what he most wanted he wanted to be in the thick of things feel himself an active factor in what was doing above all he wanted to add to what he had already achieved to build a bigger a more imposing house of mcclure what he wanted was more money i have heard men comment they were wrong i have never known a man freer from the itch for money as an end than s s mcclure 
money for him meant power to do things to build to help others on his way up he had gathered about him a horde of dependents with whom he was always ready to share his last dollar he was reckless with money as with ideas in these years when he was practically living in europe though returning regularly to the united states his chief interest was not in what his enterprises were accomplishing but in adding something bigger than they were or could be only by doing this could he prove to himself and to his colleagues that he was a stronger and more productive man than ever nothing else would satisfy him his passion to build to realize his ambitions made him careless about laying foundations what he did usually had the character of improvisation frequently on a grand scale sometimes merely gay spurts of fancy i was myself caught up in one of the latter when mr mcclure in london suddenly ordered me in paris to drop whatever i was doing and to hurry into germany to collect material for an animal magazine animals were an abiding interest with mcclure's rudyard kipling laid the foundation in the jungle tales after that great series few were the numbers that did not have an animal in text and picture it was as much a passion as baseball was to become in the latter days with the american magazine i spent a lively month visiting zoos interviewing animal trainers and hunters and keepers buying books and photographs turning in what i considered a pretty good grist of materials and suggestions what became of it i never knew for i never heard a word of it after i came back to america the only remnant i have now of that month is a powder box of dresden china bought at the showrooms of the factory of the crossed swords it being my practice when on professional trips to use my leisure seeing the town guide-book in hand and buying all the souvenirs my purse permitted it was in nineteen o six that mr mcclure brought home from one of his foraging expeditions the plan which was eventually to wreck his enterprises he had it cut and dried ready to put into action without consultation with his partners he had organized a new company the charter of which provided not only for a mcclure's universal journal but a mcclure's bank a mcclure's life insurance company a mcclure's school book publishing company and later a mcclure's ideal settlement in which people could have cheap homes on their own terms it undertook to combine with a cheap magazine which it goes without saying was to have an enormous circulation with the enormous advertising which circulation brings an attempt to solve some of the great abuses of the day abuses at which we had been hammering in mcclure's magazine he proposed to do this by giving them a competition which would draw their teeth by the time mr mcclure got around to explaining his plan to me and asking my cooperation he had worked himself up to regarding it as an inspiration which must not be questioned it seemed to me to possess him like a religious vision which it was blasphemy to question obsessed as he was he was blind and deaf to the obstacles in the way i am sure i hurt mr mcclure by telling him bluntly and at once that i would never have anything to do with such a scheme in a recently published letter lincoln steffens tells how he saw mr mcclure's plan to him it was not only fool but not quite right certainly it was not right as organized it was a speculative scheme as alike as two peas to certain organizations the magazine had been battering the tragedy of the situation was that mr mcclure did not see and could not understand the arguments of his associates that his plan was not only impossible but wrong this failure of judgment was i am convinced due to his long illness the mental and physical exhaustion from which he was suffering and which he could not bring himself to understand or accept explains the unwisdom of this undertaking his contention that it was an inspiration his stubbornness in insisting that it be accepted and set to work human reason has a little influence on one who believes he is inspired the members of the staff were little more than outsiders when it came to the final decision 
it was up to john phillips to accept and do his utmost to aid in the grandiose adventure or patiently to wait while persuading the general that it was not the mission of the mcclure crowd to reconstruct the economic life of the country that we were journalists not financial reformers i think no man ever tried harder to keep another from a suicidal undertaking and certainly no man could have been firmer from the start in his refusal to go along the struggle went on for six months and no two men ever tried more honestly to adjust their differences but they were irreconcilable it came to a point where one or the other must sell his interest in the magazine it was mr mcclure who bought out his partner although mcclure's magazine is no longer on the newsstands it does occupy a permanent place in the history of the period that it served because it worked itself into the literary and economic life of the country it was a magazine which from the first put quality above everything else and was willing to chase checks around town in order to pay for it for those who collect kipling there are the first publications of many of his rarest poems short stories and such distinguished serials as captains courageous and kim here first appeared willa cather and o henry it was a magazine which backed regardless of expense one might say the investigations and reports of men like ray stannard baker and lincoln steffens for twelve years it encouraged with liberality and patience the work of which i have been talking in this narrative mr mcclure had two editorial policies when it came to getting the thing he felt was important for the magazine first the writer must be well paid and the expense money be generous second and most important of all he must be given time he did not ask that you produce a great serial in six months he gave you years if it was necessary i spent the greater part of five years on the history of the standard oil company i was what was called a contributing editor that is i turned in suggestions as they came to me in my work around the country i did occasional extra articles that seemed to be in my line i read and took part in editorial councils but it was recognized that all the time i demanded should be given to the serial i know of no other editor and no other publisher who has so fully recognized the necessity of generous pay and ample time if he were to get from a staff work done according to the best editorial standard and worthy of the magazine and the writer when it was finally decided that mr phillips was to sever his long relation to mcclure's several members of the editorial staff resigned including ray stannard baker lincoln steffens john siddle the efficient young managing editor albert boyden and myself we could not see the magazine without mr phillips the last day we left the office then on twenty-third street near fourth avenue some of us went together to madison square and sat on a bench talking over our future we were derelicts without a job but not for long there was then in new york though it was not generally known a magazine group which wanted a change the magazine was very old long known as frank leslie's illustrated monthly recently changed to the american magazine its owner was frederick l culver its editor ellery sedgwick afterward editor of the atlantic its publisher william morrow after the founder of william morrow and company the book publishing house mr culver approached mr phillips why don't you take it over finally in council assembled our editorial group together with david a mckinley and john trainer of the mcclure business department decided to incorporate the phillips publishing company and buy the american magazine with what we could put in ourselves and money from the sale of stock to interested friends we secured funds for the purchase and sufficient working capital we left mcclure's in march six months later october nineteen o six appeared our first issue the announcement shows how seriously we took ourselves as befitted people who had seen something in which they deeply believed go to pieces we had been too cruelly bruised to take anything lightly but luckily we were able to make two additions to our staff each man with a vein of humor not to be dried up or muddled by any cataclysms 
william allen white and finley peter dunn mr dooley we had known mr white in the mcclure's office since the day of his famous editorial what's the matter with kansas after that came his boyville stories two or three of which mcclure's published and then at intervals studies of political situations and political figures it was not long before he began to come to new york he was a little city shy then or wanted us to think so as i was one of the official entertainers of the group it occasionally fell to me to take him by the hand as he put it and show him the town i could have hardly had a more delightful experience he judged new york by kansas standards and new york usually suffered his affection and loyalty for his state his appreciation and understanding of everything that she does wise and foolish the incomparable journalistic style in which he presents her are what has made him so valuable a national citizen his crowning achievement among the many to be credited to him has been remaining first last and always the editor of the emporia gazette a staunch friendship had sprung up between mr white and mr phillips and it was natural enough that he interested himself in the new venture as for peter dunn we went after him and rather to my surprise he came along taking a desk in our cramped offices and appearing with amazing regularity at this time he was some forty years old the greatest satirist in my judgment the country has yet produced he had a wide knowledge of men and their ways there was no malice in his judgments but a great contempt for humbuggery as well as for all forms of self-deception devoted to uplifting the world however he felt kindly towards our ardent desire to improve things by demonstrating their unsoundness and approved our unwillingness to use any other tools than those which belonged legitimately to our profession he came out strongest in his contributions to the department of editorial comment which mr phillips had introduced under the head of the interpreter's house we were all supposed to contribute whatever was on our minds to this department mr phillips and mr dunn did the censoring and dovetailing i did not often make the interpreter's house much to my chagrin dunn said you sputter like a woman which i fear was true if it had not been for him the first christmas issue of the interpreter's house would have been bleak reading we had each of us broken forth in lament for the particular evil of the world which was disturbing us offering our remedies it seems to me wrote dunn editing our contributions that we are serving up a savory christmas number a nice present to be found in the bottom of a stocking you cannot go to the patent office in washington and take out a patent that will transform men into angels the way upward long and tedious as it is lies through the hearts of men it has been so since the founding of the feast nothing has been proved more clearly in the political history of the race than this that good will to men has done more to improve government than laws and wars let us close down our desks for the year if you want to find me for another week i will be found in the wonderful little toy shop around the corner that editorial broke the tension which had made me think this was no time to go home for christmas i went peter dunn hated the pains of writing his labor affected the whole office sympathy with what he was going through fear that his copy would not be in on time eagerness to see it when it came to know if it was one of his best but peter's work was never what he thought it ought to be and he sought forgetfulness indispensable on the new editorial staff seeing peter through his birth pains keeping the rest of us at our tasks nursing new writers making up the magazine was albert boyden he had come fresh from harvard to mcclure's and had at once made himself a place by his genius for keeping things going and his gift for sympathetic friendliness it was a combination which became more valuable and irresistible as time went on bert was everybody's friend whether editor artist or writer one can have friends one can have editors ray stannard baker was to write later but bert was both he was of the greatest value to the american in bringing together writers and artists who were attaching themselves to the new magazine 
bert was so fond of us all that he could not endure the idea that we did not all know one another and he made it his business to see that we had at least the opportunity he lived on the south of stuyvesant square four flights up there was no one in all that circle of distinguished contributors who did not welcome the chance to climb those stairs to bert's dinners and teas and what a group of people came they are recorded in his guest book booth tarkington edna ferber stuart edward white his wife and his brother gilbert julian and ada street the norrises the rices and martins of louisville joe chase will irwin and a dozen more along with visiting celebrities politicians scientists adventurers what talk went on in that high up living room what wonderful tales we heard bert was so much younger than the rest of us so full of enthusiasm and hope so much more vital and all shedding that it is still to me incredible that he should have left this world so much earlier than i he died in nineteen twenty five but he lives in a little book which j s p edited in his memory how proud bert would have been of that there is nobody like j s p he used to say many of his big circle of friends contributed their recollections of him i have never known another person in my life for whom quite such a book could have been written in spite of the gay unity of our group the vigor and steadiness with which it began and continued its operation i had suffered a heavy shock i know now i should not have taken it as well as i did and inwardly that was nothing to boast of if it had not been cushioned by an engrossing personal interest i had started out to make a home for myself i had already made three major attempts to establish myself first in meadville then in paris then in washington and all had failed when in eighteen ninety eight it became evident that if i were to remain on the mcclure staff i must come to new york i was in no mood to adopt a new home town new york might be my writing headquarters but titusville should be home finally i would return there i told myself but titusville was five hundred miles away there were no airplanes in those days the railroad journey was tedious and expensive weekending was impossible i soon grew weary of the weekend makeshifts of a homeless person in a city i wanted something of my own and at last by a series of circumstances purely fortuitous i acquired forty acres on a little old house in connecticut i had meant to let the land and the house run to seed if they wanted to i had no stomach or money for a place i wanted something of my very own with no cares idle dream in a world busy in adding artificial cares to the load nature lays on our shoulders things happened the roof leaked the grass must be cut if i was to have a comfortable sward to sit on water in the house was imperative and what i had not reckoned with came from all the corners of my land incessant calls fields calling to be rid of underbrush and weeds and turn to their proper work a garden spot calling for a chance to show what it could do apple trees begging to be trimmed and sprayed i had bought an abandoned farm and it cried loud to go about its business why should i not answer the cry why should i not be a farmer before i knew it i was at least going through the motions having fields ploughed putting in crops planting an orchard supporting horses a cow a pig a poultry yard giving up a new evening gown to buy fertilizer seeing what i was in for and fearing lest i should do as so many of my friends had done go in deeper than my income justified find myself borrowing and mortgaging in order to carry out the fascinating things i saw to do i laid down a strict rule which i have followed ever since and which i recommend to people of limited incomes who acquire a spot in the country and want it to be a continuous pleasure instead of a continuous anxiety i resolved that i would spend only what i could lay aside from income that i would divide this appropriation into three parts one for the land one for the house one for furnishing as the budget was very small it meant that a thousand things that i wanted to do went undone and still are undone 
but it meant also that i had little or no financial anxiety if the call of the land had been unexpected and not to be denied even more unexpected and still less to be denied was the call of the neighbourhood i was not long in learning that in the houses i could see in valley and on hillside centred the most genuine of human dramas tragic and comic after the land and its background the greatest gift of god to us us including my niece esther was our nearest neighbors mr and mrs g burr tucker at the side of whose house swung a sign antiques for sale but it was as neighbors not as customers mr and mrs tucker regarded us from the start when burr was not over helping us settle he was watching what was going on from his front porch i have never had more pungent salty faithful friends they had spent most of their lives on the corner not always selling antiques mrs tucker had taught in the schoolhouse at the top of the hill for twenty-nine years and burr had had a varied and picturesque career as a salesman of pumps fruit trees any gadget that seemed to be useful to his country neighbors not long before we moved in he had discovered by accident that there were people in the outside world who bought old spinning wheels ancient chairs ancient pottery burr knew the contents of every garret and woodshed for twenty miles around and when he made his discovery he began systematically to buy them out by the time i arrived on the scene he had an established business not knowing whether we were going to like our new acquisition well enough to make it permanent esther and i had decided to furnish out of a department store basement but in looking over burr's miscellaneous assortment my eye fell on an old-fashioned melodeon charming in line its bellows broken but easy to repair ten dollars i couldn't resist it and so i became almost from the first day a customer of my nearest neighbor it was a great day when burr went teaking as they called the hunt for treasures we would watch for his return and when his white horse and wagon loaded high with loot appeared down the road we were on the ground as soon as he was not only did the immediate vicinity yield rich and exciting material but a little distance away there were people from the world we knew there were the friends who had first shown me the country noble and ella hogson up the valley the centre of a jolly and interesting group known as the valley crowd a mile or so away was one of the most interesting women in the literary world of that day jeanette gilder sister of richard watson gilder a lively writer and editor perhaps no woman in her time carried to more perfection the then feminine vogue for severe masculine dress stout shoes short skirt mannish jacket shirt tie hat stick they were the last word in style they suited her as they did few for she was large of frame with strong bold features and a fine swinging gait but the masculinity was all on the surface esther came home one day shouting with laughter miss gilder is a fake she wears silk petticoats and is afraid of mice soon after i acquired my farm the countryside was stirred by the news that mark twain was building only eight or nine miles away from us everybody seemed to know what was happening with the building the settling the life going on that was partly because of our omnivorous curiosity and partly because mark twain was a friendly neighbor he every now and then gave a great party sending the invitations around by our peripatetic butcher a member of one of our first families a gentleman as well as a good tradesman i have a few treasured recollections of days when jeanette gilder and i drove over to tea or lunch with mark twain heard great stories of the doings in his new home it was from him that i heard the story of the famous burglary it was from him i heard the story of one of the best practical jokes ever played when peter dunn and robert collier sent him an elephant not only was all this fun and excitement and novelty shared by my niece and those of my family who came to see what we were so excited about but every member of the american staff sooner or later appeared at the farm to look us over from the start our chief counsellor had been bert boyden who six months after i had taken the first option on the place had insisted on accompanying me to see whether i had better take it up 
bert looked at the oaks he looked at the gay little stream that ran across the land and without hesitation said buy it and buy it i did having had a part in the purchase bert superintended henceforth all changes he approved my plan of budgeting he helped me select the wallpapers which were hung he was interested in the larder for the winter in the summer when his family was at a distance j s p came often to discuss the perplexities of the magazine and rest himself from the commotion of the office the norrises came and kathleen named my pig who but kathleen would have called him juicy he looked it fat as butter the siddles came often for in the summer we kept their famous cat sammy siddle the rices the martins the bakers all came to look on that rough land and shell of a house and wonder i suspect how i could be happy with anything so simple be satisfied with no more pretentious plans than i had among those who came in those early days was one who has left a crimson streak across the history of his time jack reed jack just out of harvard was giving half time to the american half time to writing we would invite him for the weekend but he was never at the station when we drove over to find him likely he had missed his train taken a freight that was more fun and late in the evening he would come walking over the hilltop demanding food and a bed and we would sit long hearing the adventures of his day it was on one of these trips that jack found nearby a natural amphitheatre before he had left he had planned to buy the place and worked out in detail a greek theatre he started towards new york on foot expecting to raise money from friends en route i was all ready to put up money one of them told me not many years ago but when jack was back at his desk in new york he forgot the theatre i never heard of it afterwards that was the delightful creature jack reed was up to the time that he discovered what is called life he took it hard now his bones lie under a tomb in moscow one of the martyrs to lenin's great vision of the communal life end of chapter thirteen part one chapter thirteen part two of all in the day's work by ida tarbell the sleepervox recording is in the public domain off with the old on with the new all this was good for me cushioned the shock i had suffered convinced me that at least i had gotten my hands on something permanent a fundamental factor in my future security a home a home capable of feeding me if the worst came to the worst but while it was good for me it was not so good for my work on the magazine i had believed i could work better in the quiet of the country but i was discovering that the country was more exciting than the town and the office as i knew it its attractions were proving too much for the difficult task which had been assigned me in the planning for the first year of the american the task was nothing less than to write a history of the making of our tariff schedules from the civil war on it had been a natural enough selection for me after the experience with the history of the standard oil company for the tariff was quite as much a matter of popular concern at the moment as the trust had been in nineteen hundred there was a growing demand for revision how could we get into the fight a subject must be found for me how about the tariff was a historical treatment possible i thought so at least i so despised the prohibitive tariff that i was willing to try if the magazine was willing to back me i suppose most of us have had at various periods of our life homemade remedies for the economic ills we see about us when i was a girl in high school i looked on an eight-hour day of productive labor for everybody as the way out i was much less worried by the hardships the long day brought working people than the mental and moral deterioration i imagined suffered by people who did not work idleness not labor was the scourge of the world for me the eight-hour day was a save the idle day before i left the chautauquan i had concluded that there was a trilogy of wrongs all curable responsible for our repeated depressions and our poorly distributed wealth discrimination in transportation tariffs save for revenue only 
private ownership of natural resources i was still of that opinion when largely by accident i had my chance to strike at number one in my trilogy could i by the method i had followed in that case and the only one i knew how to use present a plausible argument against number two what had particularly aroused me was the way tariff schedules were made the strength of what we now call pressure groups the powerful lobbies in wool and cotton and iron and sugar which for twenty-five years i had watched mowing congress down like a high wind there was no concealment of the pressure the lobbyists went at it hammer and tongs and battered down opposition with threats bribes and unparalleled arrogance by these tactics they had overcome mr cleveland's famous tariff message of eighteen eighty six had passed the outrageous mckinley bill of eighteen ninety had ruined the wilson bill of eighteen ninety three had defeated the promise of mckinley and dingley and aldrich to lower duties in eighteen ninety six and had substituted the highest and most distorted schedules the country had yet seen but it looked in nineteen o six as if the day of judgment was near and i asked nothing better than to be on the jury i went into it blindly on faith certainly not on knowledge and i had a handicap that i was far from realizing at the time that was that while in the case of the standard oil i had spent my life close to the events the tariff and its makers had never touched my life this was something i had read in a book another handicap was that my indignation was directed towards legal acts congress had adopted these schedules under coercion if you please but still it had adopted them the beneficiaries had the sanction of law it was a different case from challenging railroad discriminations which were forbidden by law as i worked on the congressional record and related documents i looked up men still living who had had a part in the struggle on one side or the other there were many of them scattered around the country now out of congress for the most part but not averse to talking as a rule i got little from them the fight which seemed to me so important was a dead issue to them they had lost or won it was all part of a game fresh from reading the daily discussions in the record curious about this or that man or argument i found them hazy often not particularly interested there was little of the righteous indignation which i thought i found in their recorded speeches had that been political instead of righteous indignation i began to think so it was grover cleveland who put heart in me he had lost none of his righteous indignation over the aid prohibitive tariffs were giving certain trusts none of his alarm over the growing disparity between industry and agriculture they were fostering he felt deeply the wrong of the prices they were inflicting on the farmer the professional class the poor i got nothing but encouragement from him for the review i had planned luckily i already had a pleasant working relation with mr cleveland it had come about in my last two years on mcclure's when my chief editorial task had been trying to persuade him that it was his duty to write his reminiscences for us incidentally offering myself as a ghost if he felt that he needed one as his letters to me at this time show he was not entirely unfriendly to the project i want to do the thing and yet i am afraid the difficulties in the way of doing it are fundamental and inexorable you see the project requires me to exploit myself and my doings before the public i do not see how i can do this though i am terribly vain and often bore my friends privately by tiresome reminiscence and yet i cannot but think that there are incidents and results in my career which by their narration might be of service in stimulating those who aspire to good citizenship and there we are this latter consideration hints of duty but then comes the fear that what seems to me duty is a mere fantastic notion and thereupon the old disinclination resumes its sway i have frequently thought no one could help me so much as you and it has seemed to me more than once that you and i might possibly cook up something in a summer vacation's freedom from distractions 
nothing came at this time nineteen o four of the tarbell cleveland fantasy as mr cleveland gaily dubbed it and two years later the project was dismissed but in a letter so friendly that i cannot resist quoting from it i do not believe a man who has turned the corner of sixty-nine years is any less vain and self-satisfied than when he was a youth at any rate here i am in this sixty-nine predicament delighted with the generous things you say of me in the goodness of your heart and more than halfway deluding myself into the notion that i deserve them i want to be very sensible and hard-headed in this affair but in any event i am entitled to rejoice in your good opinion of me and your hearty wishes for my welfare and happiness i thank you from the bottom of my heart for them and i shall gratefully remember them as long as i live somehow i have an idea that you know me well and surely i need not afflict myself with the fear of vanity if i have found a friend in you with those letters in my files i felt free when i undertook the tariff work for the american to ask mr cleveland to talk to me about the making of his tariff message in eighteen eighty six and the failure of the wilson bill in eighteen ninety three he was most generous and when i had completed my story of the two episodes i asked him to read the manuscript and give me a candid judgment and of course his corrections and his suggestions the chief suggestion that he made shows a sensitiveness to his literary style in public documents which i had not suspected charming letter-writer as mr cleveland was in his public documents he was ponderous i must have enlarged a little on this for i find this paragraph in his letter with which he sent back the proofs i have ventured to suggest a little toning down of your characterization of my style thinking perhaps you would be willing to make an alteration to please me if for no other reason you know we are all a little sensitive on such a point there was another paragraph in that letter which touched me deeply your article has caused me to feel again the greatest sorrow and disappointment i have ever suffered in my public career the failure of my party to discharge its most important duty and its fatuous departure from its appointed mission but lean as heavily as i dared on mr cleveland work as i would and did on the tariff debates of congress i can wish my worst enemy no greater punishment than reading them in full i could not put vitality into my narrative it was of the congressional record it was second-hand it was the making of the payne aldrich bill in nineteen o nine that finally gave a certain life to my narrative here was something belonging to the present not something of the past by all the signs theodore roosevelt should have been the st george to lead in the revision the public was calling so loudly for particularly after the panic of nineteen o seven few of his party leaders paid attention are not all our fellows happy speaker joseph cannon asked as the demand for revision became louder roosevelt himself heard it but frankly said to his intimates that he did not know anything about the tariff he did not and he would not take the time to learn he hammered at the effects of privilege pursued malefactors of great wealth but was not willing to do the hard studying of the causes which produced the malefactors mr taft who followed roosevelt had no choice the platform on which he was elected called unequivocally for tariff reform and as soon as he was inaugurated he called a special session to do the work my chagrin was great when i realized at once that all the ancient technique i had been trying to discredit was repeating itself it is i told myself the same old circus the same old gilded chariots the same old clowns so far as arguments were concerned they might have been taken from the hearings of eighty three of eighty eight of ninety three of ninety six figures were changed and nobody could deny that these figures of growth were impressive but they came from interested men they are incapable of judging mr carnegie told the committee no judge should be permitted to sit in a cause in which he is interested you make the greatest mistake in your life if you attach importance to an interested witness 
the process which sunset cox back in the seventies characterized as reciprocal rapine buying votes for the schedule their constituents wanted by voting for schedules they could not justify was in full swing never was the tariff as the cause of prosperity worked harder it was the answer of the prohibitive protectionist to the charge that the tariff was a tax in all the early years they had called it so a tax to produce revenue encourage new industries protect higher wages a better standard of living but mr cleveland had called it boldly a vicious inequitable illogical tax and illustrated his adjectives tellingly the effect of his attack was so disastrous that the supporters of prohibitive duties went into a huddle to find a new name the cause of prosperity was the euphemism they produced a repeater that had figured in every tariff bill was the answer of the priests of the dogma to the argument that the poor should be considered according to the pictures they drew there were no poor in the united states this refusal to recognize poverty was no more discouraging in the making of the bill of nineteen o nine than the indifference to the effect high tariffs were having on the cost of the necessities of life in this they ran true to historical precedent from the time the business man took charge in the late seventies any attempt to call the attention at hearings to what a duty would do to the price of a necessity of life was ignored or jeered justice brandeis then plain lawyer brandeis was before a committee considering the dingley bill and for whom do you appear he was asked for the consumer he answered the committee chairman and all laughed aloud but they were good enough to say oh let him run down this old indifference to the effects of higher prices on the living of the poor stirred me to the only article in my series which seemed to take hold i called it where every penny counts the worthwhile thing from my point of view was that it reached women i never knew what the tariff meant before jane adams wrote me here was something which touched those in whom she was interested wage earners she knew from actual contact what the increase of a cent in the price of a quart of milk a spool of thread a pound of meat meant to working girls with their six or eight dollars a week she knew that every penny added to the cost of their food clothes or coal gave less warmth less covering it was not difficult to show that what they were trying to do in washington in the making of the payne aldrich bill was just that a tariff that would add to the cost of things that must be had if people were to live at all to my deep satisfaction this effort to make the new tariff bill in the good old way was promptly met by a rousing challenge from a group of progressive republican senators men who had been largely responsible for forcing the promise to reform into the party platform when they discovered that there would be no reform if the lobbyists and their friends in congress could prevent it they crystallized into one of the most vigorous and intelligent fighting bands that had been seen for many years in congress insurgents they were called the leader in the revolt interested in railroad reform rather than the tariff was la follette of wisconsin others were beveridge of indiana cummins and dolliver of iowa bora of idaho and bristow of kansas they were already familiar figures at the american along with certain members of the house particularly the salty and peppery william kent of california phillips baker and stephens being in frequent communication with them the most brilliant and witty as well as the most thoroughly informed of the tariff insurgents was the amiable senator dolliver from iowa twenty years in congress always regular always stoutly supporting the tariff bills turned out by the committee what ails you now i asked him well he said i had been going on for twenty years taking practically without question what they handed me but these alliances between the party and industrial interests have at last set me thinking i began to understand something of the injustice that was being done to the consumer and then we promised to reform the tariff when the insurgents divided up the schedules for study schedule k wool 
the most difficult and the most important politically fell to senator dolliver he found he had been voting for years for duties which when he sat down to read the schedule he could not understand he discovered they were a mixture of tricks evasions and discriminations intended to be so he believed he determined to master them and master them he did by months of the severest night work he pored over statistics and technical treatises he visited mills and importing houses and retail shops he sought the aid of experts and in the end he knew his subject so well that he went onto the floor of the senate without a manuscript and literally played with schedule k and incidentally also with senator aldrich who was said to fly to the cloakroom whenever senator dolliver rose to speak when he had finished his clean competent dissection schedule k lay before the senate a law without principles or morals and yet just as it was the senate of the united states passed it and the president of the united states signed it and it went on the statute books why neither mr taft nor mr aldrich defended the wool schedule which made the bill odious they both were frank in explaining that it was politically necessary not at all a question of the fairness of the schedule but a question of what powerful interests demanded the wool interests could defeat the bill if they did not get what they wanted my conviction about the inequity of schedule k was so strong that when the outlook published a long defense of it plainly an advertisement but not so marked i protested in a personal letter to its vociferous contributing editor theodore roosevelt with whom by this time i was on fairly friendly terms just what i said in my letter about the herald which so stirred his wrath i do not remember but his answer to my comment is so typically rooseveltian in temper and reasoning that i think it should be preserved may sixth nineteen eleven oh miss tarbell miss tarbell how can you take the view you do of the herald you compare it with the tribune it is perfectly legitimate to compare the tribune with mr watterson's paper the courier journal honest people could agree or disagree about those two papers personally i think that during the last thirty or forty years the tribune has been infinitely more helpful to good causes than the courier journal but as i say people can differ on such a subject and i should be very glad to meet at any time either henry waterston or whitelaw reed but to compare either one of them with the herald is literally and precisely as if i should compare either the american magazine or the outlook with town topics having expressed his opinion of the herald he proceeded to an elaborate specious explanation of the matter which had so stirred my ire that i had protested to him now as for what you say about the outlook's publishing the truth about k in the first place i admit at once that the title the type and the placing of this advertisement did make it look to many readers like an editorial article we use the same title type and placing that had been used for similar articles for twenty years but our attention was subsequently called to the fact to which you now call my attention i e that some people were misled in the matter and in consequence we at once abandoned this twenty years custom from now on every article of the kind will appear under the heading of advertising department or advertising section so that there cannot be any possible mistake in the future as for the publication of the article itself i most emphatically think that it was not only justifiable but commendable the outlook publishes continually letters from people upholding policies or view with which the outlook diametrically disagrees for example the outlook has on several different occasions published letters taking a very dark view of my own character and achievements whether at san juan hill or elsewhere this particular article by spencer i should have been glad to see published in the regular section of the outlook as putting forth his side of the case just as i am now trying to secure publication in the outlook of an article from the northwestern farmers giving their side of the case against canadian reciprocity 
spencer's article however was too long and such being the case as i say i was not merely willing but glad to see it put in i did not know it had been put in of course until long after it had appeared but when i did see it i was glad that it had been put in probably you know that on april eighth the outlook editorially took up this question stated that the american woolen company was entirely justified in printing their article as an advertisement and that the outlook violated in no degree the ethics of journalism in admitting the advertisement to its pages and expressed its total disagreement with the views expressed in the article i would have gone further than this i would have stated that the outlook did not violate the ethics of journalism but rendered a great and needed service as an example in showing its willingness to accept the statement of a case with which it did not agree to put it in exactly as it was written and then itself to comment with absolute freedom as it has done upon the arguments made in the advertisement let me repeat that if the outlook had had space which it unfortunately did not have i should have been glad to see spencer's article inserted not as an advertisement but as a communication signed by spencer and avowedly stating his side of the case sincerely yours theodore roosevelt i felt i had won my case with mr roosevelt's assurance that henceforth every article of the kind would appear under the head of advertising department when the payne aldrich bill was finally passed with mr taft's and mr aldrich's brutally frank explanations i was done with the tariff as a subject for further study and writing four years later came the democratic effort to make a revision i had only the most casual interest it was the same old method they might make a better bill i told myself but there could never be a fair one as long as tariffs were set by a congress under the thumb of people personally interested one thing seemed clear to me which is still clearer now the combined prohibitive tariff industries were digging their own grave foreign markets they had to have but they refused to buy from those to whom they wanted to sell what the gentlemen did not realize was that by this procedure they were practically forcing nations not naturally industrial to copy their methods industrialize themselves these nations soon were succeeding with such skill that in spite of the boosting of the tariff again and again the foreigners continued to undersell us but the prohibitive protectionists were building a future competitor threatening to be stronger than foreign trade this in the realm of politics there had been no more hardy and conscienceless supporters of prohibitive tariffs than certain groups of organized labor conspicuously the amalgamated steel and iron workers under john jarrett they were not a numerous body but with the cry of the full dinner pail they were able to back the demands of the employers they had a body of votes that no political party dared defy but in teaching organized labor the power of political pressure the industrialists gave them a weapon that they did not see might one day be turned against themselves back in the eighties one of the wisest and soundest economists we have produced david a wells said in substance of the victory of the tariff lobbies this is a revolution it will take another revolution to overthrow the leadership now established by businessmen i felt after the bill of nineteen o nine that there was nothing for an outsider like me to do but wait for that revolution i felt this so deeply that when president wilson invited me to be a member of the tariff commission he formed in december nineteen sixteen i refused i was pleased of course that mr wilson thought me fit for such a place i knew that i should find the associations interesting the dean of tariff students in the united states dr tossig of harvard was the chairman to be under him would be an education that would be worth the taking but i did not hesitate first there was my personal situation my obligations i had no right to give up my profession for a connection of that sort in its nature temporary then i realized my own unfitness as mr wilson could not i had had no experience in the kind of work this required i was an observer and reporter not a negotiator i am not a good fighter in a group 
i forget my duty in watching the contestants but primarily there was my hopelessness about the service the tariff commission might render its researches and its conclusions however sound would stand no chance in congress when a wool or iron or steel or sugar lobby appeared a tariff commission was hamstrung from the start of course it was not only my interest in work on the tariff that had led mr wilson to offer me the position he was looking about for women to whom he could give recognition he was an outspoken advocate of suffrage and wanted to use women when he thought them qualified jane adams pleaded with me to accept for the sake of women but i did not feel that women were served merely by an appointment to office women like men serve in proportion to their fitness for office to the actual fact that they have something to contribute i had no enthusiasm for the task did not even respect it greatly i believed too that harm is done all around by undertaking technical jobs without proper scientific training the cause of women is not to be advanced by putting them into positions for which they are untrained the press comments on the idea of a woman on this commission were not unfriendly as far as i saw them but they were a little surprised and as i was to find later protests were made to mr wilson my friend ray stannard baker working on the wilson papers came across an answer of the president on december twenty seventh nineteen sixteen to one protesting gentleman which i am not too modest to print as a matter of fact she has written more good sense good plain common sense about the tariff than any man i know of and is a student of industrial conditions in this country of the most serious and sensible sort End of chapter 13, part 2. Chapter 14 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Golden Rule in Industry. I was done with the tariff, but it was out of the tariff that my next serial came, born partly of a guilty conscience in attempting to prove that in certain highly protected industries only a small part of a duty laid in the interest of labor went to labor i had taken satisfaction in picturing the worst conditions i could find badly ventilated and dangerous factories unsanitary homes underfed children but in looking for this material i found in both protected and unprotected industries substantial and important efforts making to improve conditions raise wages shorten hours humanize relations my conscience began to trouble me was it not as much my business as a reporter to present this side of the picture as to present the other if there were leaders in practically every industry who regarded it not only as sound ethics but as sound economics to improve the lot of the worker ought not the public to be familiarized with this belief at that moment and indeed for a good many years the public had heard little except of the atrocities of industrial life by emphasizing the reformers had hoped to hasten changes they sought the public was coming to believe that the inevitable result of corporate industrial management was exploitation neglect bullying crushing of labor that the only hope was in destroying the system but if the practices were not universal if there was a steady though slow progress ought not the public to recognize it was it not the duty of those who were called muckrakers to rake up the good earth as well as the noxious was there not as much driving force in a good example as in an evil one the office was not unfriendly to the idea as a matter of fact the american magazine had little genuine muckraking spirit it did have a large and fighting interest in fair play it sought to present things as they were not as somebody thought they ought to be we were journalists not propagandists and as journalists we sought new angles on old subjects the idea that there was something fundamentally sound and good in industrial relations that in many spots had gone far beyond what either labor or reformers were demanding 
came to the office as a new attack on the old problem mr phillips always keenly aware of the new and significant had his eye on the movement i found and was willing to commission me to go out and see what i could find this was in nineteen twelve and for the next four years i spent the bulk of my time in factories and industrial towns the work took me from maine to alabama from new york to kansas i found my material in all sorts of industries iron and steel in and around pittsburgh chicago duluth mines in west virginia illinois and wisconsin paper boxes and books and newspapers everywhere candy in philadelphia beer and tanneries and woodwork in wisconsin shirts and collars and shoes in new york and massachusetts i watched numberless things in the making turbines and optical lenses jewelry and mesh bags kodaks and pocket knives plated cutlery and solid silver tea services minton tableware and american balique cans and ironware linen tablecloths and sails for a cup defender furniture i suspected was to be sold in europe for antiques and bric-a-brac i knew was to be sold in america as chinese importations railroad rails and wire for a thousand purposes hookless fasteners and mechanical toys i seemed never to tire of seeing things made but do not ask me now how they were made i never counted the number of factories i visited looking at the volume in which i finally gathered my findings i find there are some fifty-five major concerns mentioned but these were those which in my judgment best illustrated the particular point i was trying to make there were many more my visits had to be arranged beforehand i took pains to make sure of my credentials but i soon discovered that my past work served me well the heads of the industries and many workmen were magazine readers liked to talk about writers and asked all sorts of curious questions about men and women they had become acquainted with in mcclure's in the american kipling baker steffens will white edna ferber just coming on at that time there was often considerable asperity at the top when i presented my letters of introduction they set me down as an enemy of business but again and again this asperity was softened by a man's love of abraham lincoln he had a habit of reading everything about lincoln that he could put his hands on collected books brought out my life to be autographed that is while i was persona non grata for one piece of work another piece softened suspicion and opened doors to me my first move in a factory was to study the processes of the particular industry machines were not devils to me as they were to some of my reforming friends particularly that splendid old warrior florence kelly then in the thick of her fight for ethical gains through legislation to me machines freed from heavy labor created abundance that is i started out free of the inhibition that hate of a machine puts on many observers i think because of this i was better able to judge the character of a factory to see its weak as well as its good points i was able to understand what the enemy of the machine rarely admits that men and women who have arrived at the dignity of steady workers not only respect but frequently take pride in their machines again i gave myself time around these factories the observer who once in his life goes down for half a day into a mine or spends two or three hours walking through a steel mill naturally revolts against the darkness the clatter the smoke the danger as a rule he misses the points of real hardship he also misses the satisfactions as my pilgrimage lengthened i became more and more convinced that there is no trade which has not its devotee once a miner always a miner once a sailor always a sailor one might go through the whole category why i now and then asked miners do you stay by the mine i was brought up to it i like it nobody bothers you when you are working with a pick nice and quiet in the mines but the danger no worse than railroading my brother got killed by a horse last week 
in the end i came to the conclusion that there was probably no larger percentage of those who did not like the work they were doing than there is in the white-collar occupations in the heavy industries particularly i found something like the farmer's conviction that they were doing a man's job it made them contemptuous of white-collar workers i spent quite as much time looking at homes as at plants the test i made of the industrial villages and of company houses was whether or no if i set myself to it i could make a decent home in them i found even in the most barren and unattractive company districts women who had made attractive homes there was the greatest difference in homemaking ability in the training of women for it the pride of the man who had a good housekeeper as a wife a good cook was great i do not remember that a man ever asked me to come to his house unless he considered his wife a good housekeeper i remember one so proud of his home that he took me all over it showing with delight how his sunday clothes his winter overcoat the sunday dress of his little girl were hung on hangers with a calico curtain in front to keep them clean his housekeeper in this case a mother-in-law confided to me in talking things over that night that in her judgment the reason so many men drank was that the women did not know how to keep house visiting with the family after the supper dishes were cleared away i managed to get at what was most important in their lives after steady work it was the church after minister or priest the public school teacher was the most trusted friend of the household in many places however i found her authority beginning to be divided with the company nurse for the company nurse was just being added to industrial staffs many of my reforming friends felt that in going to a factory and taking a salary a nurse was aligning herself with the evil intentions of the corporation but the average man did not feel that way she helped him out in too many tight places as to the relation of workmen to their union for often they belong to a union i concluded that in the average industrial community it was not unlike that of the average citizen to his political party and political boss both the union and the employer seemed to me to be missing opportunities to help men to understand the structure of the industry perhaps because they did not themselves understand it too well or sank their understanding in politics both union and employer depended upon one or another form of force when there was unrest rather than education and arbitration in doing this they weakened perhaps in the end destroyed that by which they all lived the most distressing thing in mills and factories seemed to me to be the atmosphere of suspicion which had accumulated from years of appeal to force i felt it as soon as i went into certain plants everybody watching me the guide the boss the men at the machines but to conclude that because of this suspicion this lack of understanding which keeps so many industries always on the verge of destruction there was no natural friendly contacts between the management and the men is not to know the world i found that practically always the foreman or the boss sometimes the big boss in an industry had come up from the ranks in various industrial towns i found the foreman's family or the superintendent's family living just around the corner and his brother perhaps his father working in the mine or the mill he was one in the family who had been able to lift himself nor did it follow that there was bad blood between a big boss and the head of a warlike union i had been led to believe they did not speak in passing i had supposed that if samuel gompers and judge gary met they would probably fly at each other's throat but at the washington industrial conference in nineteen nineteen standing in a corridor of the pan american building i saw the two approaching from different directions they were going to pass close to me i had a cold chill about what might happen but what happened was that mr gompers said hello judge in the friendliest tone and judge gary called cheerfully hello sam and that was all there was to it 
later when i was to see much of judge gary trying to make out what the famous gary code meant and how it was being applied we talked more than once of samuel gompers and his technique the judge had great respect for him as a political opponent as well he might it is hard to stop talking when i recall these four years drifting up and down the country into factories and homes the contrast between old ways and new ways was always before me many a sad thing i saw nothing more disturbing than the strikes for i managed to get on the outskirts of several and follow up the aftermath which was usually tragic there was the ghastly strike in certain fertilizer plants at roosevelt on the jersey coast i followed it through to its unsatisfactory end rival labor and political bodies fought each other for days while the men with drawn and hopeless faces loafed in groups in saloons or on doorsteps all going to the devil while their unions fight said the woman who gave me my meals in the only boarding-house in the desolate place i am for the union but the union does not know when they go into a strike which they can avoid what they are doing to the men it turns them into tramps they leave their families and take to the road it is better that they leave i think the women often think that so they won't have any more babies no the union does not see what it does to men but what are the men going to do when things were like what they were in this place you know what their wages were you know what a hellish sort of place this is what are they going to do it was the men who saw industry as a cooperative undertaking who gave me heart i do not mean political cooperation but practical cooperation worked out on the ground by the persons concerned the problems and needs of no two industrial undertakings are ever alike for results each must be treated according to the situation the greatest contributions i found to industrial peace and stability came when a man recognized that a condition was wrong and set out to correct it there was thomas lynch president of the frick coke company of westmoreland county pennsylvania tommy lynch had swung a pick before john lewis did and like lewis had risen by virtue of hard work and real ability from one position to another one to become the head of a group of mines the other to become the head of a group of miners but no union could keep up with tommy lynch in the improvements he demanded for his mines and miners it was he who originated the famous slogan safety first when i talked with him about rescue crews he swore heartily damn rescue work prevent accidents tommy lynch's work did not end in the mine he had a theory that you could not be a good worker unless you had a good home he literally lifted some seven thousand company houses which he had inherited from an old management out of their locations between high mountains of lifeless slag and put them onto tillable land gave every woman water in her kitchen and a plot of land for a garden in nineteen fourteen when i was first there out of seven thousand homes six thousand nine hundred twenty three had gardens and such gardens it took three days for mr lynch and two or three other distinguished gentlemen to decide on the winners of the nine prizes given for the finest displays they were estimating that the vegetable gardens yielded one hundred forty three thousand dollars worth of vegetables that year i went back to see what they were doing with those gardens in the middle of the late depression there were even more of them and they were even more productive knowing what the garden meant the miners had turned to the cultivation with immense energy the company had ploughed and fertilized tracts of untilled land near each settlement and the men were raising extra food for the winter many of these miners were selling vegetables in the nearby town markets believing as i do that the connection of men and women with the soil is not only most healthy for the body but essential for the mind and the soul these gardens aroused almost as much thankfulness in my heart as the safety work but tommy lynch could not have worked out his notions of safety and gardening without the cooperation of the miners even if it was sometimes begrudging 
then there was henry ford attacking the problem which most concerned his plant labor turnover in his case something like twelve hundred per cent he had come into the industrial picture with his minimum wage of five dollars a day just before i began my work in may of nineteen fifteen i set up shop for ten days in a detroit hotel in order to study what he was doing the days i spent in and around the ford factory nights tired out with observations and emotions i came back to a hot bath and dinner in bed talking my findings into a dictaphone until i fell off to sleep connections had not been hard to make there was then at the head of ford publicity an experienced and able gentleman who realized that articles in the american magazine on the ford plant whether favorable or not were good for the concern and who saw to it that i had every chance mr ford himself was my first important objective he saw me in his big office looking down on the plant a plant then employing eighteen thousand men at the first glimpse of his smiling face i was startled by the resemblance to the picture of the young lincoln which had played such a part in the launching of the lincoln articles in mcclure's it was the face of a poet and a philosopher as in the young lincoln there was a young emerson like a poet and a philosopher henry ford was unhurried he was no slave to his desk i saw it practically abandoned when he was wrestling with the successor to model t mr ford does not often come in my conductor told me he is wandering through the factories these days we never touch his desk he was boyish and natural in off hours coming into the private lunch-room for officers at the plant where i judged a place was always left for him i saw him throw his long right leg over the back of the chair before he slid leisurely into the seat i have got an idea he said people complain about the doors of the car not convenient i am going to put a can opener into every car from now on and let them cut their own he delighted in the flow of ford jokes wanted to hear the latest to see it in the house organ when he saw me it was he who did the talking and he seemed to be straightening out his thoughts rather than replying to my questions when i asked him for his reasons for mass production he had a straightaway answer it is to give people everything they want and then some he said and then he went on to enlarge in a way i have never forgotten there's no reason why everybody shouldn't have everything he needs if we managed it right weren't afraid of making too much our business is to make things so cheap that everybody can buy em take these shears he picked up a handsome pair of large shears on his desk they sell for three or four dollars i guess no reason you couldn't get them down to fifty cents yes fifty cents he repeated as i gasped no reason at all best in the world so every little girl in the world could have a pair there's more money in giving everybody things than in keeping them dear so only a few can have them i want our car so cheap that every workman in our shop can have one if he wants it make things everybody can have that's what we want to do and give em money enough the trouble's been we didn't pay men enough high wages pay people do more work we never thought we'd get back our five dollars a day didn't think of it just thought that something was wrong that so many people were out of work and hadn't anything saved up and thought we ought to divide but we got it all back right away that means we can make the car cheaper and give more men work of course when you're building and trying new things all the time you've got to have money but you get it if you make men i don't know that our scheme is best it will take five years to try it out but we are doing the best we can and changing when we strike a snag what it simmered down to was that if you wanted to make a business you must make men and you must make men by seeing they had a chance for what we are pleased to call these days a good life and if they are going to have a good life they must not only have money but have low prices there was much more i soon found than five dollars a day and upwards that was behind the making of men at ford's 
there was the most scientific system for handling mass production processes that i had ever seen tasks were graded a workman was given every incentive to get into higher classes but i was not long at ford's before i discovered that it was not this system already established it was not the five dollars it was not the flourishing business it was not advertising deeply and efficiently and aggressively as all these things were handled which at the moment was absorbing the leaders of the business it was what mr ford was calling the making of men it was a thoroughly worthwhile and deeply human method mr ford knew that do all you can for a man in the factory a short day higher wages good conditions training advancement if things are not right for him at home he will not in the long run be a good workman so he set out to reorganize the home life of the men it was done by a sociological department made up at that time of some eighty men all taken out of the factory itself for mr ford's theory was then that no matter what you wanted done you could always find somebody among the eighteen thousand down there as he called it that was qualified so they had selected eighty for social service work and these men were doing it with a thoroughness and a frankness which was almost as important as the five dollars a day had been paternal was the adjective generally applied to the ford method but one of the interesting things about mr ford is the little effect a word has on him call a thing what you like it is the idea the method that he is after if that seems to him to make sense you may have your word it doesn't trouble him so they went energetically about their determination to add to what they were doing for the making of men inside of the factory a thorough overhauling of the men's lives outside there were certain things that were laid down as essential you had to be clean cleanliness had played no part in the lives of hundreds of these men but when they did not get their big envelope and asked why they were told it was because their hands were dirty they didn't wash their necks they didn't wear clean clothes ford's men must be clean already it had made an astonishing difference in the general look of the factory and this cleanliness was carried by the sociological department into the home the men must be kept clean and the women must do their part many of the women as well as the men were discovering for the first time the satisfaction of cleanliness feels good said a working woman to me reluctant but thorough convert according to my conductor feels good to be clean they were enemies of liquor and no man who drank could keep his place but he was not thrown out he must reform and some of the most surprising cures of habitual drunkenness that i have ever come across i found in the ford factory in nineteen fifteen there was a strong sympathy throughout the factory for derelicts there were four hundred men in fords when i was there who had served prison terms nobody knew them but each had his special guardian and no mother ever looked after a child more carefully than these guardians looked after their charges in this social work mr ford was constantly and deeply interested as nearly as i could make out there was nothing of which they all talked more i dined one night with four or five of the officers including mr ford and while i had expected to hear much about mass production and wage problems the only thing i heard was how are you getting along with mary how about john do you think we can make this housing scheme work that is what i was discovering at ford's was that they were not thinking in terms of labor and capital but in terms of tom dick and harry they were talking men and women individuals families and with patience and sense and humor and determination were putting them on their feet giving them interest and direction in managing their lives this was the henry ford of nineteen sixteen but work like that of tommy lynch and henry ford depended upon individual qualities of a rare and exceptional kind also upon the opportunity to test ideas neither lynch nor ford was willing to let bad situations a stiff problem alone it challenged their wits particularly when it concerned men in mine and factory they were not hampered by dogmas or politics they did things in their own way 
and if one method did not work tried another and both had a rare power to persuade men to follow them they were self-made unhampered products of old-fashioned democracy and both were thorns in the flesh of those who worked according to blueprints mechanized organizations or the status quo but the success of both with the particular labor problems they tackled was the answer to critics only how could men of lesser personality lesser freedom of action and lesser boldness in trying out things follow they could not they had to have a more scientific practice if they were to achieve genuine cooperation in working out their problems and what i was seeing in certain plants as i went up and down the country convinced me it had come in the frederick taylor science of management i had first heard of taylor in the american magazine office john phillips had sent something important on foot when he read that louis brandeis acting as counsel for certain shippers in a suit they had brought against the railroads had told the defendants that they could afford lower rates if they would reorganize their business on the lines of scientific management which frederick taylor had developed they could lower rates and raise wages and who is frederick taylor asked mr phillips baker you better find out and so frederick taylor had come to know the american group and he had given to the american much to our pride his first popular article explaining what he meant by scientific management in the following letter mr taylor tells a protesting friend why he gave it to us i have no doubt that the atlantic monthly would give us a better audience from a literary point of view than we could get from the american magazine but the readers of the atlantic monthly consist probably very largely of professors and literary men who would be interested more in the abstract theory than in the actual good which would come from the introduction of scientific management on the other hand i feel that the readers of the american magazine consist largely of those who are actually doing the practical work of the world the people whom i want to reach with the article are principally those men who are doing the manufacturing and construction work of our country both employers and employees and i have an idea that many more persons of that kind would be reached through the american magazine than through the atlantic monthly in considering the best magazine to publish the paper in i am very considerably influenced by the opinion i have formed of the editors who have been here to talk over the subject and of these ray stannard baker was by far the most thorough and enthusiastic in his analysis of the whole subject he looked at all sides in a way which no other editor dreamed of doing he even got next to the working men and talked to them at great length on the subject i cannot but feel also that the audience which reads the work of men of his type must be an intelligent and earnest audience mr blank who has just been here suggested that among a certain class of people the american magazine is looked upon as a muckraking magazine i think that any magazine which opposed the stan patters and was not under the control of the moneyed powers of the united states would now be classed among the muckrakers this therefore has no very great weight with me taylor believed like henry ford that the world could take all we could make that the power of consumption was limitless to give the world all it needs is the mission of industry he shouted at me one day i spent with him at boxley his home near philadelphia shouted it with many picturesque oaths i have never known a man who could swear so beautifully and so unconsciously mr taylor's system in part or whole had been applied in many factories which i visited in my four years you knew its outward sign as soon as you entered the yard order routing were first laws and the old cluttered shops where you fell over scattered material and picked your way around dump heaps were now models of classified order a man knew where to find the things he needed and things were placed where it took the fewest steps to reach them quite as conspicuous as the physical changes in the shop was the change in what might be called its human atmosphere under the taylor system the business of management was not only planning but controlling what it planned management laid out ahead the day's work for each man at his machine 
to him they went with their instructions to them he went for explanations and suggestions office and shop intermingled they realized their mutual dependence as never before learned to respect each other for what they were worth watching the functioning one realized men had come to feel more or less as taylor himself felt that nothing of moment was ever accomplished save by cooperation which must be intimate and friendly praised once for his work on the art of cutting metal he said a thing all leaders would do well to heed i feel strongly that work of any account in order to be done rightly should be done through true cooperation rather than through the individual effort of any one man and in fact i should feel rather ashamed of any achievement in which i attempted to do the whole thing myself nothing was more exciting to me than the principles by which taylor had developed his science they were the principles he had applied to revolutionary discoveries and inventions in engineering i made a brief table of them they make the best code i know for progress in human undertakings one find out what others have done before you and begin where they left off two question everything prove everything three tackle only one variable at a time shun the temptation to try more than one in order to get quick results four hold surrounding conditions as constant and uniform as possible while experimenting with your variable five work with all men against no one make them want to go along there is enduring vitality in these principles and there is universality they are as good for battered commonwealths as for backward disorganized industries think what it would mean in washington today if all the experimenters began where others had left off if no demonstrated failure was repeated if theory was held to be but twenty five per cent of an achievement practice seventy five if one variable at a time was experimented with if time were taken for solutions and above all if everybody concerned accepted intimate and friendly cooperation as the most essential of all factors in our restoration this hunt for practical application of the golden rule in industry left me in much better spirits than my studies of transportation and tariff privileges the longer i looked into the latter the deeper had been my conviction that in the long run they would ruin the hope of peaceful unity of life in america they seemed to me inconsistent with democracy as i understood it and certainly inconsistent with my simple notions of what made men and women of character were we not getting a larger and larger class interested only in what money could buy particularly did i dislike the spreading belief that wealth piled up by a combination of ability illegality and bludgeoning could be so used as to justify itself that the good to be done would cancel the evil done what it amounted to was the promotion of humanitarianism at the expense of christian ethics and that i believe made for moral softness instead of stoutness but there was nothing soft about the experiments i had been following where they succeeded it was by following unconsciously in general taylor's stiff principles patient training stern discipline active cooperation alone produced safety health efficient workmen abundance of cheap honest output i had faith in these things they were the foundation of genuine social service all desired goods followed them as they became part of the nation's habit of life reaching down to its lowest depths many of my reforming friends were shocked because the one and only reason most industrial leaders gave for their experiments was that it paid generally speaking the leaders were the kind who would have cut their tongues out before acknowledging that any other motive than profit influenced them certainly they sought dividends but they believed stability order peace progress cooperation were back of dividends that industry which paid must as mr ford said make men that the right thing paid was one of their most far-reaching demonstrations men had not believed it they were proving the contrary 
so in spite of the charge of many of my friends that i was going over to the enemy joining the corporation lawyer and the company nurse i clung to the new ideals what i never could make some of these friends see was that i had no quarrel with corporate business so long as it played fair it was the unfairness i feared and despised i had no quarrel with men of wealth if they could show performance back of it untainted by privilege sometimes i suspected that the gains i set forth as practical results of this experimenting inside the industry were resented by those who had been working for them for years through legislation organization agitation because they had come about by other methods than theirs and generally in a more complete form than they had ventured to demand but that the idealists had been a driving force behind the new movement inside industry was certain their method could not do the thing but it could and did drive men to prove it could be done my critics who charged me with giving comfort to the enemy did not see that often this enemy disliked what i was trying to do even more deeply than my so-called muckraking indeed he took pictures of new industrial methods and principles as a kind of backhanded muckraking indirect and so unfair it threw all established methods of force into a relief as damaging as anything i ever had said about high duties and manipulations of railroad rates whatever challenges my new interest aroused however confused my own defense of it was i knew only that i should keep my eye on it and report any development which seemed to me a step ahead that of course was counting on continued editorial sympathy in the american but hardly had i finished my book before that sympathy was cut off by a change in ownership the change was inevitable things being as they were in the magazine world after nineteen fourteen the crew who had manned our little ship so gallantly in nineteen o six when we left mcclure's had lost only one of its numbers a few months after we started lincoln steffens withdrew he objected to the editing of his articles demanded that they go in as he wrote them the same editorial principles were being applied to his productions that were applied to those of other contributors they were the principles which he himself had been accustomed to applying and to submitting to on mcclure's the editorial board decided the policy could not be changed and accepted stephen's resignation back of his withdrawal as i saw it was stephen's growing dissatisfaction with the restrictions of journalism he wanted a wider field one in which he could more directly influence political and social leaders preach more directly his notions of the golden rule which certainly at that time was his chosen guide certainly it was the creed of the american it had always been john phillips answer to our fervent efforts to change things the only way to improve the world is to persuade it to follow the golden rule i suppose stephens had heard of the golden rule but i am certain he had never thought about it as a practical scheme for improving society it seemed to me at the time that it came to him as an illumination and for some years he held tight to it preaching it to political bosses to the tycoons of wall street the brahmins of boston confronting them with amazing frankness and no little satisfaction with their open disregard of its meanings he became greatly disillusioned finally by discovering that men were quite willing to let their opponents act upon the golden rule but much less so to be governed by it themselves my first realization that stephens was struggling with the problem which confronted us all that is whether we should stick to our profession or become propagandists was one day when i looked up suddenly to find him standing by my desk more sober less certain of himself than i had ever seen him charles edward russell has gone over to the socialist party he said is that not what we should all be doing should we not make the american magazine a socialist organ i flared our only hope for usefulness was in keeping our freedom avoiding dogma i argued and that the american continued to do in the years that were to come wars and revolutions largely occupied stephens wherever there was a revolution you found him he wrote many brilliant comments on what was going on in the world 
when he came back from russia after the kerensky revolution he was like a man who had seen a long hoped-for vision i have looked at the millennium and it works he told me it was to be the practical application of that golden rule he had so long preached but to my mind the russian revolution had only just begun the event in which he saw the coming of the lord i looked on as only the first of probably many convulsions forced by successive generations of unsatisfied radicals irreconcilable counter-revolutionists when i voiced these pessimistic notions to stephens he called me heartless and blind but there were other forces working against the type of journalism in which we believed we were classed as muckrakers and the school had been so commercialized that the public was beginning to suspect it the public is not as stupid as it sometimes seems the truth of the matter was that the muckraking school was stupid it had lost the passion for facts and a passion for subscriptions the coming of the war in nineteen fourteen forced a new problem it became a grave question whether under the changed conditions the increased confusion of mind the intellectual and financial uncertainties an independent magazine backed with little money could live in undertaking the american we had all of us put in all the money we could lay our hands on we had cut the salaries of mcclure's in two reduced our scale of living accordingly and done it gaily as an adventure and it had been a fine fruitful adventure in professional comradeship we had made a good magazine and we were all for making a better one and convinced we could do it i don't think ray baker wrote me not long ago that i look back to any period of my life with greater interest than i do to that the eager enthusiasm the earnestness and the gaiety but we had come to a time when under the new conditions the magazine required fresh money and we had no more to put in the upshot was that in nineteen fifteen the american was sold to the crowell publishing company the new owners wanted a different type of magazine and john siddle who had been steadily with us since i had unearthed him in cleveland as a help in investigating the standard oil company was made active editor siddle was admirably cut out to make the type of periodical the new controlling interests wanted i have never known any one in or out of the profession with his omnivorous curiosity about human beings and their ways he had enormous admiration for achievement of any sort the thing done whatever its nature or trend his interest in humankind was not diluted by any desire to save the world it included all men he had a shrewd conviction that putting things down as they are did more to save the world than any crusade his instincts were entirely healthy and decent the magazine was bound to be what we call wholesome very quickly he put his impress on the new journal made it a fine commercial success gradually the old staff disintegrated peter dunn went over to the editorial page of collier's bert boyden went to france with the y m c a mr phillips remained as a director and a consultant siddle would hear of nothing else he is the greatest teacher i have ever known i could learn from him if i were making shoes he declared and years later when facing his tragic death he was preparing a new man to take his place he told him solemnly never fail to spend an hour a day with j s p just talking things over as for me it was soon obvious there was no place for my type of work on the new american if i were to be free i must again give up security hardly however had i acted on my resolution before along came mr lewis alber of the coit alber lecture bureau one of the best-known concerns at that time in the business mr alber had frequently invited me to join his troupe and always i had laughed at the invitation i was too busy moreover i had no experience did not know how to lecture now however it was a different matter i was free and i might forget the situation in which i found myself by undertaking a new type of work was not lecturing a natural adjunct to my profession 
moreover mr albert wanted me to speak on these new ideals in business which i had been discussing in the magazine and he wanted me to speak on what was known as a chautauqua circuit a kind of peripatetic chautauqua perhaps my willingness to go had an element of curiosity in it a desire to find out what this husky child of my old friend chautauqua was like at all events i signed up for a seven week circuit forty-nine days in forty-nine different places end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A New Profession. It was not until my signed contract to speak for forty nine consecutive days in forty nine different places was laid before me that I realized I had agreed to do what I did not know how to do. I had never in my life stood on my feet and made a professional speech. To begin with, could i make people hear i felt convinced that i had something to say and so did my sponsors but to what good if i could not be heard what was this thing they called placing the voice i went to my friend franklin sargent of the american academy of dramatic arts told him of my predicament after a first test he agreed with me that i did not know how to use my voice and that unless i could learn i was letting myself in for a bad failure mr sargent was good enough to take me on as a pupil uninteresting a one as i must have been he began by putting me on the simplest exercises but with severe instructions about keeping them up i went about my apartment day and night shouting ma me mi mo ba be bi bo i learned that the voice must come from the diaphragm and that the diaphragm must be strong to throw it out for an hour at a time regularly every morning and every night lying on my back with books on my stomach i breathed deeply until i could lift four or five volumes by the time the circuit opened in july i knew theoretically how to use my voice but i soon found that to do it without now and then getting it into my throat making horrible noises and throwing myself into nervous panics i must be more conscious of it than was good for my method of handling my material indeed it was not until my second year of speaking that i could count on my voice for the hour of the performance i never came to a point where i did not have to ask that a glass of water be put within reach just in case i found a glass of water a safety device if my attention was distracted for a moment and i lost my line of argument i could pick it up pretend to drink change my position regain poise so much for my voice i knew how to make people hear what i was saying now as to material i was to talk on the same subject day after day that is i was supposed to make daily the same speech i was afraid of a memorized speech a lecture experience of my old friend george kennan was largely responsible for that after he had published his classic work on siberia mr kennan took his story to the lecture platform he wrote his lecture with characteristic care memorized it and repeated it night after night on the long tours he made it was an admirable lecture one of the most moving i ever heard in telling me of his platform experiences mr kennan dropped this warning in giving a memorized lecture one must be very careful that no two sentences end with the same word in my lecture on siberia i unwittingly used five or six identical words to end different sentences one near the opening the other near the closing of my talk one night when perhaps i was unusually tired instead of picking up what followed the first sentence i picked up the words that followed the second that is i was ending my lecture when i had only just begun it i saved myself but after that i always took care that there were no two sentences in my talk with identical even similar endings my memory is a tricky and unreliable organ never properly trained never held resolutely to its job i should have been afraid to trust it on a lecture platform 
moreover i realized that since i was no orator and never should be my only hope was to give the appearance of talking naturally spontaneously i put together what seemed to me a logical framework and decided to drape it afresh every day never to begin with the same words to use fresh illustrations to think aloud experimenting i soon discovered a fresh beginning every day was too much to ask of myself under the conditions of travel i found it foolish too for if i had struck an opening that arrested attention why change it for one that might not i soon found that illustrations which were all right in an article did not serve with an audience the line of argument which i would have followed in an article became more effective on a platform if switched that is as it turned out although i was giving the same lecture every day it was never quite the same i worked on it constantly and that is what kept my interest i think because always i found however tired i might be however much i despised myself for undertaking to do what i more and more realized i did not know how to do i always was interested in my subject talking as if it was something of which i had never talked before it was that personal interest in my material which carried me through i had not given a thought in advance to the physical aspect of my undertaking i had known that every day for forty-nine days i was to speak in a different place i knew that meant daily travelling but that had not disturbed me i had always prided myself that i was superior to physical surroundings i had not been long on the chautauqua circuit before i was realizing that they played an enormous part in my day i found i was inquiring about the town to which we were headed how about the hotel are there bathrooms if so am i to get one i was uneasy about the table the ideas of cooking and serving and at night about the noises the draughts and other unmentionable worries to my amazement the bed in which i was to sleep soon was taking an altogether disproportionate place in my mind it is a fact that when the circuit was over and i came to tell its story i could draw a diagram of any one of the rooms in which i had slept giving the exact location of the bed in relation to windows and doors and bathroom i remembered these beds when i did not remember the hotel to my surprise i found myself deeply interested in the physical life of the circuit so like the life of the circus we performed in tents and our outfit was as gay as ever you saw khaki tents bound in red with a great khaki fence about pennants floating up and down the streets and within order cleanliness and the smartest kind of little platform and side dressing rooms naturally i had no little curiosity about my travelling companions scoffing eastern friends told me that there would be bell-ringers trained dogs and tyrolese yodlers i found no such entertainment but i could hardly have fallen in with pleasanter company a quintet of young people whose business it was to sing for three-quarters of an hour before my afternoon lecture and for a like period before the evening entertainment proved to be the gayest kindest healthiest of companions they were hard workers seriously interested in pleasing their audiences they knew not only how to work but how to live on the kind of junket that i had undertaken in other words here was a group of five young people who were doing what to me was very unusual in a thoroughly professional way the seventh member of our party the evening entertainer sidney landon had had long experience on the circuit he was doing his work exactly as a good writer or a good lawyer would do his i saw at once that what i had joined was not as i had hastily imagined a haphazard semi-business semi-philanthropic happy-go-lucky new kind of barnstorming it was serious work in starting the chautauqua work i was not conscious that there was a large percentage of condescension in my attitude my first audience revealed my mind to me with painful definiteness and humbled me beyond expression it was all so unlike anything that i had had in my mind i was to speak in the evening and arrived at my destination late and after a rather hard day it was a steel town 
one which i had known long years before the picturesqueness of the thing struck me with amazement planted on an open space in the straggling dimly lighted streets where the heavy panting of the blast furnaces could be clearly heard i saw the tent ablaze with electric lights for if you please we carried our own electric equipment from all directions men women and children were flocking white shirtwaists in profusion few coats and still fewer hats and there were so many of them i felt a queer sensation of alarm here in the high banked tiers were scores upon scores of serious faces of hard-working men i had come to talk about the hopeful and optimistic things that i had seen in the industrial life of the country but face to face with these men within sound of the heavy panting of great furnaces within sight of the unpainted undrained rows of company houses which i had noticed as i came in on the train the memory of many a long and bitter labor struggle that i had known of in that valley came to life and all my pretty tales seemed now terribly flimsy they were so serious and they listened so intently to get something and the tragedy was that i had not more to give them this was my first audience I never had another that made so deep an impression upon me. I had not been long on the circuit before I realized that my audience had only a languid interest in my subject, that what they were really interested in, wanted to hear and talk about, was the war, then ending its second year. But I could not talk about the war. Nothing had ever so engulfed me as in a black fog, closed my mouth, confused my mind chiefly this was because of the apparent collapse of organized efforts to persuade or to force peaceful settlements of international quarrels these had taken so large a place in the thinking and agitating of the liberal-minded with whom i lived that i had begun to delude myself that they were actually strong enough to prevent future wars largely these efforts were the result of the revulsion the conflicts of the nineties had caused the Boer War, the Greco-Turkish War, the Spanish War. People who wanted to live in peace wrote books, talked, organized societies, national and international. Jane Addams stirred the English-speaking world by her newer ideals of peace. William H. Taft, Elihu Root, leading public men, educators combined in one or another society advocating this or that form of machinery and while this was going on theodore roosevelt was doing his best to counteract it by his bold talk of war as a maker of men the only adequate machine for preparing human beings for the beneficent strenuous life he advocated what was the american magazine to do about it it seemed to us that we ought to find some answer to theodore roosevelt certainly we could not do it by promoting organized efforts certainly not by preaching we must prove him wrong in nineteen ten our attention was turned to what seemed a possibly useful educational effort against war inaugurated at stanford university by its president david starr jordan i knew dr jordan slightly his argument for opening the channels of world trade in the interest of peace had helped keep my spirits when laboring against the tariff lobbies that so effectively closed them what were they doing in stanford it was decided that i go out and see at least there might be material for an article or two early in nineteen eleven dr jordan arranged that i spend a few weeks at the university he was very cordial meeting me at los angeles where i arrived low in mind and body from an attack of influenza there was to be a peace meeting that night dr jordan was to speak they had announced me and when i refused to get out of my bed they took it as proof of indifference to the cause the truth was that the idea of speaking extemporaneously was at that time terrifying to me ill too i could not or perhaps would not rally my forces i would rather be regarded as a sneak than attempt it but dr jordan understood and laughed off my apology and together we made a leisurely trip to palo alto 
he was a delightful companion when he felt like talking as he often did there was nothing which did not interest him looking out of the car window he talked not of peace at all but of birds and trees and fishes and roosevelt and the recent earthquake at palo alto i found the most exciting course then offered to the students was the six weeks on war and peace which i had come to study the big assembly room was packed for all the public lectures among the advanced students following the course were several who have since made names for themselves bruce blyven robert l duffus maxwell anderson there was considerable intensive work on special themes one student was collecting war slogans another making a comparison of declarations of war each of which called god to witness that its cause was just another student was compiling tables showing yearly increase in the costs of armament in the twenty years from eighteen ninety on another the economic losses through the devastations caused by war and so on all interesting and useful material but study the work as closely as i could i could not for the life of me lay my hands on that definite something which the american needed finally i took my discouragement to dr jordan and together we planned collaboration on a series of articles to be called the case against war dr jordan in his autobiography the days of a man tells of our scheme and what became of it crowding events permitted war to frame its own case in august nineteen fourteen all of the machinery on which peace lovers had counted collapsed the socialists in a body in every country took up arms so did organized labor so did the professional advocates of peace it was not only this collapse of effort that had stunned me from the hour war was declared i had a sense of doom quite inexplicable in so matter-of-fact a person we should go in of that i felt certain after we did go in john siddle more than once recalled how in the august of nineteen fourteen when a party of us were dining at the then popular hungarian restaurant on houston street i had said that before the thing was ended the united states the world would be in you are a prophet siddle would laugh but i was not a prophet it was the logic of my conviction that the world is one that isolation of nations is as fantastic as isolation of the earth from the solar system the solar system from the universe all this made a species of fabian pacifist of me i was for anything that looked to peace to neutrality but it was always with the hopeless feeling that one simply must do what one can if the house is on fire i could not share the hate of germany in spite of my profound devotion to france my conviction that germany had believed a war of conquest essential to realize what she called her destiny that she had been consciously preparing for it that she thought the day had come when she could venture it the awful thing seemed too big for hate by puny humans and i was amazed and no little shocked soon after the outbreak when visiting my friend john burroughs at squirrel lodge in the catskills i found him whom i had always regarded as an apostle of peace and light in a continuous angry fever against all things german woodchucks were troubling his corn and every morning he went out with his gun another damned hun he would cry savagely when he returned with his dead game time did not cure john burroughs wrath for in december nineteen seventeen he pledged himself in an open letter published in the new york tribune never to read a german book never to buy an article of german make but john burroughs was not the only one of my supposedly gentle-souled friends who felt this serious necessity to punish not only now but forever i was too befogged to hate or to take part in the organizations looking to ending the war which sprang up all about and which i felt so despairingly were all futile there was mr ford's peace ship mr ford had startled me one day in the spring of nineteen fifteen when in detroit i was observing his methods for making men by saying suddenly you know i am rather coming to the conclusion that we ought to join the allies if we go in we can finish the thing quickly 
and that is what should be done as it is now they will fight to a finish it ought some way to be stopped and i see no other way six months later mr ford called me up at my home in new york and asked if i would not come to his hotel he and miss adams wanted to talk with me of course i went at once it is curious how sometimes when one steps inside a door without knowing what is behind it one senses caution the door was open to mr ford's suite nobody in sight no answer to my ring but i could hear voices and followed them to a room at the end of the hall mr ford was standing in the corner facing me before him were two rows of men reporters i knew here boys is miss tarbell she will go with us he called go where mr ford i asked oh he said we are chartering a peace ship we are going to europe and get the boys out of the trenches by christmas i had a terrible sinking of heart oh mr ford i don't think i could go on such an expedition come with me and we will convince you and he led me into a room where madame rosica schwimmer and my old friend fred howe were talking jane adams was not there tell miss tarbell what we are going to do we want her to go along and he went back to the reporters i put in one of the most difficult hours of my life madame schwimmer argued ably so did mr howe and all i could say was feeling like a poor worm as i said it i can't see it when mr ford came back and they told him she can't see it i tried to explain my doubts he listened intently and then very gently said don't bother her she'll come on top of this interview came a long telegram followed by a longer letter both signed by henry ford i doubt now if he ever saw either of them certainly the signature at the foot of the letter is not his i am putting them in here long as they are because they are important in the history of the peace ship and so far as i know have never been printed here they are november twenty fourth nineteen fifteen will you come as my guest aboard the oscar second of the scandinavian american line sailing from new york december fourth for christiania stockholm and copenhagen i am cabling leading men and women of the european nations to join us en route and at some central point to be determined later establish an international conference dedicated to negotiations leading to a just settlement of the war a hundred representative americans are being invited among whom jane adams thomas a edison and john wanamaker have accepted to-day full letter follows with twenty thousand men killed every twenty-four hours tens of thousands maimed homes ruined another winter begun the time has come for a few men and women with courage and energy irrespective of the cost in personal inconvenience money sacrifice and criticism to free the good will of europe that it may assert itself for peace and justice with the strong probability that international disarmament can be accomplished please wire reply november twenty seventh nineteen fifteen dear miss tarbell from the moment i realize that the world situation demands immediate action if we do not want the war fire to spread any further i join these international forces which are working toward ending this unparalleled catastrophe this i realize is my human duty there is full evidence that the carnage which already has cost ten millions of lives can and is expected to be stopped through the agency of a mediating conference of the six disinterested european nations holland denmark sweden norway switzerland spain and the united states envoys to thirteen belligerent and neutral european governments have ascertained in forty visits that there is a universal peace desire this peace desire for the sake of diplomatic etiquette never can be expressed openly or publicly until one side or the other is definitely defeated or until both sides are entirely exhausted for fifteen months the people of the world have waited for the governments to act have waited for governments to lead europe out of its unspeakable agony and suffering and to prevent europe's entire destruction 
as european neutral governments are unable to act without the cooperation of our government and as our government for unknown reasons has not offered this cooperation no further time can be wasted in waiting for governmental action in order that their sacrifice may not have been in vain humanity owes it to the millions of men led like cattle to the slaughter-house that a supreme effort be made to stop this wicked waste of life the people of the belligerent countries did not want the war the people did not make it the people want peace it is their human right to get a chance to make it the world looks to us to america to lead in ideals the greatest mission ever before a nation is ours that is why i appeal to you as a representative of american democracy in my telegram of the twenty fourth it is for the same reason that i repeat my appeal to you and urge you to join a peace pilgrimage men and women of our country representing all of its ideals and all of its activities will start from new york on the fourth of december aboard the scandinavian american steamship oscar the second the peace ship that carries the american delegation will proceed to christiania where norway's valiant sons and daughters will join the crusade in stockholm the ship's company will be reinforced by the choicest of sweden's democracy the crusade will then go on to copenhagen where further harbingers of peace will be foregathered these various groups will add such momentum to the crusade that when the pilgrims reach the hague with its achievements of international justice and comity the moral power of the peace movement will be irresistible in the hague we hope to meet delegations from switzerland and from spain from all these various delegations will be selected a small deliberative body which shall sit in one of the neutral capitals here it will be joined by a limited number of authorities of international promise from each belligerent country this international conference will frame terms of peace based on justice for all regardless of the military situation this international conference will be an agency for continuous mediation it will be dedicated to the stoppage of this hideous international carnage and further dedicated to the prevention of future wars through the abolition of competitive armaments in case of a governmental call for an official neutral conference before the peace ship departs from new york or even reaches european shores our party will continue on its mission rejoicing that the official gathering has materialized we will then place our united strength solidly behind those entrusted by the governments to carry on the peace negotiations in the hague the members of the peace pilgrimage will dissolve accommodations will be provided for each one back to his home it is impossible to determine the exact length of time the pilgrimage will take six weeks however should be allowed i respectfully beg of you to respond to the call of humanity and join the consecrated spirits who have already signified a desire to help make history in a new way the people of europe cry out to you information about the meeting place in new york the hour of sailing the amount of luggage your accommodations etc will be sent as soon as we have your reply i should appreciate it if you would telegraph your affirmative decision will you send it to the hotel biltmore suite seven seventeen new york our temporary headquarters yours for peace henry ford i have no copies of my replies but i know the gist of them must have been a heavy-hearted i can't do it mr ford the night after my visit to the hotel miss adams called me up and for a half hour we argued the matter on the telephone all i could say was if you see it you must go miss adams i don't see it and i can't it is possible that standing on the street corner and crying peace peace may do good i do not say that it will not but i cannot see it for myself we were to talk it over in the morning but that night they took her to chicago hurried her into a hospital she was very ill jane adams did not go on the peace ship years after i asked her would you have gone if you had not been ill i certainly should she said there was a chance and i was for taking every chance 
she always took every chance when it was a matter of human relief and if she had gone things would have been different on the peace ship for she and not madame schwimmer would have been in command she saw quite clearly the managerial tendencies of madame schwimmer but she also saw her abilities she was not willing because of doubts to throw over a chance to strengthen the demand for peace and she undoubtedly trusted to her own long experience in handling people to handle madame schwimmer but she did not go it was a tragedy of hasty action of attempting a great end without proper preparation mr ford would never have attempted to build a new type of automobile engine as he attempted to handle the most powerful thing in the world the unbridled passions of men organized to come to a conclusion by killing one another the peace ship was a failure but so were the undercover official efforts the president and his sympathizers then steadily pushed things grew blacker the day when we would go in seemed always nearer to me in february of nineteen sixteen my depression was deepened by hearing mr wilson himself admit it my friend secretary and mrs daniels had been so gracious as to include me among their guests at the cabinet dinner they were giving in honor of the president and the new mrs wilson we were all standing in the daniels drawing-room waiting their arrival i was talking so interestedly with somebody that i had forgotten what it was all about when i was conscious of a distinguished pair in the doorway it took me an instant to remember what we were there for and that this was the president and his lady how they looked the part at the dinner table the president was gay telling stories quoting limericks later when it came my turn to talk to him and i told him how charming i had found mrs wilson's animation and lively wit he rather eagerly fell to talking of her and to my amazed delight of the difficulties of courting a lady when each time he calls the house is surrounded by secret service men dropping his gaiety he told me a little of the situation at the moment i never go to bed without realizing that i may be called up by news that will mean we are at war before tomorrow morning we may be at war it is harder because the reports that come to us must be kept secret hasty action indiscretion might plunge us into a dangerous situation when a little care would entirely change the face of things my great duty is not to see red i carried away from that dinner a feeling of the tremendous difficulty of the tremendous threat under which we lived and of a man that had steeled himself to see us through it strengthened my confidence in him but of all of this i could say nothing on my chautauqua circuit even when i began to realize that more than anything else these people were interested in the war one of the most convincing proofs i received of this came from things i overheard at night we ended our circuit with a siege of terrific heat the kind of heat that made sleep impossible the best room you could get was generally on the second floor front you pulled your bed to the window and lay with your head practically out but if you could not sleep you would certainly be entertained for on the sidewalks below there would gather around nine thirty or ten a little group of citizens who had come downtown after supper to see a man shopkeepers laborers traveling men lawyers and occasional preachers and hotel keepers would sit out talking war preparedness neutrality wilson hughes for half the night look at them said a talkative congressional candidate four years ago i could have told how practically every one of the men in this town would vote in november i can't do it today nobody can they are freed from partisanship as i could never have believed they are out there now thrashing over wilson and hughes and not twenty-five per cent of them know which it will be when election day comes more and more i came to feel that you could count on these people for any effort or sacrifice that they believed necessary one of the most revealing things about a country is the way it takes the threat of war just after we started the call for troops for mexico came it seemed as if war were inevitable there was no undue excitement where we traveled but boys in khaki seemed to spring out of the ground 
i shall never forget one scene which was being duplicated in many places in that region we were in an old mountain town in pennsylvania our hotel was on the public square a small plot encircled by a row of dignified old-fashioned buildings in the centre stood a bandstand and beside it a foolish little stone soldier mounted on an overhigh pedestal a civil war monument we were told that on the square at half past nine in the evening a town meeting would be called to say good-bye to the boys who were off to mexico on the ten thirty how many of them i asked one hundred and thirty-five was the answer and this was a town of not over twenty-eight hundred people as the hour approached the whole town gathered it came quietly as if for some natural weekly meeting but a little before ten o'clock we heard the drum and fife and down the street came a procession that set my heart thumping close behind the city fathers and speakers came a dozen old soldiers some of them in faded blue two or three on crutches and behind them the boys one hundred and thirty-five of them sober consciously erect their eyes straight ahead their steps so full of youth the procession formed before the little stone soldier who somehow suddenly became anything but foolish he took on dignity and power as had the boys in rank boys whom if i had seen them the day before i might have called unthinking shiftless unreliable the mayor the ministers a former congressman all talked there was a prayer the crowd in solemn tones sang my country tis of thee there was a curt order the procession reformed the old soldiers led the way and the town followed the boys to the ten thirty nothing could have equalled the impression made by the quietness and the naturalness of the proceedings beside the continuous agitations and hysteria to which the east had treated us in the last two and a half years this dignity this immediate action this willingness to see it through gave one a solemn sense of the power and trustworthiness of this people it was a realization that i should have been willing to pay almost any price to come to certainly it more than paid me for my forty-nine nights in forty-nine different beds eight months later this impression of the steadiness of the people under the threat of war deepened after my chautauqua circuit which i had supposed to be a temporary adventure the lecture bureau asked to book me for a month of lyceum work most of it in the middle west late in january of nineteen seventeen i started out i was on the road when the break with germany came our evening papers of february third had the digest of the president's speech to congress the next sunday morning there was the full text i went out to walk early that morning and one of the first things i saw was a lively row in front of a barber shop inquiring i found that a big swede had expressed sympathy with the kaiser and was being thrown into the street at the hotel my chambermaid the elevator boy the table waiter did not wait for me to introduce the subject everybody was talking about what the break meant war of course they were ready they said as the days went on i found that was the opinion of everybody one morning i landed at a railway junction town with no train until late afternoon it was a forlorn place at any time but deadly now with the thermometer around twenty below a friendly ticket agent warned me that the only hotel was no place for ladies and sent me off into the territory beyond the railroad shops to a dingy-looking house which he said was kept by a woman who was clean and decent it was anything but inviting on the outside but travellers who are choosers are poor sports the woman gave me a room and following the only wisdom for the lecturer who would keep herself fit i went to bed it was four o'clock in the afternoon when i came down the woman of the house whom i had found in the morning rubbing out clothes was in a fresh gingham dress sitting in the living room reading the chicago tribune beside her lay a copy of the record herald i found that this woman since the beginning of the trouble in europe had been reading full details in these admirably edited newspapers she had not been for a war she said until they went back on their word 
that settled it for everybody out here now she said there is nothing else to do i do not know how often i heard those words in the days that followed when the president said of america in closing his address to congress on april second nineteen seventeen god helping her she can do no other he was only expressing that which to the majority of the people of the west as i heard them had made up their minds closely watching i personally felt utterly remote there was nothing for me to do in the pandemonium of opinion nothing i could say or do would hinder or help and so i went on with my daily rounds i was speaking at a big dinner in cleveland early in april when a telegram was handed to me signed by the president it appointed me a member of what he called the woman's committee of the council of national defense i did not know what the appointment meant but when your government is trying to put through a war whether you approve or not i had long ago concluded that as for me i would do whatever i was asked to do and so i sent at once an acceptance of what i took as an order two weeks later i received my first instructions they came from the head of the committee dr anna h shaw End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of all in the day's work by ida tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain women and war what is it all about that is what we asked ourselves when on may second answering the call of our chairman dr anna shaw we met in washington and where were we to sit we were but one of many anxious confused scrambling committees for which a place must be found our predicament was settled by finding a room somewhere on pennsylvania avenue a dreary room with a rough table and not enough chairs to go around my first contribution to winning the war was looting chairs from adjacent offices my success gave me hope that after all i might be at least an errand boy in the war machine it was not long however before the woman's committee was a beneficiary of the civilian outbreak of patriotic generosity which had swept washington you may have our house our apartment people cried a fine and spacious old house close to connecticut avenue facing the british embassy was offered us a much more comfortable and dignified headquarters than i think we expected under the conditions we remained there throughout the war but what were we there for the administration had called us into being what did it expect of us it was quickly obvious that what it wanted at the moment was an official group to which it could refer the zealous and importuning women who wanted to help the various organizations already mobilizing women for action considerable rivalry had developed between them and it was certain to become more and more embarrassing our committee had been cleverly organized to spike this rivalry including as it did the presidents of the leading national groups of women the national suffrage society the women's federation of clubs the national women's council the colonial dames the national league for women's service everybody in the list represented something except myself i was a lone journalist with no active connection with any organization or publication i was conscious that that was against me in the committee though apparently it had not been in the minds of president wilson and secretary baker we were not an independent body but one of the many subsidiaries of the council of national defense the managing head of which was the present president of the american telephone and telegraph company walter gifford a man of intelligence sense amazing self-control and patience this i had reason to know as i frequently represented the committee before him the fact that we had to go to men for orders irritated dr shaw from the start she felt we ought to be able to decide for ourselves what women should do or at least she the head of the committee should sit on the council of national defense i think dr anna never quite forgave the administration for subjecting us to the directions of man whose exclusive authority in world affairs she had so long disputed our mandate had been to consider women's defense work for the nation 
but what were we to do with the results of our consideration our recommendations our conclusion was that we must find a way to get them to the women of the country to do that we must coordinate the various agencies represented in our body enlist others create a channel for the government's requests and orders it meant organization here we were strong for dr shaw and carrie chapman catt were the most experienced and successful organizers of women in the country moreover they could command not only the organizations which they had created but through their partners on the committee other great national groups to me the way that organization came into existence so quickly and so quietly was magic unaccustomed as i was to organization in any form it was not long before every state every county practically every community had a branch of the women's committee of the council of national defense before the year was up there were states which in twenty-four hours after receiving our requests could pass them down to their remotest corner from the start the committee worked dr anna saw to that she and mrs catt settled down in washington for myself i cancelled two book contracts determined to do what i could indefinite as the task seemed we met regularly we kept office hours we were keen to make something of our job the committee took it for granted that we were to handle the food problem already looming so large by midsummer we had our organizations everywhere planting and hoeing on top of this came dehydration and we had many hot discussions about the best method i remember a morning when the committee gave itself over to reminiscences of helping grandmother string apples for drying of the way mother dried corn and berries then came canning the larder was to be full we were pretty well under way and rather proud of ourselves thinking this was a special job when herbert hoover came back from feeding europe and was put at the head of the american food administration in a building of his own practically a dictator of the food of america obviously mr hoover was the one man in the world who could properly manage the huge and many-sided job but it caused considerable heart-burning in the woman's committee that gardening and canning and drying should not be left entirely to us were we not already in the field had we not an organization which was rapidly extending to the last woman in the country were they not digging and planting and canning and saving but in spite of dr anna's bristling opposition we were soon put in our place made an auxiliary it fell to me to act as liaison officer which amounted to nothing more than finding out at food headquarters what they wanted from women and passing it on what we soon had contrived to become thanks largely to dr anna and mrs catt was a free channel through which we could pour speedily and uninterruptedly any request which came to us from any department of the war machine we developed a disciplined army with other things to do than knitting and bandage making gardening and canning essential and important as these were our most useful service as i see it was a growing activity in preventing the machinery of daily life from rusting in the storm of war take the women going in droves into industry for the most part they were as untrained as the boys drafted into the army as willing as these to take it throw themselves away jane adams had said to me at the beginning of the war everything that we have gained in the way of social legislation will be destroyed it will throw us back where we were twenty-five years ago that did not seem to me to be necessary nor indeed to be the way things were already going take this woman in industry for whom miss adams was especially alarmed recruiting for munition factories had been pushed before we went into the war by the national league for woman's service of which maud wetmore a member of the woman's committee was chairman as early as march nineteen seventeen the league was at work in the department of labor soon after war was declared the president and the secretaries of war and labor called for general support of labor laws for women as well as for men mrs j borden harriman was soon made chairman of a committee on women in industry of the council of national defense 
about the same time our committee created a department to handle the problem and was given a tenth member from the ranks of organized women miss agnes nestor of chicago a leader in the glove workers union we were a little concerned about the new appointee but miss nestor from the start was one of the most useful members of the committee wise and patient in understanding all problems though naturally concentrated chiefly on her own which were grave enough because of the rapid multiplication of agencies with their unavoidable rivalries and jealousies the determination not only to protect woman in her new capacity but educate her thrust her ahead was strong representatives of organized women met in kansas city in june demanding new standards for war contracts the upshot was that florence kelly was made a member of the board of control of labor standards for army clothing things went rapidly after that a woman's division was created in january in the united states employment service with mrs h m richard at its head about the same time mary van cleek was made head of a woman's branch in the ordnance service and our agnes nestor who had by this time become generally recognized for her intelligence and steadiness was appointed on the newly formed advisory council to the secretary of labor in war labor legislation agnes nestor and mary anderson the present head of the woman's bureau of the department of labor demonstrated as i had never seen it the education to be had in a labor organization which seeks by arbitration and more arbitration and still more arbitration to improve its situation without weakening the industry by which it lives one that appeals to force only as a last resort never as a mere threat what all this amounts to is that through the activities of women in and out of industry there was a steady clarification and strengthening of our position the chief service of the woman's committee in the matter was seeing that full information of what was going on was sent broadcast miss nestor's reports reached women in quarters where labor standards had probably never been heard of in our bulletins we kept up a constant stream of news items of what women were doing in industry not only in this country but in others to make our vast horde conscious of the needs of sisters at the machine eager to support what the government had decided was right and just for her protection was our aim we did our part in proving that even in war determined women could not only prevent backward movements but even move forward similar to what we did for the woman in industry was the help we were able to give to the children's bureau julia lathrop its head told us how its work was falling behind playgrounds in many places given up maternity work shut down could we help to stem this backward flow we turned our machinery at once to the support of the bureau women in districts where its work had never been known were aroused to establish nursing centers look after maternity cases interest themselves afresh in what was happening to children it was a work of education as well as of renewal julia lathrop told me one day just before the committee went out of existence that the work of her bureau had been extended more in the few months that we had been promoting it than it could have been with their machinery in as many years as the effectiveness of our national channel began to be understood naturally enough all sorts of requests came to help out in putting over this or that scheme to grant favors for this or that friend while the majority of such efforts were entirely legitimate there were some of dubious character i recall an amusing illustration of the latter just after war began to take its toll the gold star mothers were organized and our committee was asked to prepare an official armband with a gold star or stars the idea had not been noised about before a gentleman high in the councils of the nation came to us with the request that we make the badge not of black as decided but purple purple velvet his reason was that a friend of his a manufacturer of velvet had on hand some thousands of yards of purple velvet which he would like to dispose of we did not see our way to change our choice of color and material a request which led to a peck of trouble for me came from the two persons in the country i had least expected to look to us for help 
louis filler and sam hill friends of queen marie of romania if i remember correctly they wanted us to bring her over in the interest of the allied cause we compromised by promising to send her a message of sympathy i was commissioned to see that it was properly illuminated and through my affiliation with the pen and brush club of new york a group of women writers and artists a really beautiful parchment roll was turned out we were so pleased with it that we had one made for queen elizabeth of belgium but how were we going to get them to the queen's mr gifford of the council was unsympathetic no one would have dared to suggest to mr lansing that the state department interest itself the war department could not be expected to carry them those messages lay about the woman's committee for weeks a burden and finally a joke a burden and a joke which was thrown on my shoulders when in january of nineteen nineteen i went to paris for observation for the red cross magazine surely in paris there would be some way of delivering them it was robert bliss of our embassy who came to my help in the case of queen marie and much to my relief passed the roll on to a representative of the roumanian government i understood although i never had any diplomatic assurance that it really landed on the desk of the queen as to the message to queen elizabeth mrs vernon kellogg who was persona grata with the queen was in paris and knowing that she was going back to brussels i hastened to her with my roll told her my predicament begged her to take it off my hands which she kindly did and that was the last i heard of the messages to the queens by the end of our first year i was persuaded that the making of a permanent federal agency lay in the woman's committee i took my notion to the secretary of the interior franklin lane who had proved a helpful friend of the committee in moments of strain why i asked could not the present woman's committee be continued after the war in the department of the interior why could it not be put under a woman assistant secretary and used as a channel to carry to women in the last outposts of the country knowledge of what the various departments of the government are doing for the improvement of the life of the people you know how limited is the reach of many of the findings of the bureaus of research of their planning for health and education and training why not do for peace what we are doing for war secretary lane was interested but in the committee itself there was little response dr anna pooh-poohed it it was too limited a recognition what she wanted was a representative in the cabinet and she was unwilling to take anything else it is possible that dr anna did not want to encourage ideas concerning women from a woman as lukewarm as i had always been in the matter of suffrage she wanted a committee as actively interested in pushing ahead the cause of votes for women as it was in defense work in protecting women and children from her point of view the cause was as vital as protecting women in industries indeed essential to that problem there was only one other woman on the committee as lukewarm as i in the matter of suffrage and that was one of our most valuable and distinguished members mrs joseph lamar of atlanta the widow of justice lamar of the supreme court of the united states mrs lamar and i saw eye to eye as a rule in the work of the committee and we both felt it should keep out of suffrage work not so easy for old-time national leaders like dr anna and mrs catt with militant suffragists picketing the white house begging for a rest but they showed admirable restraint indeed i believe that restraint to have been in the long run the soundest politics it certainly helped in bringing both houses of the congress to accept the nineteenth amendment in the early summer of nineteen nineteen giving nationwide suffrage to women dr anna's attitude towards me was quite understandable she was familiar with and resented as she told me quite frankly certain activities of mine which had conflicted with both her convictions and her arguments activities which had been a surprise and a regret to many of those whose opinions i valued highly i had always resented the pains that militant suffragists took to belittle the work that woman had done in the past in the world picturing her as a meek and prostrate doormat they refused i felt to pay proper credit to the fine social and economic work that women had done in the building of america 
and in 1909, after we took over the American magazine, I burst out with a series of studies of leading American women, from the Revolution to the Civil War, including such stalwarts as Mercy Warren, Abigail Adams, Esther Reed, Mary Lyon, Catherine Beecher, the fighting anti-slavery leaders, not omitting two for whom I had warm admiration, if I was not in entire agreement with them elizabeth cady stanton and susan b anthony i thought i made a pretty good showing but i found it was not welcome and on top of that i settled my position in the minds of dr anna and many of her friends by a series of little essays which i finally brought together under the title of the business of being a woman that title was like a red flag to many of my militant friends the idea that woman had a business assigned by nature and society which was of more importance than public life disturbed them even if it was so they did not want it emphasized feeling as i did i could not fight for suffrage although i did not fight against it moreover i believe that it would come because in the minds of most people democracy is a piece of machinery its motive power the ballot the majority of the advocates for women's suffrage saw regeneration a new world through laws and systems but i saw democracy as a spiritual faith i did not deny that it must be interpreted in laws and systems but their work deepens broadens only as the spirit grows what i feared in women was that they would substitute the letter for the spirit weaken the strategic place nature and society had given them for keeping the spirit alive in the democracy elevating it to the head of the procession of life training youth for its place but what chance had such ideas beside the practical program of the suffragist my arguments again had no emotional stuff in them they carried no promise of speedily remaking the hard life most women were living had always lived the suffragists pictured a society renewed regenerated stripped of corruption and injustice all done by a single stroke giving votes to women they would never betray the trust the old fiction to which they held so tenaciously that women are by nature better than men and need only the chance in politics to clear society of its corruption i could not agree it is not to be wondered that dr anna suspected me had a certain resentment at my being a member of her committee in spite of all this as the months went on she and i became better and better friends she was so able so zealous so utterly given to her cause that i had always had genuine admiration for her now i found her a most warm-hearted and human person as well as delightfully salty in her bristling against men in their ways an event in the history of our committee was a grand evening gathering in one of washington's theatres we all sat in state on the platform and in the boxes were several members of the cabinet with president wilson himself for a part of the evening at least dr anna made a capital speech little anti-masculine chips flying off her shoulder every now and then to the particular delight of the president dr anna i told her the next day you are one of the most provocative women i have ever known an out-and-out -out flirt but we were good enough friends by this time for her to laugh i am not sure but she was a bit flattered when the work of the committee was over and she was sending out her final report thanking each of us officially for our part in what i always think of as her achievement she included in mine a handwritten personal letter which i shall always treasure as a proof of the bigness and the beauty of the nature of this splendid woman evidently she remembered how she had sputtered at me sometimes you talk too much miss tarbell true i always do if i have a listening audience i hate a lukewarm person she declared when i persisted in balancing arguments she did she had never known for a moment in her life the frustration the perplexities of lukewarmness but now she wrote thanking me for what she called my consideration and kindness toward what she called her blunders and mistakes just what she meant i do not know it was enough for me that she should end with sincere and affectionate regard 
enough because i knew she understood what i had never put into words that for her i never had anything but a sincere regard a regard which our associations had turned to real affection the only professional work i did in this period was a few weeks of lecturing a contract which i had made before we went into the war i have spoken of the quietness and steadiness with which people throughout the country seemed to me to be taking the call for troops in nineteen sixteen when i was on the chautauqua circuit of the conviction i had as i saw them in the middle west on the declaration of war in april of nineteen seventeen that they had already made up their minds were ready to go but i confess i was unprepared for what i everywhere met early in nineteen eighteen travelling chiefly in the south the middle west and the southwest the country was no longer quiet no longer reflective on every street corner around every table it was fighting the war watchfully suspiciously determinedly all the paraphernalia of life had taken on war colouring the platforms from which i spoke were so swathed in flags that i often had to watch my step entering and leaving i found i was expected to wear a flag not a corsage at every lunch or dinner where i was a guest all declarations were red white and blue when you are on a lecture trip one of your few resources is the newsstand i had the habit of searching the postal card racks for local points of interest local celebrations but now all these had disappeared the racks were filled with pictures of soldiers in all of their scores of operations humble and otherwise not only on parade but on spud duty there were thrilling pictures of cavalry charges of marches across country of aeroplanes directing field maneuvers touching scenes in hospitals cheering ones of games endless sentimental ones to be sent to the boys a change had come over the literature of the newsstands serious magazines i had never before seen in certain southwestern towns were there now anything that pertains to patriotism is a good seller a railroad station news agent told me why look at the books we carry and there they were hanky empy boyd cable disputing attention with slashaway the fearless gunpowder jim the mystery of demon hollow the libraries of scores of towns made a specialty of war books at council bluffs an old large rich and cultivated town of course i found on an open shelf beside the librarian's desk hazen's modern european history john macefield's gallipoli the old front line andre Charadam's essays hoofers between saint denis and st george and a score of others they all showed signs of much reading as for the newspapers they were given over to the war it was my duty to make sure that they were giving the releases of our committee fair attention they were the local women were attending to that editors might and did grumble because washington was swamping them with information and suggestions which often they felt were old stuff repetition but they sweated to do their part the editorial attitude was not characterized by excessive respect for great names particularly if the great name was that of an enemy i was in texas when the zimmerman note was given out by the president nothing could have been more amusing than the contemptuous attitude of the average texas citizen whom i met some of the country newspapers did not even take the trouble to print the gentleman's name but called him zim you received the impression that a german japanese attack on our southwest border would be a very simple matter for texans to clean up all they asked i was told was for uncle sam to keep his hands off they would take care of it there was little anger but much contempt everywhere the boys were the absorbing interest in the southwest and along the atlantic coast i practically lived with them they crowded every railroad station hustled into every train there was rarely a night that i was not wakened by their demanding beds in already overflowing sleepers troop trains passed you en route all sorts of slogans scribbled in chalk on the cars from wherever they came they were sure to announce that they were bound for berlin 
it is of course beside the truth to say that all young soldiers were big and cheerful and spirited and brave but the total impression was certainly one of bigness of freedom and of exultation in the enterprise one came to have a fierce pride in them an impatience of any criticism of what they did a longing to fight for them since one could not fight beside them crossing the apache trail in march of nineteen eighteen we picked up three silent rough youths who had come from somewhere out of the desert and were making for camp to enlist they were fascinating travelling companions shy watchful suspicious discovering for the first time the ordinary arrangements of railroad life i remember a wonderful young savage with whom i travelled for a day we were depending on eating houses for food and woke up to find our train six hours late this meant no breakfast until possibly eleven o'clock of course the boy was famished he ate ravenously and then bought right and left sandwiches pie hard-boiled eggs an armful of packages you could almost hear him saying to himself they are not going to catch me again they had put one over on him but next time he would be ready for them the interest of the boys in what was before them was unflagging they were not afraid to talk about the worst when the Tuscania went down those bound for sailing points were not phased in the least by the danger of the passage but more than once i felt that the tragedy had whetted their desire to get at the enemy the interest of older men in the young soldier was inexhaustible they were like the little boys in that little boys could not resist a soldier it was startling to see a baby of three years slip away from his mother walk down the aisle to where a soldier boy was sitting watch him silently with wide open eyes get a little bolder stretch out his hand and stroke his clothes get a little bolder still and ask if he might put on his cap soldier or not soldier however the men talked war talked it all the time when they were not reading their newspapers how the news filtered to them in certain remote spots it was hard to understand in crossing the apache trail i was startled to see a man rise from the desert as it seemed and ask if we had any more news about them big guns if anybody had found out how they do it we gave him all the papers we had and the passengers freely aired their theories of the mystery with the inexhaustible interest went a fierce determination to see that every suggestion of the government was carried out when the third liberty loan opened i was travelling in a section where there were many german settlers what is their attitude i asked a woman active in the work of our committee we have but one family in this town she said after being waited on by five of our leading citizens they took ten thousand dollars of liberty bonds i do not know whether these citizens carried ropes in their hands when they made the call but i did see in one town a detachment of citizens parading with ropes on the pummels of their saddles and banners marked beware it had been agreed by all concerned that i talk on what was doing in washington as i had been seeing it now and then i was lent by my sponsor to aid in a drive of one kind or another once i spoke from the platform of oklahoma billy sunday a picturesque and highly successful revivalist who patterned his campaigns after those of his great namesake a liberty loan drive was on and no gathering not even a revival certainly not a lecture was allowed in the town which did not share its time with the grim banker heading the local committee he opened the meeting and left me shivering with what might happen to those who differed with him about the size of their purchase then came boisterous singing and praying broken to let me tell my story how dull and uninspired it sounded sandwiched between this goading and inflaming i realized more and more as i went on that i did not really know much more of my subject than they did in bisbee arizona or little rock arkansas so persistently did they tap every source of information but i certainly knew fewer things that were not so it was inevitable that stirred to their depths by the continuous flow of all this young life towards the great battlefields of europe they should see red hate suspect 
i could neither give them the inside information they craved nor stir them to the hate of which they had absolute need i sometimes felt to keep up their courage are you a pacifist a stern citizen on a missouri railway platform asked me one morning as i was leaving a town where i had spoken the night before and where i had deplored the will to hate i was sensing well i parried i am for winning this war did you sign this he pulled out a pre-war list of names a peace society where my name appeared it was headed by jane adams that woman he called her i am proud to be classed with that woman i said indignantly she is one of the world's greatest and if the world could or would have heeded her counsels you boys would not be dying in france there was no time for argument or arrest for my train came i took it followed by the black looks of more than one listener but it was the boys that were doing this they had given of their blood and their hearts went with the gift they were like an old fellow that i heard cry out one day i can't bear to think of one of ours getting hurt it would have been idle of course to pretend that in the territory over which i travelled between the break with germany and the armistice in twenty-five different states something like twenty-five thousand miles there were no indications of revolt but as i saw them they were infrequent and never in public now and then i came upon a man or woman who dared to say to me when he had me in a corner i am a pacifist we must find another way with which i so heartily agreed but that man or woman would not have said that on the street corner without danger to his life people generally did not have much interest in what was to happen after the war was ended they took it for granted that germany would be driven back that was what they were working for but how the adjustments were to be made that did not deeply concern them what they wanted was to have it over and get the boys back that done they were willing to forget pay the bill but there must be no more of this senseless business in the world even the most violent occasionally confided that to you all these observations of which i talked i am afraid too much to the members of the committee when i came back strengthened my conviction that whatever it cost there was no doubt that the country would insist on seeing it through that conviction was never stronger than when the armistice was suddenly signed. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Armistice The war was over, and the United States was setting the brakes on its war machinery setting them so hurriedly in some cases that they created situations almost as destructive as war there was nothing left now for the woman's committee of the council of national defense but to clean up and move out dr anna stayed by while an admirable executive secretary and a small clerical force put things into order reported what had been done thanked everybody for his or her cooperation by the end of the year my desk had been cleared and i was preparing for a new job to go to france for the red cross magazine my old editor john s phillips had been in charge there for some months making a really significant and stimulating journal he wanted a fresh eye on the rehabilitation work the organization was carrying on in france he thought i might furnish it i agreed to try crossing the ocean in january nineteen nineteen gave one some notions of what war had done to the accustomed orderly procedure of life i was to sail to bordeaux at a fixed hour but no ship as yet went on time though passengers were expected to arrive on time and to sit for hours as we were locked in the waiting-room at the dock at least it gave you an opportunity to eye as a whole those who were to be your fellow passengers everybody on my ship was evidently connected with some problem of restoration the most interesting being the french bent on rehabilitating families they feared were stripped of everything they were even taking food as we waited a woman who guarded two enormous hams explained to me that her mother had begged her to bring a jambon she had not had a jambon for so long 
it was a new idea to me i knew that sweets would be welcome to my friends and i had armed myself with chocolates and bonbons but a jambon why should i not take one to my dear madame marillier securing a permit to leave the dock i hunted up a neighboring market and after much negotiation persuaded a wholesale dealer to sell me a ham almost as big as i was it was a problem to get it into the ship but it was more of a problem to get it off get it to paris i had queer ideas of what i might need in the way of luggage and in my equipment was a pair of enormous saddlebags into which i had thrown high boots heavy blankets sweaters woolen tights and hose just in case crowding them all into one bag into the other i put my jambon in the long and tedious railroad journey from bordeaux to paris i was packed in with a group of fine serious young quakers going over to help a reconstruction project and that terrible piece of luggage jumped from the rack and almost brained one of my companions i cannot recall all the adventures of that ham but i know that i was never more relieved than when i laid it at the feet of my old friend what in the world she exclaimed or its equivalent and senyabos said oh these americans i was not long in paris before i felt keenly that many of the french were saying oh these americans we seem to swarm over everything to absorb things at least this was true in the quarters where at the urgency of my friends auguste jacacci and william allen white i had gone to live the hotel de Villemont, just off the place de la concorde walking down the rue de rivoli to the red cross headquarters was like walking the streets of washington in the vicinity of the governmental departments active in the prosecution of the war all the familiar faces seemed to have been transported to paris as indeed great numbers of them had mingling with them were officers and men on leave many seeking desperately to drown ghastly memories in any form of pleasure that would bring forgetfulness most of them intent on sightseeing buying gifts to take home i found the pleasantest duty my red cross uniform brought me in paris was when stalwart doughboys accosted me say sister won't you help me find something to take home to my mother my girl before we were through with the shopping i had the family history but never a word about the war that was done with they wanted to forget it and go home they resented the delay we have paid our debt to lafayette now who in hell do we owe this was the legend i saw once on a camion crossing the place de la concorde i was told it was torn down by a scandalized officer and forbidden to be used in the future but it expressed the doughboy's opinion as i got it better than anything else i saw or heard not only the scenes in my quarter but the conditions of living shattered all my preconceived notions of hardship i had been prepared for hardtack but once at Vilmont i found that if i took the trouble to market and bring in my purchases i could supplement the unbalanced meals with almost anything i wanted the prices were high to be sure sixteen cents each for eggs two to four dollars a pound for butter a dollar and a half for a little jar of honey many extras could be bought more cheaply at the american commissariat william allen white was buying at the commissariat the prunes on which he seemed principally to live but marketing gave me the opportunity i wanted for finding out what the alert parisian shopkeepers were thinking and saying i sounded out that opinion daily until it was cut off by the conviction running through the town that america no longer sympathized fully with the french that she was not going to force germany to pay the sixty-five billion dollars the people felt they should have the americans living around the place de la concorde assured me that paris was not changed not for them perhaps but when i went among my old french friends most of whom had stuck it through the war changes stared me in the face i hurried to my old quarter on the left bank great gaps in the circle around the pantheon and in the boulevard saint michel skirting the luxembourg told the story of what the quarter had endured the laiterie where i once bought eggs and milk and cheese was gone the space carefully boarded i hunted among the neighbors for the cheerful madame whom i had so enjoyed she had died with the building they told me 
there were little neglects in the once carefully kept apartments of my friends that affected me all out of proportion to their importance the door into madame marillier's chambre au coucher would not close nothing has been mended in paris you know now for three years my friend explained it was literally true nothing painted nothing mended little replaced craftsmen and tradesmen were in the trenches or in their graves so many of those whom once you had known the people who had served you or had been your comrades were in their graves madame marillier pointing to a long roster of names on her desk in the salon said look these are our dead read them you will remember some of the names and i did men whom i had known twenty-five years before and whose brilliant talk i had listened to at her wednesday night dinners they could not bring back their dead but after all the horror life was to go on and they were bravely doing their best to give it something of its character before the war one thing they were counting on was the return to their homes and to the museums of their treasured belle chose when i went out to dinner with french acquaintances who had possessed beautiful things often pictures catalogued as national treasures empty frames stared from the walls the canvases had been cut out and sent to a safe place generally somewhere in the south but they would soon have them back and that would help not only in paris but wherever invasion was threatened there had been an immediate effort to hustle the best-loved treasures out of reach at amiens they told me they had sent away the famous lange pleurante it was back when i was there in march and people were coming from all the towns near by to see it to gloat and weep over it i was concerned with the fate of the pretty girl of lille that exquisite wax bust attributed by some to leonardo da vinci and when i made lille my headquarters for a few days i at once made inquiries the gallery was closed but there had just been received many boxes of pictures which the germans were carrying off when stopped on their retreat the authorities were not adverse to having an accredited journalist see with his own eyes what had happened and i was permitted to visit the gallery the boxes were there standing against the wall still unopened and on each was clearly printed the name of the picture and of the german museum to which it had been assigned beautiful evidence of the amazing efficiency with which the germans had conducted their looting why there i said as i went about there is the pretty girl of lille the curator winked at me do you think so he said that is what the german emperor thought when he went through the museum it is a replica the pretty girl is in a safe place and she will stay there until i am sure they won't come back they was the term i heard almost universally applied to the germans in the devastated regions everywhere was the same joy over the safety and the return of their belle chose i think i have never been in a group where gratitude mingled with sorrow was stronger than when my friend auguste jacacci who had been in paris throughout the war at the head of the beautiful work for belgian and french children lost or orphaned by the war asked me to go with him to the opening of a room in the louvre closed of course through the dark period it was one of the smaller galleries but in it had been gathered new possessions things bought in the war others left by wills a collection of choicest pieces they were welcomed by the leading connoisseurs of the city the directors of the louvre and the luxembourg a few artists a few great ladies everybody was in black and went about with unsmiling but touching appreciation hardly believing it seemed to me that again he or she was free to rejoice in beauty it was like coming home after the long funeral of a beloved member of a family but i was more concerned with the everyday conditions under which humble people were living particularly in the territory so lately occupied that was where the red cross could now be of the most practical help it seemed to me it took but little looking about to see that nothing we could provide would come amiss either to those who had been caught and so remained through the war or to those who were now coming back generally under the protest of the authorities i had not imagined that a bombardment could so strip a community a countryside of all the little conveniences of life 
at lens once a great manufacturing and mining town now a vast mass of red brick dust hardly a wall left i went about looking for signs of life for i had been told that a few people had weathered the horror and were to be found living underground coming on what seemed to be a path running over a pile of debris i followed it into an opening and there in what was left of a basement sat a woman sewing there was a fire on the hearth she got up to greet me a child ran out a little girl with tousled head dirty and ragged you must pardon the way we look we have been here for many months we haven't a comb no pins nothing but we are happy they have gone every now and then i came upon little groups who had found shelter in enemy trenches throughout the war in a small town southeast of Lyon, in the region occupied at the beginning of the war and held until the final retreat i came upon a half dozen children who had been brought up in the trenches a couple of french sisters had come back to the region and were trying to civilize them you have no idea they told me how difficult it is to teach them to use handkerchiefs this was an apology for running noses but if ignorant of all civilized ways these youngsters were remarkably healthy they had had the food of the invaders and they had lived in the earth very much like young animals while they knew nothing of books they knew everything about war guns batteries shells uniforms on the latter they had positive ideas they had never seen a red cross uniform before and they criticized it openly pa chic by which i suppose they meant bungling and i must confess mine was continually as i went about i asked myself how it could be that every pin every needle every spool of thread every comb had gone larger articles you understood but these little things the silence of the devastated regions was even more perplexing than this stripping i drove to the belgian border several times and it was a long time before i could make out why it was so still finally it occurred to me that i saw and heard nothing alive no cat no dog no hen all these creatures had completely disappeared and when they began to be brought back the rejoicing was like that of the return of the beautiful things to the cities one would live again perhaps at vic sur aine where the american committee for devastated france was carrying on its fine practical work among the many many things it was doing was attempting to restock with poultry the daughter of an eminent new york family had an incubator in her bedroom where she told me she soon hoped to have a flock of chicks the day that i was there a hen which had been imported laid an egg it was an event in the countryside i saw peasant women wipe away tears that day as they looked at that hen and her egg they would live again i shared this feeling later when spring began to come and in going over torn battlefields i saw the primroses one day i heard a skylark sing and sing until it came out of the blue and dropped like a stone to the ground it was like a voice of promise from heaven what saved one's reason within this immense devastation so completely incredibly horrible was the intelligent and energetic way in which restoration was going on highways had been opened from paris to lille and on to brussels they included such shattered towns as albert arras bethune lens armentieres i could go comfortably and did to ypres cambrai saint quentin laon rem to all important points in northeastern france and along the border it was when you disobeyed orders and explored unopened territory that you got into trouble i tried messine ridge and landed in a shell hole it took twenty small anamis located by my doughboy chauffeur at work on a clean-up job a mile or so away to lift out our car and carry it a quarter of a mile to something like safety the angry berating of an english officer the english being responsible in that territory still rings in my ears a most heartening sight was the steady slow redemption of the mutilated land as a rule the job of clearing away the first layer of war debris was given to german prisoners and soldiers from french colonies 
it was a horrifying mess of abandoned tanks artillery guns shells hand grenades not all duds unhappily as daily accidents demonstrated with the debris cleared away the heavy task of levelling the land followed it was often deeply riddled as over the chemin de dame where the underpinning of hard white limestone lay shattered on the top the soil far below after the levelling came the tractors ploughing the land and finally the seeding along the highways outside of most of the big wrecked towns i saw between paris and lille were short stretches in one or another stage of this orderly redemption french english and americans were all connected with the restoration what really mattered i felt was the work of the french first it was their business then they understood their people what they could and could not expect them to do they were most successful in getting individuals to do the things they had always done in the way they had always done them the american workers marvellous as they were wanted to reform the french modes of life they were keen on sanitation and chintz curtains the frenchmen were keen on community tractors the french women on community sewing machines after i had seen one little group of french women gathered by an energetic duchess in a wing of her battered chateau making over old clothes for ragged refugees who had had literally nothing new for years i thought i knew what the red cross could best do for the devastated regions the red cross had on hand at the end of the war millions of garments the output of thousands of little sewing and knitting circles scattered from ocean to ocean and from great lakes to gulf innumerable shirts drawers pajamas scarfs sweaters were piled in storehouses the most extensive that i saw being at lille my cry was turn them over to the french sewing circles so rapidly forming and if possible send a sewing machine with them you can be sure that the kalamazoo pajamas the topeka shirts everybody's sweaters will be refitted for children and men and women who at present have not a decent shirt to their backs or decent drawers to their legs a desultory distribution was already making but i wanted it general and systematic it was consoling to have found at least one thing obvious as it was which i felt i could energetically back practical help was the more worth while because so intelligently turned to use the few returning to the towns from which they had been driven often showed amazing resourcefulness and courage they wanted to rebuild their homes set up their shops but when they came to the town where they had once lived it frequently was impossible to find the spot which they supposed they owned at cantigny an utterly devastated flat ruin the day i saw it a frenchman and his wife appeared and quietly went about trying to locate the site of their home they went away in disagreement as to where their street had run at peronne i talked with a carpenter who had set up his shop he told me he had had difficulty in finding his old location but he thought he was on the right spot at least the authorities told him he might settle there by pulling scaffoldings from tumble-down houses and bringing in corrugated iron from nearby trenches he had made himself a waterproof shelter arranged a workbench and already was earning a little money by helping the authorities here and there in the cleaning up a piece of constructive work he had taken on was salvaging doors here he had found a solid door frame there a panel and putting these together he was producing a stock he was certain it would not be long before he would have customers for them all this put heart in me in the same way the first primrose the first skylark had done there was an indomitable something in men then as there was in nature something that made them live and grow paris and the peace conference taxed my faith more severely than the devastated regions my brother back in the united states wrote to me that the job the conference seemed to have set itself was as big as creating the world men were not big enough for that and one was aghast that they felt so equal to it or if not that were willing to give the impression of feeling equal what scared me was that so many battered people accepted this notion of what the conference could and would do 
from all over the globe they brought their wrongs and hopes and needs to be satisfied many of them also brought along ideas for the making and running of the new world ideas in which they felt the quality of inspiration the success of the conference would depend in the mind of each of these suppliants upon his getting what he was after but at the very outset they were balked by their failure to reach the one man who they believed had not only the will but the power to satisfy their grievances and hopes the messiah of the conference woodrow wilson there was always somebody in the complex and all-embracing organization of the conference to hear sift report their case but again and again they could get no notion of what was happening to it insistence on an answer on knowing how things were going often closed doors which at first had welcomed them i felt this deeply in the case of the armenians my interest in them had been aroused by a delegation at the hotel de voimont in the number was a woman with one of the most beautiful and tragic faces that i had ever looked on it was not long before this woman was putting her case before me in excellent english for she had had all the advantages of a european education she and her companions had all suffered from the cruel and relentless atrocities which had paralyzed their country now their hope was that the united states would take the mandate for armenia before i realized it i had become a determined advocate of that solution of their problem i feel sure that if we had gone into the league of nations i should have felt called to work for a mandate for armenia the saddest thing was to see the gradual fall of their hopes to know the day had come when whatever had been the original reception they could no longer get the ear of principals or experts balfour was said to have shouted in an aid as he threw the memoranda of the armenians in the corner do not bring me another of these things at this conference i know all i want to know about this cause and i will not read any more memoranda something of this kind was happening in delegation after delegation and as hope went out of the suppliants resentment took its place soon many of the disappointed were joining the no small number that from the start had come to paris so far as i could see to do their best to ruin the conference from every country came political opponents of the chosen delegates and of the settlements which they were seeking from no country were there more of these than from the united states and certainly from no country were there so many whose chief weapon was malicious gossip there was nothing for these political malcontents to do but talk and that they did whenever they could find a listener in cafes on street corners at french dinner tables dinner tables becoming more and more unsympathetic as it began to be rumored that the full measure of punishment they asked was not to be given germany these groups naturally absorbed the bewildered people who were getting no answer to their supplications who were being put off from day to day it was easy to persuade them that the peace conference was a failure what startled me as the days went on was the passing of the will to peace which had been strong even taken for granted at the start hate was replacing it again and again i recalled in those days a shrine i had once seen in brittany called our lady of the hates one of those frank realistic shrines where symbolic figures portray the devils which torment men and prevent peaceful living that shrine haunted my dreams when the confusion and bitterness seemed daily more confounded the social revolutionists at the peace conference never reached the point of building barricades as i had seen them do in paris twenty-five years before but they did make it rather lively on may first and inconvenient for many people who wanted to do their part in keeping the world moving in an orderly fashion their humdrum part of delivering milk looking after the sick keeping things clean they threatened such dire calamity if they were not allowed to meet and obstruct circulation in certain central places that the government usually stupid in such matters shut down on their ambitions so completely that of course they collected in these forbidden places and did their best to cause bloodshed i remember one young thing who thought the time had come and meant to be in the centre of carnage she went out early in the morning and posted herself on the steps of the madeleine 
and sat there all day in a state of honest genuine enthusiasm ready to sacrifice herself as well as everybody in sight but there was no real fray only some discouraging little street rows with theatrical attempts to make capital out of them and a few pitiful dead little useful people with dependents taking a holiday and eager to see it was a great day for american doughboys they had been ordered to stay indoors to give up their firearms and to do nothing that in any way would invite disaster their answer was like that of the would-be revolutionist for they streamed by hundreds over the monuments and cannon of the place de la concorde there was not a monument or a point of vantage around that place that any human being could climb to that was not occupied by these youths if there was to be a revolution they were going to be there to see it break out that which contributed more than anything else it seemed to me at the time to the suspicion and commotion around the peace conference was that it fed the onlookers the press included so little actual information to chew on the delegates and committees sat behind closed doors only spoke when a conclusion was reached a document adopted the public wanted to sit in a gallery and hear the discussions leading to conclusions and documents and being shut out speculated gossiped believed the worst spread false and damaging reports it took out its resentment by creating a four-headed monster wilson clemenceau lloyd george and orlando preparing to dragoon the world into a fresh crop of unholy alliances and commitments and to refuse justice to multitudes of small and weak peoples and causes it was prepared beforehand to doubt whatever the conference did in the confusion and discouragement the one concrete thing i found was the international labor conference at the beginning of the century one of the hopes of pacifists like dr jordan jane adams and their associates had been the international association for labor legislation organized in nineteen hundred it had been carried on without much help from labor itself until the war came then labor set up a loud demand for international action the undertaking added to that Americanization of the Place de la Concorde in the Rue de Rivoli which had struck me on my arrival. Many men and women I had known when I was working, editorially and otherwise, on labor relations, turned up. It was like home to see Mr. Gompers barging up and down the Rue de Rivoli and to run on to Mary Anderson and Rose Schneiderman in the garden of the Tuileries. I was lucky enough to fall in, at the start, with Dr. James T. Shotwell, the active head of the Labor Committee of the American Delegation. Dr. Shotwell's intelligence and patience were of the utmost help, I have always felt, in getting the final agreement adopted, early in April, in a full session. Certainly it was due to his generous explanations that I was able to follow what was going on. At the same time, I had the satisfaction of finding old-time French friends interested and active in the undertaking most important of these albert thomas who from the start was one of the vital influences in the conference then my old friend senubos was actively interested shotwell in his at the paris peace conference describes him as a little old man talking fast and furiously very well satisfied with our labor business which he seems to hold in higher regard than we do senubos did hold it in high regard hoped much for its future i suspect he too was glad to find something in the complicated peace negotiations he could put his hands on see through one of the most unexpected of my experiences in these days was the revival of past episodes in my life the friends i had known so well in paris back in the nineties such as had escaped death or disability were constantly turning up in important positions most influential among them all was the englishman wickham steed now the editor of the london times a person who ranked with ambassadors but who was good enough to take notice of his old latin quarter friends another of my intimates of those days was charles borgo who had come up from geneva with the swiss plan for a confederation of nations a sound and excellent document which, I suppose, was filed away with the multitudes of plans which flooded the conference in those days. 
i was so excited by seeing about me so many of these old acquaintances and friends that i attempted to get them together for lunch one day senebos madame marillier steed louis lapique all that i could put my hands on the result gave me a melancholy sense of what twenty-five years can do particularly a twenty-five years ending in such a catastrophe as they all had been going through to take the edge off once keen friendships a more satisfactory revival of past and gone associations came from meeting numbers of former professional friends who were filling one or another post here were william allen white and auguste jacacci here was ray stannard baker the head of the american press delegation one of the few americans having an easy entree to the president himself conducting his difficult post with fine judgment and an absolute fairness which silenced the tongues of some of the most bumptious and political-minded correspondents how can you bully so straight a chap as ray baker a correspondent anxious for a special privilege said disconsolately in my hearing one day there were hours when it seemed like a gathering in the office of the old american magazine so natural and intimate it was but these hours were not very many my business was to furnish at least an article a month for the red cross magazine and to follow the progress of the efforts to bring about a peace settlement including a league of nations there were days when it seemed to me an inexplicable confusion a bedlam but as a matter of fact as the days went on i became satisfied by studying the communiques following the press conferences reading the reliable english and french papers and the daily digests of what the papers of the united states were saying posted at our press quarters that a practical plan for international cooperation was taking form and that gradually more and more of the delegates of the thirty-one nations represented were consenting to it to get something they would all sign seemed to me creative statesmanship of the highest order for each of these nations had problems of its own political economic social religious which must be considered before the representative dared sign thirty-one varieties of folks back home sat at that peace table and they all had to be heard in the final analysis it was the failure patiently to listen to the political objections coming from the united states and trying openly to meet them which kept us out of the largest and soundest joint attempt the world had ever seen to put an end to war for that is what i believed the covenant of the league of nations to be when i heard the final draft read and adopted at the plenary session of the conference on april twenty eighth but no one could have studied the truly august assembly adopting the covenant without realizing the threats to its future in its make-up they lay in the certainty of a few that the problem was solved there would be no more wars president wilson the noblest and most distinguished figure of them all seemed to believe it but there were men putting down their names who did not believe it who sneered as they signed and still more dangerous were the stolid ones who accepted without knowing what it meant clemenceau had told his people what the covenant meant sacrifices sacrifice for all he was the only man at the peace conference whom i heard use the word and yet the key to the peace of the world is sacrifice sacrifice of the strong to meet the needs and urges of the weak if the league of nations led as it has been by the great satisfied nations had grappled with that truth at the start it is possible we should not now be seeing signatories take up war to satisfy their needs and urges these doubts weighed heavily upon me as i left the plenary session but in the group of exultant americans who that day saw the world made over i had no desire to voice them there was only one of my friends to whom i could confide my fears that was Auguste Jacacci, a doubting Thomas with profound faith in some things. I never quite made out what. Beauty and a directing God, I think. The night after the signing of the covenant, Jack and I sat long in troubled silence over our coffee and petit verre, for neither of us could believe that the signing of a paper by however many nations could in itself bring immediate peace to the world still i believed with all my heart in the attempt 
my business now as a journalist and a lecturer i told myself was to explain the intent of the covenant what it set out to do also to warn that it must be given time to work out its salvation before leaving america for the peace conference i had signed a contract to go for ten weeks of the summer of nineteen nineteen on a chautauqua circuit in the northwest by this time i had an understanding with my sponsors that i should be allowed to talk on what i had seen and heard at the peace conference i now hurried home to fill that contract i had hardly landed before i realized how bitter was the political attack on the covenant would the audiences in the northwest listen to its defense but i did not allow this worry to intrude itself into my lecturing in fact it was not in me to worry once on the road for i quickly discovered i was making what would probably be the most interesting trip of my life and so it turned out the country was incredibly exciting and of endless variety i joined a circuit already ten weeks old in northern utah we skirted the great salt lake and traveled from one mormon settlement to another it amuses me now to remember how surprised i was to discover that mormons were like gentiles that i at once felt towards them exactly as i did towards different religious sects at home true the attempt of taxi drivers hotel clerks baggagemen to convert me when they caught me idle in their vicinity was a bit disconcerting at first but i soon began to expect it and to find interest in their arguments after utah came the lava country of southern idaho along the snake river we climbed over the mountains into oregon went down the columbia over the sea up the coast to portland tacoma seattle we were in the yakima apple country and in the berry fields of puyallup and everywhere in cherry orchards such cherries as i had never imagined for a week we junketed around vancouver sound in primitive little steamers we pitched our tents in lumber towns built on stilts crossed fire devastated mountains into the coeur d'alene region of northern idaho where one still hears reverberations of the labor struggles which had so agitated us on mcclure's and the american then montana miles of plateaus and plains the air thick with smoke the earth sprinkled with ashes for the mountains were on fire this magnificent and varied country carried with it a varied and compelling human story each new town turned up some bit of human tragedy or comedy these people were pioneers or pioneers once removed they knew all the dangers the hardships the defeats and conquests of pioneering their talk was of what they or their fathers had lived and seen whatever it had been their hope was unquenchable every town we entered was the finest in the northwest the finest even when you knew that shifting trade and industry was cutting the very feet out from under it this was the land of bora but never in all those ten weeks talking on the league of nations did i receive from press or individuals anything but respectful hearing i was the first person who had come into their territory from the peace conference and they wanted to hear all i had to give they would do their own appraising as the days went by i sensed a growing bewilderment at the fight against the league these people had listened for years to people they honored urging some form of international union against war they had heard dr jordan and jane adams preaching a national council for the prevention of war president taft advocating a league to enforce peace in many of the towns there had been chapters of these societies on our circuit there was a superintendent who reminded me every time we met that back in the eighteen nineties he had spent practically all his patrimony going about the northwest preaching a league of nations it irked him he said that i should be receiving money for talking what he twenty-five years before had talked without price purely for love of the cause and no wonder with such a background was it strange that many people in the northwest should have been puzzled that the congress of the united states was seemingly more and more determined that we should not join this first attempt of the civilized world to find substitutes for war in international quarrels 
seeking reasons for this refusal i felt the one which had most weight with people was the guarantee that france was asking from england and the united states to come to her aid in case of unprovoked attack by germany that is a guarantee which was to remain in force until the league of nations was a going concern i found that most people were against this they wouldn't run the risk of having to help france again i was for granting the guarantee provisionally and for a limited period i believed such a guarantee would quiet what i felt to be one of the real dangers of the after-war situation the near hysteria of france americans proud of their generous part in saving france from what looked to them like calculated annihilation said why these hysterics the war is over the nations are going to enforce peace the devastated region is to be restored at germany's expense forget it how could america understand the years of horror france had just suffered the devastation of centuries of loving labor the wiping out of three and a half million of her best youth and most serious of all perhaps how could america realize what france so clearly realized that the great war was but the latest expression of centuries of determination on the part of central europe to reach the sea it must have an ocean front even if this could be obtained only by crossing the dead body of france i had spent some hours at chalon sur marne just before i returned nobody in that town was so alive to me as attila fifteen hundred years before he had led the troops of central europe so far and had been stopped but central europe had come back again and again driven by the urge for the sea again and again france had saved herself but she knew now she could never do it without the help of those who believed her culture one of the earth's great possessions she must have guarantees but how could the united states understand that centuries of experience were behind france's fear they had not met attila at chalon sur marne i had all of this i talked in more or less detail until in midsummer my lips were closed for two weeks by william jennings bryan mr bryan for many years had been the brightest star of the chautauqua platform the management of the circuit liked to introduce him for whatever time he could give and they afford it meant that the regular performer must either step down or divide his period the evening was the proper hour for mr bryan for only then could the men come now i spoke in the evening cut your time to forty minutes and go on a half hour earlier were my instructions i of course obeyed now mr bryan was presenting a two-hour discussion of what he considered the ideal political democratic platform at that moment in his planks he included joining the league of nations but turning down the guarantees to france at our first joint appearance he rose to condemn guarantees an hour after i had pleaded for them when he was told of the conflict of opinion he at once looked me up and in effect told me that i must not present views opposed to his on a platform where he was speaking he in no way tried to influence my opinion only to shut it off i insisted that it was good for the audience to hear both sides the audience came to hear me said mr bryan it is important they know my views he did not want them confused as they might be he said if i began the evening by airing mine of course mr bryan did not say you are of no political importance and i am of a great deal but that was what he meant it was quite true and i bowed for the time being to the demands of politics but only for the moment the two weeks over i began again to talk guarantees with more interest on the part of my audience because of what mr bryan had been saying and also i suspect less agreement by the time the circuit ended the league was in a bad way in congress a bitter partisan war had broken out and woodrow wilson ill his scotch stubbornness the harder because of his illness would not budge an inch it was a sickening thing to watch the only consolation was that the rest of the world wanted peace enough to make the sacrifices and run the risks a league undoubtedly demanded 
wilson's enemies gloated he was beaten stripped of his glory the world would forget him was already forgetting him they were wrong in the months that followed the final collapse of the league as far as the united states was concerned i was much in washington and nothing i saw was more moving than the continual quiet popular tributes to woodrow wilson on holidays and sundays groups were always standing before his home watching for a glimpse of him let him enter a theatre and the house rose to cheer while crowds waited outside in rain and cold to see him come out cheer him as he passed on november eleventh nineteen twenty one the body of america's unknown soldier was carried from the capital where it had lain in state to its grave in arlington a perfect ceremony of its kind the bier was followed by all we had of official greatness at that moment president harding and his cabinet the supreme court the house the senate officers of the army and navy and general foch our guest of honor at the end following all this greatness but not of it came a carriage as the packed ranks between which the procession had passed in silence saw its occupants woodrow wilson and mrs wilson a muffled cry of love and gratitude broke out and that cry followed that carriage to the very doorway of their home it was to be so until he died he was the man they could not forget they will not forget him in the future he is the first leader in the history of society who has treated the ancient dream of a peaceful world as something more than wishful thinking the first who was willing to stake all in drawing the nations of the world together in an effort to make that just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations for which abraham lincoln pleaded in paris in nineteen nineteen woodrow wilson actually persuaded the leaders of the majority of the earth's nations to help him build and set up a machine for such a peace the complaint is that it has not done all it attempted but how can any person who knows anything of man's past efforts to create machinery for the betterment of his life suppose that this the most ambitious international undertaking ever made would from the start run without friction or breakdown would never need overhauling even rebuilding that is not in the nature of things the league has lived for eighteen years now its weaknesses have developed with experience so has its usefulness its services to the world have been innumerable if not spectacular if its failures have been spectacular they have not destroyed the structure rather they have demonstrated certain points at which it must be rebuilt the world will not forget the man who led in this effort to achieve enduring peace that is what i was saying in those bitter days and have been saying in all the melancholy ones since end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen part one of all in the day's work by ida tarbell the sleeper fox recording is in the public domain gambling with security my ten weeks of daily talking on the peace conference and the covenant of the league of nations ended the war for me also it forced me to consider anew the problem of security it was nearly four years now since i had put an end to it by severing my connection with the american magazine but the years had been so full of the war the scramble to do something that somebody thought was needful and at the same time to keep the pot boiling that i had not realized what had happened it meant for me as i now saw the end of an economic era i sat down to take stock here i was sixty-three with only a small accumulation of material goods i must work to live and satisfy my obligations to be sure i had my little home in connecticut which in the fifteen years since i had acquired it had not only grown increasingly dear to me it had also taken on an importance which i had not foreseen it had become the family home here my mother had come to pass the last summers before her death in nineteen seventeen here my niece esther had been married under the oaks 
here my niece clara and her husband tristram tupper battered by war service had come in nineteen nineteen to live in our little guest house here tris had written his first successful magazine story here their two children passed their first years nearby my sister had built herself a studio to become her home a hundred associations gave the place a meaning and dignity which i had never expected to feel in any home of my own something that comes only when a place has been hallowed by the joys and sorrows of family life i had carried out my original intention of never letting it become a financial burden so adrift as i now was i could not only afford my home but felt that it was the strongest factor in my scheme of security for here i knew i could retire and raise all the food i needed if freelancing petered out i was quite clear about the work i wanted to do it was to continue writing and speaking on the few subjects on which i felt strongly and of which i knew a little these subjects had made a pattern in my mind if men would work out this pattern i felt that they would go a long way towards ending the world's quarrels quieting its confusions first and most important were the privileges they had snatched i wanted to see them all gradually scrapped cost what it might economically they were a threat to honest men to sound industry to peaceful international life i wanted to help spread the knowledge of all the intelligent efforts within and without industry and government to put an end to militancy replace it with actual understanding and then i wanted to do my part towards making the world acquainted with the man who i believed had best shown how to carry out a program of cooperation based on consideration of others that was abraham lincoln there was a man i told myself who took the time to understand a thing before he spoke he knew that hurry acting before you were reasonably sure almost invariably makes a mess of even the best intentions he wanted to know what he was about before he acted also he wanted all those upon whom he must depend for results to know what he was about and why whatever he did he did without malice taking into account men's limitations not asking more from any one than he could give more than anybody i had studied he applied in public affairs frederick taylor's rules for achievement of which i have spoken above the more people who knew about lincoln the more chance democracy had to destroy its two chief enemies privilege and militancy i proposed to take every chance i had to talk about him this was the program on which i was so set that i was willing to follow it even if it did take away from me the comforts of a regular salary giving up the salary troubled me less than finding myself without the regular professional contacts which i had so enjoyed for twenty years and on which i found now i was free that i had come to depend more than i would have believed not belonging to an editorial group meant that when i dropped my pen at lunchtime i could no longer join a half-dozen office mates full of gossip of what the morning had brought the last tarkington manuscript something of willa cather's a letter from kipling that new person from louisville george madden martin with a real creation emmy lou that new person from wisconsin edna ferber with a bona fide human being in hand emma mcchesney or it might be dunn's last dooley or baker's last adventure in contentment or gossip from the last man in washington perhaps direct from the white house and always surely from our liberal friends in congress this was the stuff of our lunch-table talk we gloated or mourned and our eyes were always on what was coming rather than what had been i no longer had an office next door to these friends my study had become my workshop now i must pay my own secretary's bill my own telephone calls buy my own stationery i gasped when i found what these extras amounted to freedom i saw was going to be expensive as well as lonesome however for nineteen years i have kept to my decision how little i have contributed to my program in these nineteen years the chief piece of writing i plan to do i have never finished that was bringing the history of the standard oil company up to date 
i had dropped the story in nineteen o four but the dissolution of the company in nineteen eleven left me with the melancholy conviction that sooner or later i should have to estimate the trial and put down how the new setup was working i talked two or three times with george wickersham the attorney-general who brought the suit and he always cautioned me not to hurry to let the decision have a chance to work out i think we decided that about ten years would do it but the war put a different face on oil it suddenly became a matter for government control it was no longer a private business it was life and death for the allies oil was as necessary to them clemenceau wrote to wilson as the blood of men everything that rolled or sailed or flew must have it the great struggle of the nations with navies england at the head to command oil at its source followed the war the earth was ransacked for it in a terrific predatory hunt in this effort of the nations to command oil supplies great names arose challenging that of rockefeller sir henry detterding marcus samuel william knox darcy the standard oil company no longer ruled the oil world there were the royal dutch and the shell making up finally the royal dutch shell there was the anglo-persian all of the dramatic and frequently tragic goings-on had to settle down into something like orderly procedure before the history i had in mind could be written the time came along in nineteen twenty two when mr wickersham said you had better go at it but it was not mr wickersham's dictum that hurried me to undertake to tell the story of what had happened since nineteen o four it was an entirely unexpected piratical attack on the two-volume edition of the history which had been exhausted for some time my publisher wisely enough was waiting for the promised third volume before reprinting when it became known in the trade that the book was no longer on the market a report was spread that the standard oil company had bought and destroyed the plates and the price soared down in louisiana huey long paid one hundred dollars for a set so i was told as i frequently received inquiries as to where the books could be found or where a purchaser could be found for a set i turned the correspondence over to my secretary a canny woman who established a trading relation with a dealer in old books and the two of them were in a fair way to do a nice little business when their hopes were blasted by the appearance in a new york bookstore of an entirely new edition of the work a cheap edition selling for five or six dollars my publishers made an immediate investigation and found that it had been printed in england probably from german plates as the third volume was not ready there was nothing for the publisher to do but reprint the two which he very promptly did on the appearance of the reprint the pirated edition disappeared from the market this episode set me to work promptly at the third volume but i needed a financial backer if the work was to be put through promptly i found it unexpectedly in the editor-in-chief for whom the first two volumes had been written s s mcclure mcclure's magazine which had been suspended for a few years had been revived mr mcclure in charge he felt that bringing standard oil history up to date was a logical and might be an important feature for the periodical for me there was satisfaction in trying to revive the old editorial relations i had always missed the gaiety and excitement mr mcclure gave to work and too i had always felt a little anxious about what i suspected was happening to him in a group which even if it was made up of the very best of the town men and women of ability and loyalty naturally eager to prove that they could make a mcclure's magazine as good as ever had been made or better could not i was convinced understand mr mcclure get out of him what he had to give like his old partner and friend john s phillips so i was willing to give all i had to help in the revival of the old periodical i had my book well in hand some twenty thousand words written when the new mcclure's was suspended and the third volume on the standard oil company was cast out before publication had begun perhaps it was just as well both for mcclure's and for me repeating yourself is a doubtful practice particularly for editor and writer 
i feel now there was no hope of my recapturing the former interest in the former way the result would have smelt a bit musty indeed though i hate to admit it i think there has been a slight mustiness about all i have done in the nineteen years since i started on my own that is not on assignment built as it has been on work done before the great war left with twenty thousand words on hand and no editor i was obliged to make a quick turn in the interest of security and took on the first piece of work that offered for one reason or another i have never been able to return to that third volume and it looks now as if it were a piece of work for my ninth decade since it failed to mature in the seventh and eighth if i failed to carry out my plan for tracing the manoeuvres of the master monopoly after the government had taken it apart in nineteen eleven and after it adapted itself to the new and extraordinary situations forced by the great war i did trace what could be done in a corporation whose parts all had been built more or less on privilege and which itself enjoyed high tariff protection when a man took hold of it who believed that ordinary ethics did apply to business this study was shaped around the life of judge elbert h gary it was no idea of mine this life of gary and when it was proposed to me by that energetic and resourceful editor rutger jewett i promptly said no but mr jewett was insistent he had talked the matter over with judge gary who had told him he would open his records and answer my questions if i would do the book that meant i supposed that he had confidence in my ability to be fair-minded whatever my suspicions his judgment was formed on my handling of certain efforts to improve and humanize the conditions of labor in the mills factories and towns of the united states steel corporation the corporation under his direction had been a pioneer in safety and sanitation work it had developed a pension system improved communities improved its housing built schools and hospitals where there was no community to take care of these needs it was the broadest soundest record that i had found in my gathering of material for the articles the american magazine had published under the title of the golden rule in business i knew from my talks with judge gary that there was nothing going on in the steel corporation in which he was more deeply interested moreover i knew he was a man i could talk with freely more than once when he as spokesman of the corporation was under attack for arbitrary dealings with labor i had gone to him for his side of the case and although i might not agree and frequently did not i always came away enlightened and with a rather humiliated feeling that i had shown myself an amateur in conversation where he was very much the expert but was i equal to finding out the truth of things in this enormous industrial labyrinth which he ruled moreover if judge gary had been an industrial plunderer would i be willing so to present him i had no heart for a repetition of my experience with h h rogers another reason for hesitation was that i knew if i did undertake it and was as fair as i knew how to be i should at once be under suspicion by groups with whose intentions for the most part i sympathized they were unwilling to consider gary in any light save that of scapegoat number one an attack yes they would welcome it an attempt to set down his business life as he had actually lived it no that was whitewashing finally i took the matter to judge gary himself i do not know that i want to write your life i told him if i find practices which seem to me against public policy as i understand it i shall have to say so i appreciate your efforts to make working conditions for labor as good as you know how to make them but it does not follow that i can stand for your financial policies it is not your humanitarianism but your ethics i suspect well judge gary laughed if you can find anything wrong in our doings i want to know it i had george wickersham in here for a year or more going over the whole setup, telling me what he thought we ought not to do and i followed every suggestion he made the government has had its agency here for two years examining our books and they gave us a clean bill of health the supreme court has refused to declare us a monopoly in restraint of trade do your worst and if you find anything wrong i shall be grateful 
i felt more of an amateur than ever after that i also concluded that it would be sheer cowardice on my part to refuse the job which i really needed i had not been long at my task however before i was heartened by the certainty that from the formation of the corporation judge gary had made a steady and surprisingly successful fight to strip the businesses which he was putting together of certain illegal privileges as well as to set up an entirely new code of fair practices the gary code it was jeeringly called in wall street orders went out neither to ask nor to accept special favors from the railroads full yearly reports of the financial condition of the corporation whether good or bad were sent out these reports reached the public as early as they did the directors themselves putting an end to the advance information which many insiders were accustomed to using for stock selling or buying various forms of predatory competition were attacked from the inside judge gary not only laid down his code he followed it up preached it zealously to his board another unheard-of innovation was his support of president theodore roosevelt's attempt to control business it had become an axiom of big business to fight every effort of the government to inspect or regulate when gary took the opposite course applauded roosevelt's efforts declared that he was doing business good doing him good he was treated as a traitor by many colleagues well this seemed to me as good business doctrine as i had come across in any concern much better more definite and practical as a matter of fact than i got from most corporation critics but how far was this followed up in practice before i was through i made up my mind that judge gary's code was applied just as completely and as rapidly as he could persuade or drive his frequently doubting and recalcitrant associates to it but that took time took frequent battles indeed more than once he had come close to losing his official head fighting for this or that plank in his platform the gary code and the effort to put it into practice reconciled me to my task judge gary was an easy man to work with because he was so interested in following his own story he had been too busy all his life to give attention to the route by which he had come now he enjoyed the looks back finding that he was willing to take literally his promise to open records and answer questions i laid out a little plan for covering his life chronologically it pleased him for he was the most systematic of men it gave him delight to remember how a man's mind unravels he exclaimed one day when he had suddenly recalled something long forgotten our interviews were carried on always at seventy one broadway he kept his appointments exactly rarely did he keep me waiting and if by necessity he did he always apologized if i came late i was made to feel clearly that that was a thing not to be done while judge gary was prepared to be frank in his talks with me he was not prepared to be misquoted he evidently had learned that even with the best intentions a reporter may distort what a man has said out of all resemblance to what he meant he guarded against this by always having at our interviews a secretary who took down in shorthand all that he said all that i said i made longhand notes dictating them as soon as i went back to my desk i do not remember that a question of misunderstanding of meaning ever came up convinced that the gary code was genuine not mere window dressing for the public nothing interested me more than how a man in his fifties who had been for twenty years a successful corporation lawyer was willing to preach to wall street as he had done i finally concluded the truth to be that albert gary had never outgrown his early bringing up he had never gotten over a belief in the soundness of what he had learned in sunday school and of what later he had taught through most of his manhood in sunday school the difference between him and some of his fellows in business brought up in the same way was that he insisted that the sunday school precepts of honesty consideration for others fair play should be preached on weekdays as well as sundays in the boardroom as well as the church if he ever sensed that his preaching was both comic and irritating to wall street which i doubt 
he never gave sign of such a perception i soon found that i need not hesitate to bring him all sorts of criticisms of his doings as i unearthed them in studying the public's reaction to the steel corporation's operations they never fretted or irritated him rather he enjoyed analyzing them for my benefit he never dismissed radical opinions as nonsense in the year i was working with him there was never a public radical meeting in new york and there were a good many of them that year that he did not read all the speeches and comment on them intelligently and with good humor we must know about these things he said we must know all about lenin all about mussolini they are great forces they are trying new forms of government his knowledge prevented him from being scared above all gary enjoyed stories of his struggles to establish his own preeminence and his own code in the steel corporation at the start he had several of the strong men in the corporation against him but he had won out and it gave him the greatest satisfaction to show me letters of congratulation to quote former opponents as saying you were right i was wrong particularly he enjoyed the very good terms on which he stood with theodore roosevelt whose unpopularity in wall street surpassed even that of the second roosevelt he still talked with emotion of the decision of the government to bring suit against the steel corporation under the sherman law he thought he had satisfied it that the steel corporation was not a monopoly in restraint of trade that it was what mark twain called a good trust and when the attorney general's office decided that there might be a question about the quality of this goodness gary was terribly disturbed there were advisers who thought he ought to try to settle the suit outside but he would not have it so the government had doubts and he must satisfy them he believed that the law did not apply to the steel corporation he believed that the corporation was not contrary to a sound business policy a menace to the country that must be settled once for all of course he was jubilant over the outcome it justified his conviction judge gary had done a great job and he knew it but interestingly enough it never made him pompous as a matter of fact he was simple natural in talking about it along with this really simple enjoyment of his own conflict he had a nice kind of dignity and a carefulness of conduct which were not entirely natural to him to be sure he had always been a good methodist a good citizen a hard-working lawyer but at the same time in all these earlier years he had led what was then called a gay life he had liked a fast horse liked to hunt and see the world he was curious about all kinds of human performances looked into them whenever he had the chance when he became the head of the steel corporation he could no longer sing in the choir he had to go to the opera and sit in a box he no longer drove fast horses he wanted to fly and the board of the steel corporation passed an ordinance against it too dangerous when he travelled it was more or less in state and he couldn't slip out with a crowd of men at the stopping places to see the town it was hard on him but he felt deeply that he owed it to the steel corporation to be above reproach not a little of this carefulness was due i think to the effect on the public the exhibits that several of the new steel men had made of themselves after the corporation was formed in nineteen o one and their offices were centred in new york they were rich beyond their wildest dreams the restrictions of the home towns were gone and they broke loose in a riotous celebration which scandalized even mr morgan gary joined in nothing which approached orgies he was too hard a worker and always had been and he saw with distress the effect the high living of certain of the steel men was having on the public it was a danger he felt equal to the speculation in steel stock by officers of the corporation to counteract it he gradually became more and more a model of correctness i came out of my task with a real liking for judge gary and a profound conviction that industry has not produced one in our time who so well deserves the title of industrial statesman but i had to pay for saying what i thought 
under the heading of the taming of ida m tarbell my favorite newspaper declared that i had become a eulogist of the kind of man to whom i was sworn as an eternal enemy but judge gary was not the kind of captain of industry to which i objected on the contrary he was a man who at the frequent risk of his position and fortune had steadily fought many of the privileges and practices to which i had been objecting however one is judged largely by the company one keeps judge gary belonged to an industrial world where the predatory the brutal the illegal the reckless speculator constantly forced public attention that there was another side to that world a really honest and intelligent effort in the making to put an end to these practices few knew or knowing acknowledged i could not complain i knew how it would be when i started but i must confess that more than once while i was carrying on my work i shivered with distaste at the suspicion i knew i was bringing on myself the only time in my professional life i feel i deserve to be called courageous was when i wrote the life of judge gary end of chapter eighteen part one chapter eighteen part two of all in the day's work by ida tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain gambling with security my active interest in the industrial life of the country brought me unexpected adventures the most instructive as well as upsetting was serving on a couple of those government conferences which twentieth-century presidents have used so freely in their attempts to solve difficult national problems an industrial conference called by president wilson for the fall of nineteen nineteen was the first of these mr wilson felt clearly at the end of the war that our immediate important domestic problem was to establish some common ground of agreement and action in the conduct of industry what he wanted evidently was a covenant by which employer and employee could work out their common problems as cooperators not as enemies there was a need of action as any one who remembers those days will agree the whole labor world was in an uproar and one of the periodical efforts to organize the steel industry was under way mr gompers the head of the american federation sponsoring the strike had little or no sympathy with the contest at the moment but had been pushed into it by the adroitness of the radical elements boring from within throughout the war these disturbances must not go on it should be possible to make plans for a peaceful solution mr wilson said and so a conference was called in spite of my refusal to serve on his tariff commission president wilson had evidently not given me up as a matter of fact our acquaintance and mutual confidence had grown during the war he now named me as one of four women representatives the others being lillian wald head of the nurses settlement in new york city gertrude barnum assistant director of the investigation service of the united states department of labor and sarah conboy of the textile workers union the conference was an impressive and exciting body of some fifty persons divided into three groups representing the public labor the employers i of course sat in the first group where i found as my colleagues a bewildering assortment of men from various ranks of life there were dr charles elliot charles edward russell john d rockefeller jr judge gary john spargo bernard baruch thomas l chadburn jr and a score or more less known to the public though not necessarily less influential at the head of the labor group was samuel gompers among his colleagues were some of the most experienced labor leaders in the country the members of the employer group were chosen from among men who had been particularly helpful in directing their industries during the war there were many interesting characters on the body two that i particularly enjoyed were henry endicott who the johnsons had established the famous shoe towns near binghamton new york and a delightfully pungent character from georgia fuller e calloway who in twenty years had built up from scratch mills and a village with homes and schools 
everything to give life and a chance to hard-working mill people mr calloway's story of what he had done in georgia was one of the very few joyous contributions to a gathering doomed to be a dismal failure a body could have scarcely had a heartier welcome from the public than we did people seemed to feel that we should find a way to end the fighting that was what we were there for secretary of labor wilson told us in his keynote speech if we could produce a document which would secure the right of all those concerned in an industry it would find a place in the hearts of men like the magna carta the bill of rights the declaration of independence the constitution of the united states and the emancipation proclamation he brought us all to our feet all save a few who were too interested in political strategy to entertain a higher purpose we were there to plan for the future of industry but almost at once we discovered that it was not peace or the future of industry that was in mr gomper's mind also we discovered that the master politician of the body was mr gomper's we were hardly organized before he called upon us to appoint a committee to report on the steel strike dr charles elliot outraged rose in all his very genuine majesty and reminded the body that we were not there to attend to the troubles of the present but to plan that such troubles might be avoided in the future but the steel strike was on the table and we left it there when we disbanded a menace and an irritation it was not mr gomper's resolution however which ruined the conference it was the inability of the representatives of labor and employers to agree on a definition for collective bargaining the conference as a whole contended that such a definition must be a leading plank in the platform we were there to make but there were to be many other planks committees were at once formed to frame them almost every member of the conference too had some particular resolution that he wanted to incorporate i know i did but most of us never found an opportunity to present our notions collective bargaining and what it meant were always getting in our way the employer group and a considerable number of the public group believed that the definition which the labor group offered meant a closed shop judge gary openly charged this but labor was quite as strong in its suspicion that the definition which came from the employer group encouraged company unions at that moment flourishing in numbers that alarmed them suspicion governed both groups this went on for two weeks then secretary lane the acting chairman of the conference appealed to a very sick president and from his bed woodrow wilson begged us not to allow division on one point to destroy our opportunity at a time when the nations of the world are endeavoring to find a way of avoiding international war he wrote are we to confess that there is no method to be found for carrying on industry except in the spirit and with the very method of war must suspicion and hatred and force rule us in civil life are our industrial leaders and our industrial workers to live together without faith in each other constantly struggling for advantage over each other doing naught but what is compelled my friends this would be an intolerable outlook a prospect unworthy of the large things done by this people in the mastering of this continent indeed it would be an invitation to national disaster from such a possibility my mind turns away for my confidence is abiding that in this land we have learned how to accept the general judgment upon matters that affect the public weal and this is the very heart and soul of democracy but it was too late the labor body walked out except a few railroad men wise and experienced in negotiations a group of employers followed them it was defeat there was nothing for the president to do but disband the conference he did ask however that the public group of some twenty-five carry on now this group included a number of extraordinarily able men from them had come some of the wisest and broadest suggestions that had been placed before the conference they could have presented an impressive program but they had been outmaneuvered they lost heart 
they refused to go on the only remarks i made at that conference bewildered as i had been by the political manoeuvring were when i saw the public group prepared for the cowardly business of denying the president's request let us stick to it do our best make some report i pleaded but i do not think anybody heard me i had an impression as i talked that most of them were calculating when they could get a train to new york my next adventure in government service came two years later as a member of president harding's unemployment conference the country had been caught in the first great post-war depression and nobody was ready for it nobody knew indeed how widespread the unemployment was mr harding called a conference to deal with the problem without attempting to find out the result was that on one hand you had an opposition belittling the numbers on the other hand you had the responsible sponsors of the conference probably exaggerating them nobody knew and how easy it would have been to find out by the same method the country had used in the war when by a cooperative effort the number of draftable men was counted in twenty-four hours at a limited expense this was an impressive conference because of the make-up and it was a mighty well-conducted conference the chairman secretary of commerce hoover kept it in hand from the start and this in spite of the fact that there were all the elements of conflict found in the industrial conference and some extra for here we had rivalry between the labor groups themselves particularly that thorny problem of trade jurisdiction but mr hoover was enormously skillful and we came out with a program which if it had been carried out with the machinery which the conference devised would have brought the country to nineteen twenty nine in a very different state of preparedness after our dismissal i put together in a lecture what i conceived to be the practical conclusion of the conference as my text i used one of the first principles laid down the time to act is before a crisis becomes inevitable this text was an official and authoritative recognition of the unpalatable fact that business always moves in cycles that a boom will be followed by a slump that common sense demands preparedness how prepare the federal government state county community down to the smallest was to have in reserve plans and money for work it wanted done that was not absolutely essential at the moment when a slump started this reserve was to be called out private industry was by no means let off in good times it was to lay up a surplus with which to keep plants and laboratory alive and ready for action as soon as there was a return of orders the employee was to be protected by employment insurance the individual householder was to keep back certain needed repairs and improvements for the day of need that is everybody was to be ready with his life preserver for two years i talked with the conviction of one who has a scheme he believes sound and i was listened to with more or less enthusiasm until it was obvious the slump was passing it was a bad dream well over good times had come why lay plans for the future by nineteen twenty six there were no longer audiences to listen to a talk on preparing for unemployment apparently everybody even president hoover who had been the all-efficient chairman of the conference forgot all about the program on the whole my little excursions into public service were discouraging and disillusioning but they did convince me that i was right when i gave as one of my reasons for not going on to president wilson's tariff commission the fact that i was not fitted for the kind of work a commission or conference requires i was an observer a reporter what interested me was watching my fellow members in action the silent wariness of secretary hoover the amused and slightly contemptuous smile of charlie schwab when he heard a woman had been put on the coal committee the unwillingness of representatives of rival mining unions to do anything to relieve the immediate suffering of west virginia miners sufferings so useful in their campaigns the stubborn look on the faces of those who fought over jurisdiction in an effort to reach an adjustment which would permit hungry men to take up work waiting for them the quick political line-up 
the clever political plays the gradual fade-out of the objective its replacement by party ambitions altogether it was a revealing study of the reason there is so little steady progress in the world these failures joined to the refusal to have anything to do with the league of nations put an end to my hope that the war had taught us much of anything we were not ready for the sacrifices necessary for peace nor had we grasped the natural methods by which things grow we believed we could talk petition legislate vote ourselves into peace and prosperity we had not learned that toil and self-control are three-fourths of any achievement and that toil and self-control begin with the individual i went on with my talking in these years with a troubled mind continue this way and we would destroy democracy we had allowed often encouraged groups of self-interested individuals to have their way that meant transformations in government machinery new types of leaders a multiplication of the children of privilege we had always so feared the substitution of humanitarianism for ethics sympathy for justice i was discouraged but i never lost faith in our scheme of things i never came to believe that we must change democracy for socialism or communism or a dictatorship you do not change human nature by changing the machinery under freedom human nature has the best chances for growth for correcting its weaknesses and failures for developing its capacities it is on these improvements in men that the future welfare of the world depends so i believed and so i argued as i went about though sometimes i confess with a spirit so low that my tongue was in my cheek such was my growing disillusionment when in nineteen twenty six i was asked to go to italy to report on the fascist state of benito mussolini now four years in power a scandal to the democracies at which he openly jeered but an even greater one to the socialists and communists who once had thought him on the way to being the strongest radical leader in europe i knew little of what had gone on in italy after the end of the war i knew the parliamentary system had broken down i knew there had been two years of guerrilla warfare after the peace conference a period in which it was nip and tuck whether the next ruler of italy would be communist or fascist the fascists under their leader mussolini had won out i had been amazed and had never ceased to be amazed that the dramatic march on rome which ended in changing a parliamentary form of government into a dictatorship had been carried out without bloodshed an astonished world had seen tens of thousands of unorganized and in part unarmed men march from every point in italy to rome call for mussolini get him by order of the king and then march home again not a brick thrown not a head broken it was the most amazing transfer of government i had known of but i had never given much attention to what had followed i had never asked myself if it was inevitable that a dictator should arise in italy i had never asked who was this man mussolini or what was this corporate state which was emerging uneasy as i was over the way things were going in the united states i vaguely felt when i was asked to go look all this up that possibly there were lessons there possibly i might learn something from italy's experience about the process by which manacles are put on free government however the real reason i went to italy was because i was offered so large a sum that i thought i could not afford to refuse my friends did their best to discourage my going down in washington a worried undersecretary who gave me my passport and letters of introduction told me pessimistically that i probably should be arrested but why i asked well that is what is happening now to all our americans they drink too much talk too much the chief reason as far as we can make out is that they have to arrest them because they are attacking the government we do the same thing here now and then you know in paris my best friends among them mr giacacci so much of an italian that he talked the dialects of several provinces told me with all seriousness that i should be searched i must not carry letters to members of the opposition 
nor books hostile to mussolini now i was armed with things of that sort collected in washington new york and paris i did not propose to give them up without a struggle i was told i should find no newspapers excepting those sympathetic to the regime a serious handicap as i always count largely on newspapers i must always use the fascist salute i took this so seriously that i practised it in my paris bedroom i must not speak french i was counting on that as i speak no italian that is i started off to italy with a large collection of don'ts coming from people i considered informed if i had not had a natural dislike of giving up an undertaking i never would have carried out my assignment however at the end of the first day in rome a very exciting day i awakened to the fact that nobody had searched my bags for incriminating documents that i had talked french all day and that i hadn't noticed anybody using the fascist salute and most important that i had found at every newspaper kiosk all the french and english papers side by side with the italian it gave me confidence as a matter of fact in the four to five months that i was in italy i did practically what i had planned to do and nobody paid any attention to me my mail was never interfered with so far as i know that is none of the dire prophecies of interference to which i had listened at the start came true i do not mean to say it was always easy to get to the people with whom i wanted to talk more than once when i succeeded i found the person fearful of quotation i do not mean to say that i found no revolts down in palermo in the corners of milan and florence and turin as a matter of fact almost everywhere i ran across bitter critics of the new regime such as i hear every day in this year of nineteen thirty eight of the president of the united states but on the whole even good parliamentarians were accepting mussolini he has saved the country men told me we don't accept his methods we don't believe in dictatorship but it is better than anarchy making my headquarters at rome i went over the country fairly well particularly the industrial sections i visited turin with its hydroelectric developments its great fiat factory its artificial silk all plants of the first order i spent some days in milan visited the great pirelli plant at the moment making underground cables for chicago i saw what was left of the cooperatives at bologna i climbed into that plucky little independent republic of san marino mussolini had been there just before i arrived they were all for him he worked and made people work that is what had made san marino i went south into calabria over into sicily always looking for the effects of the new regime on the life of the people there was no doubt sensible things were going on redemption of land extension of water power amazing efforts at wheat production and the people were accepting the regime with understanding realists that they were the first thing that springs to my mind now when i recall those months in italy is a long procession of men women and children bent in labor they harvested fields of rice wheat alfalfa laying grain in perfect swathes they sat on the ground stripping and sorting tobacco leaves tiny girls old women crowded narrow rooms embroidering with sure fingers lovely designs on linen fine and coarse they cooked their meals before all the world in the narrow streets of naples they carried home at sunset from the terraces or slopes of mountains great baskets of grapes olives lemons young women straight and firm their burdens poised surely on their heads old women bent under the weight on their backs they drove donkeys so laden that only a nodding head a switching tail were visible they filled the roads with their gay two-wheeled carts tended sheep ran machines sat in markets spun weaved moulded built a world of work mingled with these pictures of labor were equally vagrant ones of these same men and women at play holiday and sunday crowds filling the streets the roads the cinemas the dancing pavilions the squares of little towns that traced their history back clearly more than two thousand years 
in those squares gay with flags and streamers and lights and booths in the evenings throngs held their breath as to the notes of soft music the lithe figures of the rope walkers passed high overhead with slow and rhythmic steps it was hard to realize when i looked on them that six years earlier these same people had been as badly out of step as they were perfectly in step at the present moment that instead of rhythmic labor there was a clash of disorder and revolt men and women refused not only to work themselves but to let other people work grain died in the fields threshing machines were destroyed factories were seized shops were looted railway trains ran as suited the crew sunday was a day not of rest amusement prayer but of war fetes were dangerous liable to be broken up by raids instead of the steady balance orderly action so conspicuous to-day were the disorganization anger violence of a people unprotected in its normal life a people become the prey of a dozen clashing political parties and not knowing where to look for a moses to lead it out of their egypt how could it be one asked that in so brief a time a people should drop its clubs and pick up its tools there was only one answer mussolini already he was a legend a name everywhere to conjure with i used it myself after i had talked with him on scared gentlemen to whom i had letters of introduction and who feared quotation but mussolini saw me talked with me nothing too much trouble after that but what kind of man was this dictator you must go and see mussolini our able and friendly ambassador henry p fletcher told me one morning while i was working on the embassy's voluminous records of what had gone on in italy since the end of the war i balked i am not ready with the questions i want to ask him oh said mr fletcher just go down and have a chat with him with my notion of mussolini gathered largely from english and american as well as hostile italian sources the word seemed utterly incongruous could one chat with this bombastic and terrifying individual who never listened told you what to think to say impossible but of course i went the most exciting and interesting hour and a half i spent in italy was in an anteroom watching two score or more persons who were waiting to be received watching them go in so scared come out exultant go in inflated come out collapsed there was no one of them but was anxious even the admiral of the fleet then at ostia he walked nervously about while he was waiting adjusting his uniform and when his turn came strode in as if marching in a parade nothing i saw in italy as i have said was more interesting to me though i must confess that all the time there was an undercurrent of nervousness what i was afraid of was that my french would go to pieces provided he gave me a chance to speak at all of which i had a doubt what if i should forget and say vous instead of votre excellence should i be shot at sunrise it was all so different from what i had anticipated i must have misread and misheard the reports of interviews to have had such an unpleasant impression of what was waiting me as i crossed the long room towards the desk mussolini came around to meet me asked me to take one of the two big chairs which stood in front of his desk and as he seated me was apologizing actually apologizing in excellent english for keeping me waiting as he did it i saw that he had a most extraordinary smile and that when he smiled he had a dimple nothing could have been more natural simple and courteous than the way he put me at my ease his french in which he spoke after his first greeting was fluent excellent i found myself not at all afraid to talk eager to do so if he had not been as eager i think i should have done all the talking for luckily at once we hit on a common interest better housing his smiling face became excited and stern he pounded the table men and women must have better places in which to live you cannot expect them to be good citizens in the hovels they are living in in parts of italy 
he went on to talk with appreciation and understanding of the various building undertakings already well advanced some of which i had seen in different parts of the country he talked at length of the effect on women of crowded cheerless homes a reason for their drinking too much wine sometimes he mused he was particularly interested in what prohibition was doing to working people in the united states i am dry he said but i would not have italy dry sec and he amused me by quickly changing sec to sesh we need wine to keep alive the social sense in our hard-working people altogether it was an illuminating half-hour and when mussolini accompanied me to the door and kissed my hand in the gallant italian fashion i understood for the first time an unexpected phase of the man which makes him such a power in italy he might be was i believed a fearful despot but he had a dimple i left italy my head alive with speculations as to the future of the man there was a chance and it seemed to me a very good one that he would be assassinated three dramatic attempts were made on his life while i was there attempts known to the public there may have been others the authorities kept quiet as i was sailing there came a rash attack on him at bologna the assassin being torn to pieces so it was said by an enraged crowd for months after my return i watched my morning paper for the headline mussolini assassinated of course there was a chance so far as i could see it was what mussolini himself believed he could realize to bring italy to an even keel economically by thrift hard work development of resources and by a system of legitimate colonization in the parts of the earth where he could obtain land by treaty or by purchase and there was a third possibility to one at all familiar with the course of dictators in the world particularly with the one with whom you instinctively compare mussolini napoleon bonaparte that the day would come when he would overreach himself in a too magnificent attempt an attempt beyond the forces of his country and so of himself and he would finally go down as napoleon went down our ethiopia and the alliance with franco and the rebels of spain to be to mussolini what spain and russia were to napoleon i was glad to breathe the air of the united states it was still free whatever our follies there was at that moment no dictator in sight no talk of one but it was not mussolini or the corporate state which mattered to us it was what was back of them why had parliamentary government broken down in italy the italy of garibaldi of cavour victor emmanuel why had a dictator been able to replace it with a new form of government could this happen in the government of washington and lincoln those were the questions of importance to americans there was where there was something to learn end of chapter eighteen part two Chapter Nineteen of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Looking over the country, my chief consolation in what I looked on as the manhandling of democratic ideals and processes in all ranks of society, public and private, was Abraham Lincoln. In spite of his obvious limitations and mistakes, he had won the biggest battle for freedom we have yet to fight he had done it by taking time to figure things out by sticking to the conclusions he had reached so long as and no longer than they seemed to him sound by squaring his conduct always with what he conceived to be just moral principles the more i knew of him the better i liked him and the more strongly i felt that we ought as a people to know about how he did things not ask how he would solve a problem tormenting us but how he would go to work to solve it feeling as i did and do about him i have kept him always on my workbench there has never been a time since the war that i have not had a long or short piece of lincoln work on hand the result has been five books big and little and a continuous stream of articles long and short 
the only fresh water in this lincolnian stream was in a book i called in the footsteps of the lincolns beginning with the first of the family in this country samuel who came in sixteen thirty seven i traced them mile by mile from hingham massachusetts where samuel started down through massachusetts new jersey pennsylvania the shenandoah valley the wilderness of kentucky southwestern indiana into illinois to the final resting place i ran down the records that had been left behind copied the inscriptions on gravestones went over houses in which they had lived looked up the families into which they had married the friends they had made when i finished my journey i felt that i had quite definitely and finally rescued the lincolns from the ranks of poor white trash where political enemies had so loved to place them i have the satisfaction of knowing that this seven generation pilgrimage of the lincoln family has been added to the itineraries which enthusiastic students include in the cult of lincoln now growing so strong in this country i have never had an honor which pleased me more than a certificate from this group naming me lincoln pilgrim number one my conviction that we needed in all our difficulties to familiarize ourselves with good models sound laboratory practices led me to publish in nineteen thirty two a life of owen d young mr young had impressed me as being just what i called him a new type of industrial leader and how we needed one i had first heard of him in connection with what was called the president's second industrial conference after what i regarded as the cowardly retreat of the members of the president's first conference mr wilson had called a second with the same objective a distinguished body of men among them owen d young the sessions of this conference were all secret a contrast to the noisy publicity which had surrounded the first gathering and which had been partly responsible for its failure the political-minded conferees being able in this way to speak to the country when they made speeches to their fellows a privilege they valued more than trying to understand and cooperate with their fellows it was not long before i began to hear rumors of the satisfactory way the second conference was going and to hear the name of owen d young as the man who as much as anybody else was leading to a broad fair program of recommendations his fairness based on his experience in industrial relations came as a surprise to not a few of the members of the conference for mr young represented the general electric company secretary wilson who was then at the head of the federal labor department declared that mr young had no fear and no prejudice as a conferee that he worked with an open mind attorney general gregory said of him that there was no man on the conference who was so progressive in his philosophy of industrial relations these opinions from the inside of the conference followed by its admirable published report with which i learned mr young had had much to do set me to following his work in labor matters so far as it reached the public i was deeply impressed by the showing he made as a negotiator on the dawes and young committees called to settle the thorny problem of what reparations germany should make to the allies the first sitting in nineteen twenty four and the second in nineteen twenty nine mr young being the chairman of the latter he proved himself a negotiator of unusual quality he knew the facts he kept his head under all circumstances he had the warmest kind of human sympathies as well as what one of his colleagues called a superior emotional sensitiveness which made him steer clear of danger points before anybody else realized that they were near such were the qualities i told myself needed in a leader to handle the infinitely difficult tangle in labor relations that was more and more disturbing industry all i could do was to say so in print and that i tried to do in a book that came out in nineteen thirty two and had the misfortune to collide with a presidential boom for mr young which misguided friends were cooking up contrary to his wishes it was the last thing that he wanted he had the good sense to see that there were vastly important things for the good of the public to be done inside his industry he wanted to go on with them he was doing a good job and should have been left with it i felt 
but numbers of admirers and interested politicians continued to cry for him for president until finally mr young came out flat-footed to say that under no circumstances would he accept a nomination but here was my book coming out while this outcry was going on and naturally enough political-minded reviewers took it as intended for a campaign biography the point i had been trying to make that here was somebody with rare ability to lead in the labor struggle was entirely lost i still believe that if we could have had him active in these past years so disheartening for peaceful industrial relations the years which have set back so far the hope of genuine understanding cooperation inside industry we should have been saved the peck of trouble that we are now in it was out of the stuff gathered in these various undertakings that i was depending for security but the return from the books and articles of a freelance is more or less uncertain particularly when they come in so sober a form as mine and are always shaped to fit a self-made pattern i saw that i must have an annual sure if modest money crop and i found it from nineteen twenty four on in lyceum work my two seasons on the chautauqua platform had encouraged the lecture bureau to add me to its list of talent and it was arranged that i go out from four to six weeks a year beginning around lincoln's birthday when dinners and celebrations called for speakers and running on into march usually five engagements a week the local committees choosing the subject from the half dozen i offered these bookings covered the country from north to south and east to west long and erratic journeys frequently i occupied two different beds a night and now and then three it was brutal exhaustive business but i learned to climb into an upper berth without a fuss to sleep on a bench if there was no berth to rejoice over a cup of hot coffee at an all-night workman's lunch counter to warm my feet by walking a platform while waiting for a train by the end of the first season i had developed a stoical acceptance of whatever came this i argued saved nervous wear and tear i think now a certain amount of indignant protest useless as it would have been might have put more zest into my travel as well as my talking it was not only hard but lonesome business from the day i started out i felt myself a detached wanderer one who had laid aside personality and become a cog in the mechanism called a lecture bureau my one ambition was to fill the specifications of the schedule and have it over with it was not until i said good-bye to the last committee and was headed home that i felt the joyful rush of reviving personality this is putting an unfair face on my experiences these long railroad journeys these nights waiting in dreary stations were not without their rewards i carry no more beautiful pictures in my mind than those flashed on me riding across this country glittering snow mountains with stars hanging over them as big as a moon miles of blossoming red buds rising from the mist along an oklahoma stream the lovely rounded forms of the ozark mountains stretched as in sleep across missouri amethyst deserts endless rolling prairies yellow with wheat or white with snow these journeys took me at one time or another into every state in the union and there is no one of them in which some bit of remembered beauty does not take the curse off the almost universal disorder even squalor of their towns and cities as i saw them going in and out by rail these long rides these night waits brought unforgettable looks into human lives strange how travellers will confide their ambitions unload their secrets show their scars to strangers never have i been more convinced of the supreme wisdom of the confessional of the catholic church than by the confidences poured into my ears in these brief and accidental meetings memorable and poignant though these experiences are of the country's beauty as well as of its human tragedy and comedy they are little more than a blur the rapid and crowded succession of events left no time to follow up 
digest get at the meaning the solution this was particularly tantalizing when it came to the actual filling of the engagement for here you were for a time in close contact with a few people your committee and you had an hour or more facing an audience representative of a community the committee represented authority it was my business to follow its instructions please it if i could its chairman was the first person i sought on arrival that is the first after checking up on how and when i was to get away from the place at which i had just arrived to be sure i had careful routing but was the train by which i was ordered to leave still running had there been a flood or blizzard or accident to make a detour necessary sometimes it was an exciting detour more than once i had to go fifty or a hundred miles by car over flooded or snow-bound roads which the pessimistic declared impassable and which only an adventurous youth for a good round sum would undertake to negotiate in one of these hold-ups i travelled two hundred miles in a freight car behind an engine the first to go over the snow-bound road in a week more than once on these exciting detours i felt that probably i should not come out alive but i always did and always found however late my arrival my audience was waiting for me as a matter of fact those little adventures were highly stimulating after hours and hours of the benumbing comfort of trains when i knew how i was to get away i looked up the committee so far as i was concerned the point at which i most frequently found a serious conflict in a committee was the subject on which i was to talk that was supposed to have been settled i had their letter for it but not everybody wanted me to talk on so and so usually i found it was because somebody feared i might be too radical they didn't want anything said on their platform which would antagonize the well-to-do conservative sponsors of the course or encourage the town's social and economic rebels i remember times when after an exciting discussion behind the scenes i stood in the wings waiting for the signal to come onto the platform while behind me the discussion went on only at the last moment did the chairman say begrudgingly well talk on so and so but the chief objector meeting me after the lecture said i would so much have preferred to have heard you on so and so but the indecision of the committee was not the only trying experience before i was actually on my feet and at my job there was the introduction you never knew exactly what was to happen as a matter of fact the introduction should and frequently does give opportunity for repartee for anecdote an easy way for putting yourself at once on terms of friendliness with your audience but i was never happy at that kind of thing on the chautauqua circuit the fashion has been for the speaker to go out as soon as the music was over take a stand and begin nobody said this is so-and-so who will speak on so-and-so nobody told them anything about you you stood up and said your piece the ritual on the lyceum platform was different there they made the most of me as a rule it sometimes seemed to me that each successive committee had a different way of presenting me sometimes i marched out with the master of ceremonies a man or woman and was placed in an armchair while the chairman made remarks about me which were often bewildering i have been introduced as the author of george kennan's siberian books and of edna ferber's emma mcchesney stories i have heard a long explanation of why i had never married once i was called a notorious woman by the speaker he evidently thinking that the word was flattering often i had a bodyguard made up of important women of the community a tribute to my sex one of the most peculiar fashions as well as the most trying was having a scene arranged behind the drop curtain the stage was turned into a pleasant sitting-room and a half dozen of the leading women of the town in their best gowns were seated about in informal fashion when we were all ready the curtain went up there would be music and then the chairman would tell them who i was and why i was supposed to be worth their attention 
while this was going on the audience was locating the different persons of importance on the stage and criticizing the setting and the costumes one going as a lecturer to the most remote parts of the country that support a lecture course may think he will be a treat but if he has any sensibility he will soon discover that far from that he usually has a critical audience it is interested in what he has to say treats him with courtesy and respect but it has also had experience with scores of lecturers in past years and compares his matter and manner with theirs i have been in towns in the middle west where they had heard thackeray and dickens read had listened to emerson and bronson alcott and had heard every popular lecturer in all the years since their day your real opportunity to judge of the intelligence and alertness of the community comes while you are speaking look for an hour or more into the faces of a group of men and women who whatever they may think of you are courteous enough to give you their attention and you know soon what certain individuals think of what you are saying always i found myself speaking to someone who i knew heartily disagreed with me someone i felt i would like to convince always i knew that there was a man waiting to challenge me usually these challenges came from socialists or single taxers if an opportunity was given to ask questions after my talk something which i always encouraged they were the first on their feet the community knew them and knew what their questions would be and frequently laughed at them but a really good audience enjoys seeing a speaker heckled a bit and the speaker if he is really interested in his business is glad to take the heckling i know nothing better for a lecturer who is going over the same arguments night after night than to know that there will probably be somebody in his audience who will seize the first opportunity to pick on a weak point challenge his generalization his facts if that happens you always go away from your lecture better equipped than you came to it in the twelve years in which i regularly made an annual lecture trip i gave up the work in nineteen thirty two finding it too much for my strength in all those twelve years i everywhere found the liveliest absorption in national policies people told you how they felt about an undertaking how it was working out in their particular community important for here you had the test of the pudding in its eating it was what i saw of the workings of prohibition in the nineteen twenties that drove me to do one of the most unpopular things i ever did that was to tell bluntly how i saw it working in hotels from one end of the land to the other disheartening evidences of its effect on the young the unexpected dangers it brought to a woman travelling alone at night both in stations and on trains i set down what i had seen over a wide range of territory what i had heard from the mouths of men and women who had been ardent prohibitionists and who were appalled by the things that were happening particularly to youth in their own communities i had never been a prohibitionist in principle my whole theory for the improvement of society is based on a belief in the discipline and the education of the individual to self-control and right-doing for the sake of right-doing i have never seen fundamental improvements imposed from the top by ordinances and laws i believed that the country was gradually learning temperance but if prohibition could be made to work i was willing it should be tried but what i saw in these years had led me by nineteen twenty eight to feel that something unexpected and very disastrous was going on and that it must be faced not hidden it was the most important observation that my crowded lecture days yielded but as i say it brought me bitter criticism and now and then an intimation from some indignant woman of power and parts that i had sold myself to the liquor interests one lady even intimated that if she had known my pen was for sale she would have bid for it this kind of criticism however is one of the things that one who says what he thinks must be prepared to meet it is very difficult to believe that those who disagree with you are as convinced of the right of their point of view as you are 
that they are not being bribed or unduly influenced have no selfish purpose as you are sure you have not two generalizations topping all others came out of this going up and down the land in the years between nineteen twenty and nineteen thirty two the first is the ambition of our people to live and think according to what they conceive to be national standards they adopt them whether they suit their locality or not and often in adopting them destroy something with individuality and charm for the traveller it begins with a hotel spick and span and as like as two peas to the one in aville beville and so on over the way is a sturdy stone building dating from the days of the coach and four you may sigh for its great rooms and for a sight of the old lithograph sure to be on the wall but you know it is run down the town cannot support two and it prefers the smart and comfortable commonplace to modernizing its fine old inn look out your hotel window and you will see opposite a smart little dress shop a duplicate of one you have been seen everywhere you have halted a duplicate of many a one you have seen on new york avenues next door is a standardized beauty parlor and the pretty girl who waits on you at the table the daughter probably of some solid and self-respecting townsman has the latest coiffure and blood-red nails she is struggling to look as she supposes girls do in chicago or new york when the committee takes you out to drive it is to show you their one high building a high building on a prairie with limitless land to occupy or a country club as fine as the one in the nearest city the pride is in looking like something else not themselves the growth of this progress in imitation can be traced in the change that has come over the local postal card all my life i have been a buyer of postal cards largely on account of my mother to whom i always sent pictures of the localities through which i was passing mother died in nineteen seventeen but up to this day i rarely go through a station that i do not say to myself i must find a card for mother and turn away with a pang in the years between nineteen twenty and nineteen thirty two the postal card grew steadily less interesting once there were pictures of a nearby fort the earliest house a local celebrity a rare view but now it is all of high buildings and new blocks they give of course the pictures of the zoo and the parks but even the zoo and the parks pride themselves like the country club on their resemblance to those of the nearest large city the growing evidence that nationalization is blotting out local individuality destroying the pungent personality of sections states communities struck me with new force after the months i spent in italy in nineteen twenty six in italy i had found that however deeply unionism might be written in the hearts of some men you were a roman a perugian a venetian a neapolitan before you were an italian the long arm of fascism was reaching into the provinces and the towns but it did not as yet disturb their ways of life mussolini had shown up to that date rare knowledge of his italians he had left them their ways sure of them they did not worry so much about the change in government most of them could see about them the proofs of two thousand years of change they could show you records and scars of a long succession of emperors kings councils dictators it did not seem to make a vast difference to them what the government was if they could go on being themselves perhaps our national ambition to standardize ourselves has behind it the notion that democracy means standardization but standardization is the surest way to destroy the initiative to benumb the creative impulse above all else essential to the vitality and growth of democratic ideals the second of my two generalizations was slower in its making it came when i began to scratch below the surface of the imitative life so conspicuous then i found a stable foundation of people who stayed at home and went about their business in their own way 
and without much talking these were people who in spite of droughts and dust storms stuck to their farms making the most of good years saving enough to carry them through the evil ones adding a little year by year to their possessions in town and country supporting schools churches and incidentally lecture courses they were people who believed in freedom to work out their own salvation and asked from the state nothing more than protection in this freedom it was the business of government as they saw it to keep off the plunderers and let them alone democracy to them was not something which ensured them a stable livelihood it was something which protected them while they earned a livelihood if they failed it was their failure if the government did not protect them from transportation plunderers manipulations of money stock gambling in goods which they raised to feed the world it was the government's failure then they had the right to change the government hold it up to its duty that was their political business this was about what i found the country over when once i had learned to look beyond the restless imitative crowd to hunt out people who were going about their business steadily and for the most part serenely i began to breathe more freely and to say well perhaps after all the men and women of this country as a whole do know what they are about they do know what democracy means and in the best way that they can under many hampering circumstances they are trying to live it some such conclusion i always brought back with me from my annual swings around the country my dozens of nights in dozens of different places the high spot of which always was the hour of searching the faces of the men and women who came to listen to what i had to say and who i knew sized me up for just about what i was worth i might be fooling myself but not them End of chapter nineteen